show has not started yet still hasn't started yet that lower third is way too big we're gonna have to have a meeting i thought that was gonna be good now i have to live with that thing for the rest of oh my god that looks horrible really okay show has not started yet all right let me button my top shirt okay everybody can hear me god i just i'm all spritzing here show has not started yet i uh wrote a manifesto in the morning and i deleted it because i realized it would offend theodore kaczynski that's <laughs> That I should not be, I should take some time off. I should not be writing or thinking about anything. And if I had delivered <laughs> the manifesto I wrote this morning, uh, you know, if they knocked on my door to take me away, I'd say, uh, okay, I agree with you. I get it. Show hasn't started yet. We have a good one planned. I'm just a little disorganized. There never seems to be the time to do the things I want to do once I find it. And I looked around. And there I found it, Jim Croce's corpse. Welcome to the mop-up for May 12th, 2022. I'm David Feldman coming to you from an air shaft overlooking a parking garage somewhere in Manhattan where the temperature is 65 degrees and partly sunny. America is about to outlaw abortion. Meanwhile, there's no food to feed the babies. There's an infant baby formula shortage. The infant formula shortage is hitting poor women, especially hard, since poor women have multiple jobs and don't have the time, like Gwyneth Paltrow, to breastfeed their darlings. And that's sad because, as everyone who follows Goop knows, breastfeeding is the fastest way to lose all that pregnancy weight. But we don't have... Uh, baby formula. We have a crisis. There isn't enough food in America to feed our babies. But if you get raped, you have to bring the baby to fruition now here, at least in Texas. The Republicans want us to make more babies. Can't feed them, but make more babies. So what caused this? Abbott, not Greg Abbott, Abbott, the manufacturer of baby formula, uh, they, they don't quite have a monopoly when it comes to manufacturing baby formula, but it's pretty close. And it's never a good idea to get all your food from one source, because when something goes wrong, your babies die from malnutrition. That's why farmers early on learn to rotate crops. Don't get reliant on a single source of nutrition. And that's why we have antitrust laws. So babies all don't have to depend on Abbott for their nutrition. Something went horribly wrong earlier this year over at Abbott. The FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, discovered their formula was contaminated and it risked the lives of our babies here in America. So in order to protect the babies, the FDA shut down that big Abbott baby formula plant in Sturgis, Sturgis, Michigan not to be confused with Sturgis, South Dakota, where motorcycle riding douchebags from all over the country gather each year to give each other COVID and share a single sample sized bar of soap. Anyway, most of the baby formula here in America comes from Abbott. And because Abbott started killing babies, kind of like Texas Governor Greg Abbott, who also kills babies, but not fetuses, uh, Abbott's infant formula was a danger to babies. FDA shut their factory down. So there has been what they call a supply chain problem, a supply chain problem. One company provides all the baby formula. The factory gets shut down because they're not following safety protocols. And they call that a supply chain problem. No, that's a company that's way too big. That's an example of why we need to break up big baby formula. They're too big. They've gotten too big. Big baby formula has gotten too big. They've captured the regulators. They pay. They play fast and loose. They don't have to follow the law because they are the law. And next thing you know, they're a threat to our babies. And the law does have to step in, shut them down temporarily. And now there's no baby formula. Now babies will suffer the long-term effects of malnutrition here in America because mothers are watering down their baby formula 
right at the time when babies need to be fed, right when they need all of the baby formula, not the watered down version. When you're a baby, you need to feed your important organs so they can grow. Your, your brain doesn't grow if you don't get the full strength of your baby formula. And when your brain doesn't grow, you end up with Republicans. But we're told it's all because of a supply chain issue. No, it's because Abbott got too big and now our children are not growing. Abbott grew and our children can't grow. But, you know, the Republicans don't complain about that. They, they're so obsessed with fetuses, but breaking up Abbott. Oh, that's can't do that. Now, I'm not saying there aren't real supply chain issues. I think there are some supply chain issues. Many of you might have forgotten uh, the country got shut down, uh, shut down because of covid. So a lot of materials that go into making baby formula, cars, computers, uh, they're sitting on loading docks. And so that creates shortages, although the baby formula shortage is not supply chain. It's the FDA said, hey, you're breaking the law. You're going to kill some babies. Shut it down. But we're told that there are supply chain issues. And uh, when there are shortages, that creates demand. And the more demand there is, the more corporations can charge. Go try to buy some baby formula right now. I think some uh, boxes are going for like $100. That's price gouging. It's illegal, but this is America. They've convinced us that there are supply chain issues. And once we're convinced that supply chain issues are a real thing, corporations can get away with charging us whatever they want. They 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 seem to think they're entitled to pass their supply chain costs on to the consumers. But corporations lie and the supply chain issue is never as bad as they want us to believe. The real problem is no competition in America. There are pretty much two or three corporations that dominate each segment of our economy. So they collude and together raise prices claiming there are supply chain issues. Well, that's exactly why we have antitrust laws. Competition is supposed to be good unless you're rich and powerful. For decades, the Justice Department said it would only enforce antitrust regulations if a monopoly ended up punishing the consumers. So the Justice Department got away with not breaking up any of these big corporations because we've had decades of low inflation. Walmart, Amazon, they got to destroy Main Street. They pay shit wages. But since they kept prices low, the Justice Department didn't break them up. Amazon and Walmart were not monopolies because they weren't punishing consumers. The consumers weren't getting punished, so they weren't considered monopolies. They weren't punishing consumers, unless, of course, those consumers needed to work for a living. Because there was no competition, all the high paying jobs with benefits disappear disappeared because Amazon and Walmart stole them from us. But prices were low, so they weren't monopolies. This goes back to the Robert Bork memo. Yeah, that Bork. When he was in the Reagan Justice Department before he was nominated to the Supreme Court and they Borked him, when he was in the Reagan Justice Department, Bork wrote the memo that said we should never prosecute a monopoly until it has an adverse effect on consumers. No inflation, no need to break up the monopolies. But now we have red hot inflation. Why? Mostly because corporations have monopolies or duopolies and they can collude to charge pretty much whatever they want. And they lie and claim they have non-existent supply chain issues. And the right wing, they don't want to break up the monopolies. So they insist it's all about these non-existent supply chain issues. Well, what about inflation? 
We have inflation. Yes, these monopolies are charging too much. So the right wing says it's supply chain issues. Sometimes they say that. But mostly what the right wing insists is that inflation is caused by, you guessed it, government spending. They insist government spending is creating these enormous budget deficits. That's what they insist, that government spending is evil. It creates inflation and it creates budget deficits that will bankrupt our country. That's what they have you convinced of, that budget deficits are what we need to be afraid of. And here's the dirty, dark secret about government spending, right? About living within our means. Government spending that goes to the 99% balances the budget. Now, the right for years since Reagan and before has been convincing us that cutting taxes for the rich and lowering government spending will balance the budget. That's a lie. But the right wing funds think tanks and a-holes like Stephen Moore from the Club for Growth, and they will say anything to convince people that lowering taxes for the rich while simultaneously cutting government spending is good for everyone because it will balance the budget. And that's a lie. Stephen Moore is paid by billionaires to lie about budget deficits. Here's an inconvenient fact for Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin won't tell you this, probably knows this. Joe Manchin has blocked every spending bill that Joe Biden has introduced because he doesn't want to break the government. He says we have to live within our means. We have to balance the budget. Well, Joe Manchin, last year, Joe Biden pumped trillions into the economy. Last year, we increased government spending big time. Child tax credit, $1,400 for you, $800 there for you, rent subsidies, uh, college debt moratorium. There was a lot of money floating in the economy that came from the federal government. And guess what happened? Joe Biden has lowered the budget deficit. I wonder if we'll hear that. I wonder if we'll hear that from, uh, I don't know, Fox News, MSNBC, all the, the fiscal hawks. I wonder if we're going to find out the truth that Joe Biden, by spending so much money last year, has lowered, not increased, lowered our budget. God damn it. It's so frustrating. He lowered the budget deficit. Remember how Joe Manchin said all this government spending will bankrupt our government? According to Bloomberg, the budget deficit so far has shrunk by one point six trillion dollars and the fiscal year doesn't end until October. So far, all that government spending has reduced the budget deficit by one point six trillion dollars. The IRS is collecting a tsunami of tax revenue. And imagine how much more the IRS could collect if we finally funded the IRS. Why is the IRS collecting a tsunami of tax revenue? Because government spending means people are working. People have money in their pocket and that money gets taxed. Joe Manchin can scream fiscal responsibility all he wants. But right here, here's your proof that that giving money to the 99 percent actually balances the budget. When the government spends money on the 99 percent, it comes back to the government in the way of tax revenue. So far, the budget deficit has been lowered by one point five trillion dollars, which is about the cost of Medicare for all, I think, for how many years? What would that? I don't have the numbers in front of me. I think one point five trillion dollars would cover Medicare for all in one year. Probably less. See, you balance the budget by spending money. Got to spend money to make money. 
right? Got to spend money to make money. If the federal government wants to balance the budget, they have to spend money. If the government gives $1 to the 99%, I've been over this a million times. If the government gives $1 to the 99%, that dollar keeps getting passed around. It's the multiplier effect. Keynes talked about this. So that dollar gets passed around. One single dollar, if it goes to the 99%, gets passed around. And every time it gets passed around, the federal government, the local government, the state government, they all get a little piece of that dollar every time. It's like we're skimming off the top. The government is skimming off the top. Every penny the government gives to the 99%, the government gets back and then some. It pays for itself. You eventually get your penny back and you turn a profit. It's kind of like the way a bank works. Uh, so you give that money to the 99%, they're going to give it back to you in taxes and you'll turn a profit. You will have a, you will have a budget surplus. It's the wealthy who hoard their money. So, yes, government spending, is it inflationary? It can be a problem. Uh, I think inflation right now is partly because of supply chain issues, partly. But I think supply chain issues is just an excuse to raise prices because we have too many monopolies in America that can lie about supply chain issues and they get away with raising prices. There's inflation in America because of our dependence on oil. There's inflation because too few companies control too much of our food supply. There's inflation because the 99% doesn't have enough money and the richest 1% has way too much money. And so the richest 1% is hoarding all their money by buying apartments and homes which make rent unaffordable. That's what's causing inflation. Nobody should have more than two homes. You, I think you're entitled to a nice home and then a nice vacation home. And if you have any more money that you want to spend, go stay at a nice hotel. You don't need an apartment building to price gouge the middle class or, or the working poor. You don't need that. You can't commodify the basics in life. Housing is a basic. You should not be commodifying it. And that's all true. That's all true. Unfortunately, and I will have some good news coming up, by the way. I read what I wrote this morning, and I wanted to uh, perform a citizen's arrest on myself. I was ready to lock myself up. You got to have, so I have, I do have some positive news. So uh, the, the Theodore Kaczynski part of the show is almost over. Uh, this country is run by psychopaths who have $100 million and think they'll only feel good about themselves and they, until they get to a billion. When they get to a billion, then I'm going to feel complete. And then they get to a billion and then it's, if I have 10 billion, then, then I'm completed. The mentally ill are in charge of this country. People like Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, mentally ill. This guy actually thought he could get elected president of the United States. He's delusional. He's delusional. And he's running America. That is some good coffee. And it's not Starbucks. That is not Starbucks coffee. I don't like my coffee beans picked by eight-year-olds in Guatemala making 50 cents an hour. Call me old-fashioned. Well, the that's why I don't drink Starbucks. The national labor, and that that's true. Starbucks has been cited by the UN and, the, uh, and not the BBC, Channel 4 in Great Britain for using uh, child labor in Guatemala to pick their beans. The National Labor Relations Board is demanding that Starbucks rehire seven union organizers who were fired from a Memphis, Tennessee store after they succeeded in getting workers to petition the National Labor Relations Board for a union vote. And guess what? They won that vote. So Howard Schultz fired those seven union organizers. 
a spokesperson for Starbucks, Reggie Bourget, that's a name worthy of getting punched in the face. Reggie Bourget says Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks and former presidential candidate until he realized Americans were onto him, a spokesman for Howard Schultz, Reggie Bourget. Man, you know, if I could have sex with Natalie Portman or punch Reggie Bourget in the face, Uh, and get away with it, I would have to go with punching Roger Bourget, Howard Schultz's spokesperson, in the face. Uh, yeah. Anyway, Roger Bourget, Howard Schultz. Oh, I can feel it. I could just feel punch. I, this, there's a beast within me. And I could just feel one punch right in Roger Bourget's face. All right. Roger Bourget, <laughs> Howard Schultz's spokesperson, says that uh, Howard doesn't see the NLRB demanding that he rehire the seven union organizers. The NLRB's demand that he rehire uh, the seven union organizers. Howard Schultz doesn't recognize that as a reason to rehire the seven union organizers. Howard Schultz does not recognize the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, he says it's just a first step in the litigation process to determine whether the seven employees should be rehired. Yes, it's a litigation process. Howard Schultz is ignoring an NLRB ruling. Instead, he's turning to the courts. Howard Schultz, who easily has a billion dollars for each of the seven union organizers he fired, he is going to court against the seven union organizers who are now out of a job because multi-billionaire Howard Schultz fired them for performing their constitutional right of turning a Starbucks shop in Tennessee Union, right? Wow. Howard Schultz should be arrested. It's against the law. It is against labor law to arrest people for trying to organize a union. I am drinking some good coffee because it's anything but Starbucks. By the way, Howard Schultz He's all about corporate responsibility, equity, right? He has set up a corporate responsibility department over at Starbucks. You know, he's concerned about the environment, just not eight-year-old kids earning 13 cents an hour picking his beans. He's concerned about corporate responsibility and his company's impact on the community because it's all about corporate responsibility and he set up a hotline that we should call to discuss Starbucks's corporate responsibility. That number would be 800-782-7282. Starbucks's corporate responsibility hotline is 800-782-7282. What is Howard Schultz's corporate responsibility hotline, you ask? Oh, it's 800-782-7282. Call Howard Schultz's corporate responsibility office and let's keep the conversation going. That's what they always say. This is an important conversation that we should be having over at 800 782 7282. Let's keep the corporate responsibility conversation going with Howard Schultz. And let's talk about how responsible Starbucks is for breaking labor laws in America by firing union organizers. And then when those organizers have no money, when the National Labor Relations Board 
issues a ruling, when our government issues a ruling and says rehire them, Howard Schultz's corporate responsibility is defying the NLRB, not recognizing the National Relations Board and tying it up in courts for years. So let's have a, a conversation with Howard Schultz about Starbucks's corporate responsibility, 800-782-7282. He does not recognize the legitimacy of the federal government. Howard Schultz does not recognize the National Labor Relations Board. Laws don't apply to Howard Schultz. He's a billionaire. Howard Schultz, like Jeff Bezos, he can he doesn't need to recognize the federal government because they have money and they have time and they will stall and they will stall and they will stall. They hire these corporate lawyers who go in and stall. Christian Smalls, Amazon Labor Union, as in, he set up the Amazon Labor Union, he succeeded in getting a vote at the Staten Island warehouse and they voted to go union. Amazon had him arrested twice when he was out there. Now Amazon has to recognize the union, but they won't. They will not come to the bargaining table. They are stalling and they are stalling and they are stalling. stalling. And meanwhile, Christian has been out of work for two years. How many years will Amazon tie this up in the courts? Who knows? Who knows? So which side are you on? Are you on the side of unions? I hope so. And if you're on the side of unions, then you're not on the side of Starbucks or Amazon. If you are on the side of working people, you are not on the side of Starbucks or Amazon until they recognize these unions. So my advice to you today is don't go to Starbucks, save $7 and give it to Joe Thompson. Go to joeforassembly.org. He was on the show Monday. Donate to Joe. Donate to 19-year-old Joe. Go to joeforassembly.org. Go look at my interview with him from Monday's show, and it'll make you actually feel good about the world. Joe Thompson currently attends University of Santa Cruz and they work at a Starbucks and they are a representative for the Starbucks Workers United, a nationwide union for Starbucks workers. And Joe won. We spoke to him on Monday and yesterday he won. He won. They are organizing nearly 100 other Starbucks in Northern California. And he wa they won. Watch my interview with Joe on Monday's show. Joe is also running for California State Assembly. Joe is a Democrat. The primary is the first week of June. And Joe is non-binary. They use the pronouns they and them. And if elected to the California State Assembly, Joe would be the first nine non-binary politician to serve in the California State Assembly assembly. So instead of going to Starbucks today, save the money you were going to spend waste at Starbucks. And instead of filling Howard Schultz's pockets, send the money over to Joe for assembly dot org. Instead of your morning Joe, give your morning Joe money to Joe for assembly dot org. Again, this is the good news. This is what will get you out of bed in the morning. You don't need caffeine to get out of bed in the morning. Just think about Joe Thompson. We had him on Monday's show. They are 19. They are a Starbucks union organizer who, because they are an organizer, had their hours cut to just 10 a week, which puts them in danger of no longer collecting health benefits. He, they are being punished by Howard Schultz 
for organizing in the Santa Cruz, California region. And I am proud to announce that yesterday, May 11th, Joe Thompson succeeded in getting two Santa Cruz Starbucks to go union. I just got the I just got the chills. If that doesn't get you out of the bed out of bed in the morning, I mean, that put a spring in my step when I read that. These two Starbucks are the first Starbucks in the entire state of California to vote to go union. On Friday of this week, two Los Angeles Starbucks are voting on whether to join the union. Joe is helping organize those shops as well. JoeForAssembly.org. We need Joe in government. This makes 64 Starbucks nationwide that have voted to go union. So far, Howard Schultz isn't negotiating. He's not recognizing the law that these shops are now union. All started in Buffalo late last year. Five Buffalo Starbucks voted to join the union. Organizers were immediately fired or just like Joe had their hours cut back. Howard Schultz, former presidential candidate, CEO of Starbucks, is punishing, is breaking the law by firing or cutting back the hours of union organizers. Two Starbucks in Mesa, Arizona, voted to go union this year. Starbucks punished one of the union organizers there. She was working part-time for Starbucks while also working for our nation's military, training to be a pilot. Howard Schultz punished her for organizing a union. She works for our military, fighting for freedom overseas, but she's not entitled to those freedoms at the Starbucks in Mesa, Arizona. Howard Schultz. Howard Schultz is the name of the CEO of Starbucks. One Starbucks in Seattle voted this year to go union. And of course, a Starbucks in Knoxville, Tennessee voted to go union. I talked about that Starbucks in Knoxville, Tennessee. That's where Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, fired the seven union organizers. He fired the seven union organizers who voted, who organized and got the workers at a Knoxville, Tennessee Starbucks to go union. Howard Schultz broke the law and fired seven union organizers. And now he's ignoring an NLRB ruling. He doesn't recognize the United States of America. He's like a sovereign nation. He's like one of those crack. He's like Bundy, right? He's just one of those guys. I don't recognize the NLRB. I do not recognize the United States of America. And as a matter of fact, Howard Schultz is moving <laughs> Starbucks into cryptocurrency. Pretty soon he won't be even recognizing our dollar. I think there's a term in Latin for Howard Schultz. It's called piece of shit. You're a piece of shit, Howard Schultz. Well, America is in the middle. That was the good news. That's my good news. Howard Schultz, CEO of uh, Starbucks, is a piece of shit. He's out of Seattle, and so is Jeff Bezos. Seattle, you're pieces of shit. You're, anybody who lives in Seattle is a piece. I'm kidding. Just Bill Gates, Howard Schultz, and Jeff Bezos, and a couple of comedy club owners there who owe me money. Well, America is in the middle of a gun death epidemic, so says the Centers for Disease Control on Wednesday. Dr. Deborah E. Horry, acting principal deputy director of the CDC and the director of the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control, said yesterday more Americans are dying from gun deaths than at any time in history. In 2020, this is the most recent available statistic, 45,000 Americans died from guns. It's a new record. The homicide rate is the highest it's been since 1994. 
gun deaths are highest in urban areas, with young black men and women dying at disproportionate numbers. The CDC says the summer months of June, July and August always see an uptick in shootings. But in the summer of 2020, it rose by 30 percent, a record. The hotter it gets, the more likely you are going to get shot. Uh, so this should be an interesting summer. Well, the United States government can't seem to explain what is causing the rise in sh shootings. Hmm. People are getting shot at record levels and nobody can figure out what is the cause of all these gun deaths. What a what could it be? It's like the great mystery of homelessness. Why are so many people homeless? Could it be there's a shortage of homes in America that's driving up rents and nobody can afford to live in these homes? Is that the cause of homeless? Could it be we have a federal government that refuses to build public housing because real estate lobbyists want there to be a shortage of homes to keep rents high? No, it couldn't possibly be that simple. It, it can't be people are homeless because rent is unaffordable. It must be what they call a whole suite of reasons. That's the new term I hear from the professional managerial class. It's all of the above or a whole suite of explanations. So what could be the cause of all these shootings? Could it be there are 400 million guns circulating throughout this country? that it's been one banner year of profits after another for gun manufacturers because Americans are stockpiling weapons. Could that be why 45,000 Americans died from guns in 2020? No, that's too simple a reason. People aren't getting shot because of the guns. There's an entire suite of explanations for why people are dying from guns. And it's not the guns. No, no, it's not the guns. Guns are not responsible for 45,000 gun deaths. That's not the reason people are dying from guns. The same way all those Russian soldiers aren't getting killed by the $40 million worth of weapons we're giving Ukraine. Russian soldiers are dying at record numbers in Ukraine. They are getting killed. Why? Well, there's a whole suite of explanations, and it's not the guns we're giving the Ukrainians. That's too simplistic. You need to understand these Russian soldiers who are getting shot to death. They grew up being raised by a single mom. These Russian soldiers are getting shot because Russian schools are failing them. These Russian soldiers are getting shot to death, not because of the $40 million worth of weapons we've given Ukraine. These Russian soldiers are getting shot to death because of the music Russian teenagers listen to that glorify violence. And of course, don't forget the video games. You can't blame all these Russian soldiers getting shot to death on the $40 million worth of weapons America's handed over to the Ukrainians. The weapons play only a small part in the death of these Russian soldiers. It's all part of a suite of reasons. It's all of the above. It's not the guns. Same thing here in America. You can't blame 45,000 gun deaths on the guns. There are a suite of explanations for these gun deaths. Blaming the guns for gun deaths, that would be like blaming the record number of drug overdoses in America on drugs. Last year, we, we have uh, we hit a record with gun deaths in America. And last year, we hit a record with drug overdoses. Last year, more than 100,000 Americans died from drug overdoses, more than in any year in our history. The CDC says that more than one million Americans have died from drug overdoses since the century began. Now, we would never blame the drugs, right? Because we've learned from guns, blaming drugs is too simplistic, right? You, you, you can't blame gun deaths on guns and you can't blame 
drug overdoses on drugs. Oh, wait, that's what we do. When it comes to drug overdoses, we just blame the drugs. Isn't that odd? When it comes to drug overdoses, we fight a war on drugs. We need to get the drugs off the streets because that's what's causing the drug overdoses, drugs. So if you just get rid of the drugs, there'll be no drug overdoses. That, but not with guns. Guns, it's complicated, right? You talk, you know, the, the right will say, uh, you know, I get it. I get it. Americans suffer from depression. They don't have jobs. They are lonely. But forget that. That has nothing to do with drug overdoses. We just need to get rid of the drugs. Just lock up the drug dealers and the drug users. Well, uh, what about free treatment on demand? No, it's the drugs. We don't need free treatment on demand. Just get rid of the drugs. Uh, drug over, well, what about free mental health care? No, just spend money on getting rid of the drugs. Well, shouldn't we spend some money on providing work and education so people can find meaning in their lives so they don't turn to drugs, maybe uh, affordable housing? No, 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 it's not complicated. Just get rid of the drugs. But the guns, that's complicated. There are so many factors contributing to gun deaths. The guns are just a symptom of a much larger societal problem. But drugs, aren't they a symptom? Aren't they a symptom of a much larger societal problem? No. You, you just get rid of the drugs, then people won't be able to take them. Okay, then what about getting rid of the guns? If we got rid of the guns, then people won't be able to shoot each other. You're being too sub simplistic. Okay, but isn't spending all your money on getting rid of drugs, but not addressing the root cause of drug use? Isn't that simplistic? You know, you're really starting to annoy me. How would you like a 50 caliber slug between your eyes? That's pretty much the conversation in America where the answer is guns and more police. That's the answer. Because the people who've taken over our government, the right wing, they insist we need guns to prevent America from becoming a police state. That's what the NRA says. We need guns to fight the totalitarian instincts that are found in every government. We need guns, they say, to prevent America from turning into a police state. But whenever there's a mass shooting, the first thing we hear from right wing politicians and the NRA and the pro gun lunatics, the first thing they insist is we need to fund the police. OK, I thought we had guns to protect ourselves from the police. But when there's a mass shooting, we need to give the police more guns. We don't need to get rid of the guns. We need the guns to protect us from a police state. But when there's a shooting, we need to give the police more weapons to defend us from the people with guns, even though we need guns to protect us from the police. So why wouldn't you want to give the police fewer weapons? Why would you want to give them more? And why are gun homicides going up if everyone has a gun? I thought guns were supposed to keep us safer and make us more free from the police. You know, it's almost as if the argument for guns makes no sense. And this is just all about selling more and more guns. The people who want guns say we need to protect ourselves from a police state. Yet these are the same people who want more funding for a police state. Because the way to prevent a police state is to give more money and more weapons to the police. That's the conversation here in America, which brings me to ICE, Immigration Custom Enforcement. It's a brand new police force that came into being right after 9-11, because that's what America needs, a brand new police force, ICE. We don't need ICE because we don't have an immigration problem. ICE doesn't enforce immigration laws. There's not a single immigration law that says undocumented immigrants belong in a prison or should be rounded up and sent home. There are no laws on the book. That is purely the executive branch's discretion. In fact, international law says you cannot lock up a refugee. 
we don't need ICE. ICE is against international law. The American economy is built on ignoring undocumented immigrants. If you ignore undocumented immigrants, you get to ignore labor laws. And that's why we want undocumented Americans. The same people who say we have to crack down on immigration are making billions off the people they demonize. And one of the reasons for inflation is we can't find anyone to do a lot of the jobs that used to be done by people who came across the border. We're not allowing them in anymore. And most importantly, they no longer want to come here, not not to work. They're refugees who want to come here, but they're not coming here to work. More Mexicans are leaving America than coming here. Did you know that? There are two million fewer undocumented Mexicans working here in America than there were seven years ago. Yes, there is an immigration problem. Not enough are coming here to do the jobs that we won't do. Nobody wants to come here. They're coming from Central America. We have 50,000 Central Americans along the southern border, but they're not coming here for work. They're coming here to seek asylum from gang infested governments we prop up in Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, and of course, Haiti. These people waiting to come in are not criminals. They're not people coming to take away your job. These are people coming to escape persecution from corrupt governments run by drug dealers propped up by fascists. They are not coming here to seek a better life. They are coming here to stay alive. So we don't have a problem with immigrants in this country. Uh, the, the Central Americans, by international law, are seeking political asylum. Therefore, they are supposed to be welcomed into this country, not put inside ICE for profit concentration camps. And the people who demonize all these people of color, at the same time, they can't wait to exploit them. <clears throat> Restaurants, construction firms, slaughterhouses, big agra, they don't hire American citizens, or at least they don't want to hire American citizens. They want to hire undocumented workers because undocumented workers don't ask for too much money. They don't demand overtime. They're less likely to unionize. They don't complain about wage theft or working conditions. They're a compliant workforce. That's why the business model for so many of our corporations is hiring undocumented workers. Immigration, like critical race theory, is a problem that doesn't exist. But when you demonize people of color, you can blame someone other than the richest 1% for all the country's immiseration. It's not Jeff Bezos who destroyed Main Street. No, he didn't take away your jobs. It's all those brown people who have stopped coming here. We have a shortage of brown people coming from Mexico to do the jobs that Americans won't do. The people who love guns, they fear a police state, but they love the police. They hate immigrants, but they love ICE. They love ICE, but they hate the police. Why? Why would the people who hate the police, who fear a police state, love ICE? Well, because ICE has one responsibility to pick up where the KKK left off and terrorize people of color. That is the job of ICE, to terrorize people of color. There is no need for ICE other than terrorizing people of color. There is no need for all these for-profit ICE concentration camps that spend anywhere between $40,000 to $125,000 a year to house a single detainee. These for-profit concentration camps that are run by ICE, they charge you, the taxpayer, $40,000 to $125,000 a year per detainee. 
These detainees are being held because they are Spanish-speaking brown people. And there is not a single law on the books that says immigrants must be detained. This is a decision made by our president, the executive branch, the president's immigration department. There is no reason to lock up women and children. None. There is no law on the books. It violates international law to put refugees, people seeking political asylum, in concentration camps. And these are concentration camps. In the past, people seeking asylum here in America used to be given over to a church or a government agency that would help these refugees blend into the country as they await their hearing before an administrative judge. And these people, and they are people, they always show up for their hearings. There is not a problem with women and children from Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and Haiti not showing up for their administrative hearings. This problem doesn't exist. It's manufactured. Listen to me, I know I'm not entertaining or fun, but I'm never wrong. ICE is America's Gestapo. ICE is America's Gestapo. They answer to the executive branch and the executive branch only. They answer only to the president. ICE is America's Gestapo. Joe Biden could order ICE to stop rounding up these women and children with the stroke of a pen. He could shut down these for-profit concentration camps today with the stroke of a pen. There is no need for ICE or these concentration camps. There is no need to detain women and children seeking political asylum from Central America. It is against international law. ICE is terrorizing communities, hanging outside schools and churches, waiting for undocumented fathers to drop their kids off at school or bring their families to church, and then ICE grabs them. They come in the middle of the night and grabs the father, separates him from the children and the wife, and they send that father back to the country he came from. They take the men from the families, separate the families, and the wife and the kids often stay in America, but the fathers are sent back. Why is that? Why? I've talked about the beast within. There's a beast within. I saw him today, this morning. <laughs> he wrote some, he wrote a nasty manifesto. I almost had to make a citizen's arrest. I almost arrested myself. There's a beast within and fascism thrives by catering to the beast within. I have a beast within. You have a beast within. I keep the beast within in check, but he's there. And I sometimes fantasize about grabbing someone who works for ice. I like to think I'd grab one of these ice pigs in front of his family. I fantasize about grabbing this pig from ice and dragging him into my van with some of my friends and then putting him on a private jet and taking him to Haiti with no money in his pockets. And I fantasize by dumping him in Haiti off to the side of the road and my friends hold him down and then they open up his mouth so I can piss down his throat. As I say that, I, I can feel the beast within waking up. My, my body is tingling with excitement, with that fantasy. The fantasy of just pissing down the throat of someone who works for ICE. But I wouldn't do that because I don't like peeing into men's mouths in public. And so I wouldn't do that. Uh, so I keep the beast in check. Not so the people who work for ICE. They don't keep the beast in check. They are beasts. If you work for ICE, you are a beast. The same way anyone who worked for the Gestapo was a beast. If you work for ICE, 
you are a beast. If you went to work for ICE, you probably went to work for ICE because you are a beast. Some of you went to work for ICE and and ICE awakened the beast within. But I can assure you, anybody who works for ICE is made up of, is a beast. I know who these men and women are who work for ICE. They're inside of me. They're inside of all of us. If Jesus died for our sins, ICE commits those sins for us. If Jesus died for our sins, ICE commits those sins for us. People who work for ICE rape, they torture and ruin lives and they enjoy it. They are forcing women to get sterilized. There are stories of ICE, these ICE for profit concentration camps forcing women to be sterilized. There are stories of inmates at ICE concentration camps being forced to work for a bowl of soup. ICE is evil. ICE is America's Gestapo. Abolish ICE. They don't make us safer. They make us less safe. ICE destroys us because the people housed in those for-profit ICE concentration camps are us. They are not criminals. They are running from criminals. They are running from gangs who are identical to the beasts of ICE. The clock is ticking on our planet, and it's also ticking on what's left of whatever you want to call our republic. I voted for Joe Biden. So did Harriet Fraud, Dr. Harriet Fraud. So did a lot of people who share and shape my moral compass. Dr. Fraud said she voted for Joe Biden because he wouldn't shoot protesters in the street. I think that's probably true, maybe. We just found out from Mark Esper in his new book that when he was Secretary of Defense, Donald Trump asked him to shoot Black Lives Matter protesters. Donald Trump literally wanted our military to shoot protesters. Senator Tom Cotton, Republican, pretty much said the same thing in an article he wrote for The New York Times two years ago. Republicans do not believe in democracy. They've made that perfectly clear. They believe in guns, religion, money, and power. And they use people of color, the LGBTQ, as scapegoats. It's not corporate America's fault. It's not the right-wing authoritarian seizing power. None of those people are to blame. It's people of color. It's men marrying each other. It's the oldest trick in the book because it always works on the ignoramicizes. What's the plural of ignoramus? Ignorami? Ignoramicizes. So no, Biden won't shoot us all in the streets. But But what he also won't do is shut down all the national security apparatuses. He won't remove all the tools at the right wing's disposable It's right wing's disposal. I need a break. He won't remove all the tools at the right wing's disposal when they are back in charge. ICE has to be eliminated today while the Democrats are still in office because we know the next Republican in office will be smarter than Trump. And Republicans are pretty good at ignoring the laws on the books and finding ones we forgot even existed, like Title 42, which allows ICE to keep people from entering this country if they are believed to be carrying a communicable disease. Nobody knew about Title 42. Nobody. But Trump's people found it. The virulent white nationalist Stephen Miller found Title 42. And this president, like the president before him, has been using Title 42 to keep hundreds of thousands of people from entering America. Now, Biden says he's going to reverse the usage of Title 42, but he's not getting rid of the law. 
the ex executive branch should not have the authority to decide unilaterally when and if immigrants from a specific country should be banned. Biden doesn't get credit for re reversing Trump's use of Title 42. It needs to be removed from the United States Code of Law. There are hundreds of emergency powers given to a president by law. They need to be taken away from the president today. There are laws on the books right now that would allow a president to turn ICE into his own private Gestapo. A party like the Democrats, a president like Biden, doesn't deserve credit for not invoking these laws, for not taking advantage of them. A party, a president deserves credit for getting rid of these laws so those laws are not sitting around for the next president to use. One of the reasons this country hasn't completely succumbed to the fascist elements in America is because during and right after Watergate, the Democrats were able to pass new laws that made it harder for presidents to do things like lead us into a protracted war without congressional approval. They set up inspector generals who, kept, who keep an eye on the executive branch to prevent the ruling class from controlling elections right after Watergate, the Democrats passed campaign finance laws that Citizens United and more importantly, Barack Obama rendered useless. Remember, Barack Obama was so great at fundraising, he turned his back on public financing. All he had to do to keep campaign finance law alive was to say, I'm not taking private donations. Obama did that. Hitler didn't break the law. He changed the laws. The Enabling Act was passed right when he came to power so he could have more power. Fascism can only exist if there are laws on the books that make it easier for a country to become an authoritarian regime. The Republicans are going to be in charge sooner than you think. One of the reasons Trump couldn't shoot protesters, fire rockets into Mexico, seize ballot boxes and overturn the election, all these things he tried to do. He did not succeed because there were still laws that prevent him from doing this. The issue now isn't whether Trump will be prosecuted. That ship has sailed. We know he's not going to get prosecuted. The issue is how do we plug the holes today to make sure the next Trump doesn't have the legal authorization to turn this country into a full on authoritarian regime. And the first law we need to get passed is getting rid of ICE. According to a new report by the Georgetown Center on Privacy and Technology, most Americans right now are being spied upon by ICE. Did you know that? The Los Angeles Times this Wednesday reported that ICE has created a vast network of surveillance equipment that allows ICE to keep track of all of us, bypassing every single law on the books. In other words, ICE is spying on us and it's perfectly legal. The Los Angeles Times says of this new report coming out of the out of Georgetown, Los Angeles Times says the report paints a picture of an agency, ICE, that has gone well beyond its immigration enforcement mandate. Instead of evolving into something of a broader domestic surveillance agency. And ICE has no comment. Whenever I read a story about ICE, ICE is asked for a comment. And they have no comment because ICE doesn't believe in a free and open press. Who ever heard of a police department like ICE that doesn't have press briefings? The FBI has press briefings. The Justice Department has press briefings. Every local police chief does press briefings. Every other police force has to answer to the press, not ICE. The Pentagon has daily press briefings, not ICE. 
ICE purports to have an Office of Public Affairs, but they don't return calls. I called them today. They weren't even picking up their phones. ICE needs to be shut down. In order to save this republic, we need to make it easier to vote, but we also need to shut down ICE. ICE operates with no oversight. They answer to nobody, nobody. They are a separate arm of law enforcement working in tandem with for-profit prison companies. This has all the makings of a country in which you keep your mouth shut or they come for you in the middle of the night. And that's what ICE does. They come for you in the middle of the night. Don't tell me you're worried about democracy without also telling me you're also worried about ICE. There is an epidemic of suicide in America and keeping ICE open is suicide. I'm not fun to be around, but I'm always right. And I am telling you, ICE will serve as our tyrants Gestapo. It is a brand new police force whose only institutional memory is one of thuggery. Say what you want about the American police and the FBI. There is a proud tradition of men and women who serve and they want to protect the institution. ICE has no such institutional memory. It was set up after 9-11. It is made up of mentally deranged thugs who delight in awakening the beast within. They are fascists. They work with private prison companies to gouge taxpayers and build for-profit concentration camps. ICE answers to nobody but themselves and their corporate beneficiaries. It is an organization of sadists who delight in cruelty. ICE is everything that's wrong with law enforcement. They perform no public service other than punishing innocent women and children and satisfying their beast within and our nation's beast within. We will be back with more. But first, Turtle, Mike Steinell.
All right. Where am I? Where am I? No, 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 no. That's not how it's done. Hang on. There we go. Oh, there we go. Jesus. Can you hear me? Am I alive? Or is this a Twilight Zone episode? I think I think I'm alive. Jason, are you there? Jason? I'm here. Oh, there you go. I'm here. Now, I was watching your show. Mm -hmm. You have a set. You have a microphone. You're in front yeah. of a screen. I yeah. can barely hear and see you. Why, why is that? Why can't I get... <laughs> the set, Jason, because it's beautiful, and I don't want to be locked in a dark room if I don't have to be. You can see me now. The sun's hitting just right. No. The, the show looks like shit. Not because of you, but it's like people are showing up like with bad sound and bad cameras. And then I like I watch you there and I go, why? Why can't I get uh, like Pascal shows up on set? Pascal always will show up on set. That is true. I love I love Pascal, you. I, I want all of you. He doesn't he doesn't live near the ocean. Well, I mean, I all right. I it, it's I find it. I'm getting anyway. We had a meeting yesterday about sound quality and video, and we're trying to make the show look almost listenable and watchable. C could you do me a favor next time you do the show? Could you do it for me? Do, do it do it in the room. Is it that oh, much like, of a sacrifice? Like punishment, man. Well, it's supposed to be the fun time. I just, sure. If you if you request, I'm going to go in the kitchen. I'm going to go into the kitchen slash dining area. Well, I don't know. I mean, if I were doing your show, would you want want, want sea breeze going into the microphone? And uh, do you live by the ocean? No, I I don't. I live in an air shaft. <laughs> you you yeah, hear all the sounds of New York. This is what I'm talking about. Well, I'm walking into the inside of the house. Yeah, I know, but like... Would you like to see the inside? You guys want to the camera just, around? Just, just wait till... Uh, you guys want to have a tour of the house? Look at that. Okay. See okay. that? Yes. No one gets a tour of the house, Feldman. That's beautiful. Yeah. Can I move That's why in? I live in Mexico. All right, let's... Do me a favor. I can afford this in California. Do, do me a favor, in all seriousness. And I'm going to be telling this to all the guests. F get your sound and your shot right, please. I'm telling this. You don't eat. Some some people come on the show with food in their mouths. No, I don't. I eat. watched This Is Revolution yesterday, and everybody mm -hmm. treats you with respect, and you treat you like everybody shows up and looks great. They don't eat. <laughs> they they have their shots framed. They have microphones. My show is just you know. I'm well, like, I would I'm, never eat on anyone's show. That's rude. Yeah, someone did eat on my show. Actually, I'll I'll, I'll tell you about that off air. I, I feel like I'm being treated like you know the guy who puts out in the back seat of. A, <laughs> I'm the guy who puts out in the no, back seat of a podcast. Looking. This used to be my background actually because I I. Uh, I used to shoot here and then I had a bit of a stalker for a while, so I didn't want to oh. show too much away, even though you can't even find where I live on a map. How come I don't have any stalkers? I mean, I know I'm not as good looking as Jason. Hey, you got to unbutton the shirt to the neighbor. Yeah. No, but nobody stalks me. No, I get no phone calls in the middle of the night. If you don't, if you don't let me see, if you don't let me send pictures of myself naked to you, I'm going to jump off the Golden Gate. Hey, I don't get that. I was, I was like, man, it really weirded me out because you know what? I don't know what any people know what I look like. I don't know what they look like. Is and you know, if someone comes up to me talking crazy and wants to attack me, I don't know who these people are. So it kind of scared the bejesus out of me a little bit. To be honest with you. But enough about stalkers. This Jason, is a good shot. Look at this. You got this good light. No, it's not. This is a good shot. No, you I worked all night show. on lower thirds. Look at look how nice your lower third is, and and you you cheapened it, and you make me feel like the guy who puts out in the back seat of a podcast, and it does, <laughs> you don't have to buy me a drink or anything. I feel cheap and dirty. 
I already feel cheap and dirty. Let's I've been doing I've been doing all my interview shows in this in this area because I, I it's more comfortable and uh, damn. Well, now you made me feel bad. Well, this is better. The sound is better and the lighting is better than the, uh, you know, sorry to interrupt your your you nap. Know. So you could do like it's like, hey, man, I'm, I'm just trying to enjoy this, uh, this right. life before Let, let's, it gets let's, from me. Let's get to work. I love Jason Miles and he's a gift. You are a gift to this show. I'm, I'm assuming I'm assuming this is um, this is this is uh, I'm the I'm the black son you've never had. So this is a chastising that the, the son would get from pop. So I appreciate that. You're actually the black son. I wish I had. Because the one you got now won't move. <laughs> right, uh, I don't want to talk about him. So anyway, I love Jason Miles. And, he, and I didn't mean to. But God damn it. I was watching your show last night and I'm thinking, this is fantastic. Like, you're, This is revolution. It, you know, not only is it interesting and smart and engaging, it looks and sounds good. And I'm thinking, why? Why can't my show look that good? Or at least why can't I have the people who have shows that look and sound that good look okay, and sound will, that will, good on my yeah. show? I yes. will say this. Yeah. Look, I will say this. I will say this. A very, a very nice uh, young lady who uh, will be on the show this evening uh, came down to Mexico to help spruce up my set with uh, old uh, posters and it gave me a nice backdrop and we had a, made a good shot and everything. So, you know, you used to do the show mm -hmm. with a nice backdrop. Jose Canseco, yeah. the baseball yes. cards. Yes. And then suddenly it's like, uh, you know what? I had Feldman already. <laughs> I don't. Let's. Talk. All right. I love you. I do. And I, I try to hurt the people I love. Jason Miles is the co-host of This Is Revolution podcast with <laughs> the brilliant Mr. Pascal. And brilliant. Um, he is brilliant. And uh, let's talk what we were talking about on Monday. Now, I don't know if you had the unfortunate experience of hearing my opening where I talked about eliminating ice. I would assume. Yeah, I mean, remember, I live in Mexico, so uh, there's one reality to where I live is that it's a lot of people that live down here, especially on this side, are not from here. And I think one thing people don't think about when they think about uh, immigration and deportation, which was really ramped up in the Obama years, is the fact that a lot of people just got dropped off on the other end. So there's, there's a decent amount of Haitian people here. It's not like... Uh, other parts of the border, but we do have a bit of a Haitian population and um, there's just people that aren't from here. And I don't think people take into consideration if you are a child, two, three years old and your parents go across the border, you didn't have a say so in it. And if you then get deported for whatever reason um, and you're not from around here, you didn't grow up around here. You didn't visit around here. Maybe you speak the language. Maybe you don't. That's kind of frightening. You know, it's frightening for me in some aspects of living out here. But uh, imagine getting this is a, a move by choice. Imagine getting thrown over here and then having to figure out, OK, well, how do I navigate finding a job, finding housing? Um, ICE is a, is, a, is a pretty violent organization because, as you said, they, they kind of work without any sort of autonomy. Um, and I tried to get a spokesman from ICE on my show. I, I, I can get you, uh, if you. If you want to have a really interesting ICE conversation, I'm being totally serious, uh, uh, Dave, David. Um, she'll be here tomorrow. Uh, she was an immigration lawyer for or not lawyers, she worked for immigration law for 20 some years and worked on some really big, big cases and actually was spied on uh, by ICE. Their, their office was bugged. They did a case called the LA-8 um, and, and she can get more into it. Uh, she's actually coming on tonight and gonna talk, with, we're gonna have Norm Finkelstein and her on. They're gonna talk wow. uh, the constitution and, uh, and the Alito decision in, in Roe. Right. I'm literally gonna move out of the way. Um, 
But yeah, ICE is, ICE is a problem. Immigration is, is a lot deeper than people think, especially when it comes to people being uh, like serving their time and then getting deported. Uh, there is a very uh, wonderful woman that uh, helps me out with translating. Um, she committed a you know pretty heinous felony, but she did serve her time. She spent all of her 20s and 30s and, and most of her 40s uh, behind bars. In America or uh, Mexico? In America, in California. And she was released here in, in, uh, in this, in this uh, Baja, California. They're like, here. It's not even where her family is from. So, so she does her know, time. She does her time in the United 25 States. 25 years. And then they, then they just throw her yep. out. Yep. So there's people like that that, you know, did some hardcore crime. And then there's people that, you know, might've gotten into a scuffle when they were younger, but you know, they'd been in America the majority of their life. They were, you know, contributing members of society. They got caught up in the, uh, the Obama wave. And, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting place to live. Uh, when you, when you come across those cats, um, because it's also sad. Imagine living your entire life, one place, and then I'm throwing you somewhere else and you can never go back home. Right. You know, everything is over there. Wealthiest country in the history of civilization. And mm -hmm. they can't figure out what to do with 55,000 refugees from Central America. Well, we always have to look at it as a capitalism problem, right? It's back to the whole crack conversation. When we start to look at it as the evil of white men or the evil of powerful men, let's look at it as the evil of the system. And as long as we live within this paradigm, then you're going to have these levels of exploitation. Um, when you have farm workers starting to organize, because let's remember during the, the post-World War II, that's still a section of society that isn't going to be granted these benefits like social security and the agriculture sector. So as these farm workers are starting to organize in central California and Southern California, you start to get things like the Bracero program where the government's going to come in and bust all your organization up with more cheap labor from across the border. And by the time that uh, program is ended in 65, we start to really change the way uh, we look at immigration and even what uh, department is handling immigration. And so when you look at what happens to Los Angeles or Southern California uh, post 65, you have an influx of uh, what we call the reserve army of labor competing with a reserve army of black and white labor that migrated from the South as well. And now they have to work in what we call post Fordist industries because all these factories have finally left or they're starting to leave. So you still need workers, but now you have a massive army of suppressed labor. So whenever people get kind of in a hissy about immigration and good people and who deserves and yada, 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 it's, like, it's, it's never about who deserves. It's never about who deserves. It's always about, can I push down wages? NAFTA. NAFTA decimated uh, northern Mexico and, and a lot of the farm workers. Um, and it's just been a nightmare. And it's also helped change the paradigm of drug trafficking and, and that illegal economy. So how, how did you know, it change the uh, drug trafficking? Around the time NAFTA gets done is also around the same time that uh, Pablo Escobar uh, gets gets killed and the head is cut off of that snake, if you will, in Colombia. And they were the main cartel. So cocaine was getting flown in now with NAFTA, you drive it in. It's a right. straight shot from Mexico to the top of to hell of Canada up to 25. So now you see a change in who controls the, where, where it's coming in. And that, and that really, uh, you see a little bit of it in the eighties, 
But once NAFTA gives you the green light, it's like game on with all kinds of drugs to women. Uh, and there's a, there's a couple of cartels in Mexico that are fighting because now uh, the people controlling the cultivation, there's, you know, rebels in the jungles, um, right wing and left wing. It's just splintered. Right. So even if you look at the price of, of how much uh, kilos were going for in the Escobar days to what they go for now, I mean, it's cheaper now than it was in the Escobar days. But by the time you get it from Mexico, it's a hell of a lot more expensive because they're the ones literally controlling. By the way, I have to to be fair. I have to turn on Pro Professor Ben Burgess. That son of a bitch. And why doesn't he Where have lower, is he? Where are your lower Where is thirds? How come you don't have lower thirds like Jason? Where's 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 dirty Ben Burgess? What's up? I'm, I'm turning on all the guests today. That's my new thing. <laughs> well, you're, you're up, coming man? to us from your set, right? That's your actual set, right? Oh, yeah. No, this is the uh, this is a studio. It's got a big marquee outside. So I give them an argument. No, some, <laughs> some people are showing up to the show sitting on the toilet. <laughs> I'm going, what? <laughs> I know that I, I know my show is not that important <laughs> but at least eating while sitting on the toilet is what i'm getting from some guests here i go uh, jason uh, why did you do that <laughs> and, and where's your lower third we were up all Dude. night hang on for one second i was up all night working on lower thirds for everybody and you don't have a lower third i'm not too sure what's right. i'm not familiar with this yeah that's that angle of pessimism yeah. that's right a uh, lower third is the way, where it has your name, your, your title card. Okay, that's it. Yeah, so well, I don't he's, not, he's not using one of our things that we use. He doesn't use a, a, an app strictly for this. He goes old school. Let me ask both of you. Ben, Professor Ben Burgess joins us. He's a columnist for Jacobin, among other things. Among other things, he's an author. Author and uh, host of Give Them an Argument. He's my friend. And a friend. There you go. Jason's friend. That should be the and top line. One of the most brilliant people. I have two of the most brilliant people I've ever met in my life. And all I keep thinking about is, where's his lower third? <laughs> I want him to have a lower third. Uh, I'm not doing too well. I'm in a foul uh, mood. It's uh, Jose Arroyo is going to be on later. And he taught me about the snap shoelace theory. Have you ever heard this? Jose talked about it. It's, you know, you're maintaining, you're maintaining, and then you go to tie your shoes and the lace snaps, and that's it. It's just white heat and you commit acts of violence. And well, let me let me say this before you go talk to my good friend. Whitford. No, I was going to ask both of you a question that I wanted both of you to answer. Go, go for it, go for it. But go, you go ahead. I want to say this. So last night, Pascal and I did a recap of the video essay that we dropped. I was all excited yep. about it and yep. it went well and I'm on a good mood and I'm going to go get a lobster taco downtown and I go outside to get in my car and my tires flat. I had the same problem. I swear to God. And I destroyed everything I could destroy. And luckily I have a very sparse apartment and it wasn't much to destroy. I was furious. Shoot, 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 shoot theory, yes. I, I couldn't leave. I borrowed my sister's car yesterday. And I love my sister. She can anyway, and a little protective of her car. And I got a flat tire. Oh, I was pissed. I was I was beyond pissed. See, you're different. Beyond pissed. Do you take it out on God? I say to God, what else you got? What else you got? This is nothing. This is all I, you got? I, I, I'm you like know, Ali I'm, standing up with God. I'm like Ali taunting Liston. Come on, come on. Give me a fight. You know, I I, uh, I recently listened to a uh, extensive interview that Jason gave on a uh, for a podcast called uh, What's Left to Do. And they, they really got into his, his childhood and um, Apparently, uh, Jason was raised in a, uh, in a in a in a pretty pretty intense church. I'm not familiar with the yeah. too familiar with the details, but the uh, but the the interviewer was, and she was like, "Oh, so you were a, you were a holiness child." 
<laughs> yes. Yes, I was. You were what kind I of was, you were you were raised? I, I have a question I wanted to ask both of you, but how were you raised? It's called Church of God in Christ. You got to have black friends to know about this shit, David. Like real black friends. And and what do they teach you? Oh, it's just like any other church. It's just it's loud. It's a loud and it's long. It's it's some southern shit. Uh, you got to go to one. I'm coming to New York in, uh, next month. We'll go. We'll to go one. to one. And I, and I can go, turn it down. Does it have to be so loud? <laughs> I, I, I respect everything they're doing, but does it have to be? And the lady in front of me with the big hat, I can't see the pastor with your big hat. Jason, what are they gyrating? Are they jumping up and down all the time? What's going on over here? I try to be respectful of other people's religions, but <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. This is like the synagogue. <laughs> Uh, let me ask both of you a question because both of you are very creative. I was going to talk about something that I get up early to write this morning. Mm -hmm. And about two hours in, I go, well, that felt good. And then I looked at it and I thought, well, I'm going to make a citizen's arrest. I should just turn myself in. This is this is you're a very sick and dangerous man. You would this would be offensive to Theodore Kaczynski. This is, you know, he would say, you know, I'm out of my mind, but this is, do you ever write things? Do you ever put things into writing that no person should put into writing? So my music is for. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. a good question for Ben. For both of you. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know. Sometimes the uh, I a bunch of shits pissing me off, and I and I have a series of complaints about it, and I get it all down. And before you know, you know, before I have time to reconsider, it's uh, uh, it's been called canceling comedians while the world burns. <laughs> you know it. You have a book. Um, well, it must be great having an editor though, because you have, you write for the Daily Beast and you write for the. Uh, for Jacobin, so somebody can set you straight, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, that's that. That is, there are good good things and bad things about it, depending. But yeah, I mean, I've I've been I think pretty lucky with the editors I've had, and you know, it's I think it's, um, you know, I think it's useful. I mean, like there are there are I think some pretty decent writers who are, you know, on Substack now, so they can like just write whatever they want, and nobody can you know can veto it and you know sometimes i'll read that stuff i'll be like yeah you know editors are good you're the author of christopher hitchens what he got right how he went wrong and why he still matters did he get to a point where he no longer needed an editor do you think well i mean people say that he required his his you know work required very little editing you know and i think i think there's certainly people who are um you know i think there are certainly people who you know, our pros and who like, especially I think after you've worked with uh, an editor or a magazine for, you know, for long enough, I mean, at this point, um, I have pretty, I have like a pretty good sense of what I can and can't get away with at Jacobin and, you know, what they're probably going to, you know, going to say no to and all of that, you know, so, uh, but, you know, but I, I still think it's like probably good, you know, I mean, like it's, it's, I, I, I mean, I, I do tend to think that there's something to be said for just like, having to run things by somebody else and like, you know, just, just get another take on it. I mean, right. I mean, like, that's the, you know, it's like, you know, like by, you know, like I like Stephen King, but like by like the sometime in the eighties, you know, you could definitely tell that like nobody was in a position anymore where they could say, Steve, <laughs> right. I, I don't know if, right. you know, maybe you should cut those last 200 pages. You know, <laughs> like, and, right. and I think it's work suffered for it. And, and Jason, you are, a video editor how has that mm -hmm. taught you to edit what you say considering what i just talked to ben about on a, a private issue um when i'm very upset i'll be i'll be totally transparent as my partner always says i do shows about it and you will never know who i'm pissed at mm-hmm you will never know what I'm pissed at or who I'm pissed at, but the whole show will have a purpose to crush somebody's kind of annoying uh, argument that they might have had against 
us or against something that we you know we are vehemently against and yeah all of the more often than not a lot of the shows we do right. are motivated by fuck that guy right. <laughs> well let's talk about uh yeah it's the it's christopher hitchens you know says uh the uh uh, the energy of hatred, it's a jug energy, but it could get you up and get you to write. That's how, that's how I live. Yeah. Let's talk yeah. about uh, J.D. Vance, because yeah, please. he's the, the Ohio candidate, uh, the Republican candidate for senator from Ohio. He's backed yep. by Peter Thiel. And, you know, we make fun of Peter Thiel because he's a billionaire. And we make fun of venture capitalists. There's an opiate problem, and J.D. Vance, who wrote Hillbilly Elegy, Elegy has mm-hmm. done something about that. He set up a uh, a nonprofit. So let, let's take a step back for a second, Professor Ben Burgess and Jason Miles. Before we criticize people like J.D. Vance, and I know there are, some of his positions are not spot on, but... He is a successful venture capitalist who went to Yale and he saw his community ravaged by opiates and he set up a nonprofit. I mean, no. do, doesn't he so, deserve some credit for that? So, so, this is, so this is kind of funny. Um, so you mentioned that Peter Thiel's funded him. This is going to seem a little bit like off topic or convoluted, but give me like 90 seconds because that's going to be worth it. Um, so by and large, especially in the early stages, Peter Thiel was like the funder of this campaign, like the, you know, like the there are other donors, but I mean, mostly the money's coming from him. Uh, Peter Thiel ended up spending 15 million dollars on this primary campaign, which is like unprecedented for like a state primary, you know, that uh, I'd spent 15 million dollars. But campaign finance laws, you can't just write a 15 million dollar check to the campaign, right? You know, that's their caps. That's too much. So uh, what you have to do is you have to spend on the super PAC. But in this, you know, the one thing is that officially the reason that under the Citizens United rule it says you can do, you know, there are no funded limits to the super PAC because that's not the campaign. That's just free speech on the behalf of the campaign. So um, and part of the fine print there is that you're not supposed to coordinate between the super PAC and the campaign. So um, in this case, though, because the teal money was most of what they were going on uh, for a while, uh, they did all the stuff that would normally be done internally with the campaign, like polling and analysis and stuff like that. They actually did that within the super PAC instead of the campaign. But even though this whole node coordinated thing is kind of a bad joke, like, in, you know, like in terms of how this works in practice, there are certain lines you can't cross. So they couldn't be like, you know, having the super PAC email the campaign every day. Hey, we did, you know, here's our new poll, polling data. Here's how you should adjust your strategy because that would be coordination. So here's what they did. Uh, they set up a website, a super minimalistic website. It's designed so that if you weren't looking for it, you wouldn't find it. Uh, but technically they can say we this, you know, we weren't giving this information to the campaign. We were just putting it on the public internet for everybody to see. Uh, and all it was, was a link to a Dropbox full of documents, which are polling, you know, like basically internal polls, et cetera, et cetera. One of these documents and since this is since the secret you know came out before I was working at this article, so I, I looked over it. This is my main source for this article, is a one hundred and seventy-five page analysis of JD Vance's potential vulnerabilities. Um <laughs> as prepared by the campaign or you know the super PAC which is essentially the campaign and it's very nicely organized this table of contents say oh you know what does he say about this what does he say you know and one of the potential vulnerabilities pointed out in this document is that that opioid uh, epidemic uh, nonprofit that he set up uh, is now seems to be defunct. But when it was active, something like 90 percent of the uh, the money went to uh, staff salaries and mm. zero zero dollars uh, of the last year that they seem to have been active. Zero dollars went to charitable activities. Mm. So, you know, I don't, I don't know that he deserves that much credit for that. OK, so but but it. In his, also, also in terms of more substance stuff, I I think if you actually look at his campaign website, he's tried very hard to s- give off this rhetorical impression of populism. He, you know, he talks about deindustrialization. He talks about China, whatever. And he talks a lot about the opioid epidemic, 
But I've looked through the whole section of this website about this. I have no idea what he wants to actually do about it. Right. Like he says, well, I'll, 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 I'll fight the drugs coming in. It's like, okay, how? Like, what are you going to do? That's not, it's not happening. Like, spell it out for me. Well, know, I want to peel. I want to peel back everything you just said because I was taunting you about his nonprofit. <laughs> I knew that none of the money went to where they said. No, no, it I thought that was that was a good. But I didn't. Uh, but dead that, pad long, you know. But yeah. the, the 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 finding of these documents that's incredible, Jason, isn't it? That they would put that up for everybody to see. <laughs> Yeah, I also think it's kind of arrogant and hilarious because of how much people don't try to find out what goes on with their candidates. I think it goes a lot into uh, something that I talk about or we talk about on the show, which is there's a lot of hero worship. Um, and J.D. Vance is trying to position himself as some sort of um, anti-leftist hero, as Ben said, you know, popul right-wing populism. Um, I come from the ghetto like you, ergo, I know your pain. Um, but <clears throat> I think he's kind of full of crap. And I spent a considerable amount of time in more of the uh, opioid ravaged areas of the Appalachians. So, yeah, and, and I should I should say, I mean, by trying to figure out how much. OK. <laughs> So some of this is not mine to tell, so I'm not going to say it, but they have a, but like, you know, I, I've i spent time in Ohio. I know people in Ohio. I, I All of the problems that he's pointed to are ones I'm pretty familiar with from um, uh, from those connections. And uh, and he's, he's tapping into some very real human suffering that he's describing, mm -hmm. but like, um, but the, but then like you really start looking at the details, you know, which is what I tried to do more than anything in this Daily Beast article. And I say, okay, so does he support Medicare for all? Does he, uh, <laughs> does he even want to weigh, raise people's wages? You know, like, does he even want to raise the, you know, the minimum wage, which I think is something like $7 and 22 cents, you know, that's uh, in the, uh, the Ohio, you know, the Ohio state minimum wage. No, I don't want to do any of that stuff. I mean, he has, he's, he's a, he's a Republican. I mean, like this is the, I mean, this is the thing that always like, kills me about these guys that it's such a it's such a paper thin branded exercise that you know that you yeah. have like republicans who just think regular republican stuff but you know if you say if you find enough ways to say on your campaign website you know that i really care about the ordinary people getting screwed over by the elites i guess that's enough for some people it's you know what you know what ben it's easy to talk about pharmaceutical companies right it's easy to say that big pharma is the problem big government is the problem and I'll, I'll fix it with clinics. Mm -hmm. We'll have more clinics. We'll, we'll give more money to private clinics. Um, those aren't the real problems. And we're always having the wrong conversation. And the opioid crisis problem situation is the same situation that happened that we were talking about, David, the other day with crack in LA. Mm -hmm. When you have areas that once had a sector where you could get a decent uh, job and have a job that supplied you with health care, now you no longer have health care. Luckily, if you get Medicaid, uh, there's a, a, now a larger segment of the population that is living on uh, government assistance. That means municipal tax bases are shot to crap. There will be an industry to fill that hole and that industry will probably be illegal. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that's exactly right. And, you know, and, and I, uh, and yeah, but the big element here, you know, he talks a lot about deindustrialization, uh, and there it's pretty thin too. He says some nice things about Trump renegotiated some trade treaties, but it's like, okay, now specifically what do you want to do when you're in the Senate? I don't know. But like yeah. the, the bigger issue is it's like, why were the steel jobs in Ohio such a big deal? Like, why was that such a devastating um, outcome for people who lived in those parts of Ohio when the steel jobs went away? And, you know, I mean, look, you know, my mom grew up in Youngstown at the, you know, when there were steel mills everywhere, you know, belching shit into the sky. And so, like, you had to, like, <laughs> uh, like, like my, my maternal grandmother was a nurse who was, like, shocked when there was this, like, 
biker from out of town who was in the hospital and like he had like completely pink lungs because like nobody in Youngstown had lungs that looked like that because it was so polluted all the time <laughs> working at the steel mills is yeah. uh in, like incredibly like medically dangerous uh it's 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 awful you know dirty repetitive work people don't miss those jobs because it was so <laughs> awesome to work at a steel mill right people yeah. miss those jobs because uh, because of the effect, you know, because the United Steel Workers, right? Because the because uh, because they, they actually paid decent wages. Um, I mean, it'd be fine. Like, you know, the, it. I mean, the reason it's the reason it's worse to work at a Walmart than work at a steel mill is not that is not the work, right? You know, in fact, many people actually like the work better. It's that the uh, uh, it's it's the it's the wages, it's the benefits, it's the you know, it's like everything that comes with you know labor organization, and I. I and I guess I guess the just big thing is like I mean it ties into what Jason talks about in his essay, um, you know the essay insulation in the link video essay you know on, on the LA riots you know which is um, I mean it just sounds simplistic but it's like you know it's like that uh, Ernest Hemingway uh, Scott Fitzgerald thing you know where where uh, where Fitzgerald says the rich are different and Hemingway says yeah they are they have more money like they <laughs> like like. You know, all of these things, like people just overthink the shit out of them. But it's like, no, it's 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 just poverty. Right. I mean, like, that's the. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not a sexy conversation. Right. We have to talk yeah. about the white working class. We always have to you know, talk right. about this, you know, with the there's a problem with the white working class. And then you get the J.D. Vance's and then you have to get Trump into the conversation because no one's going to click on your link if you're not bringing Trump and the white working class and this racist element. Like all this stuff gets brought into there and then you really want to say, well, this is about poverty. And now you just obfuscated the, the poverty problem and made it a white racist dope fiend problem. Yeah. And, 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 I should, and I should say, too, like that narrative, like at, like at the end of 2016, beginning of 2017, there were like a few months when everybody was obsessed with this that even used like the abbreviation, you know, WWC, you know, you know, for white working class. You know, it's like everybody was obsessed with this narrative, you know, that like really tied this in this way I never understood to race. Cause it's like, look, I grew up in mid Michigan. Um, the very close to very short drives to Detroit and Flint mm-hmm. who lives there. Like <laughs> right. this idea that deindustrialization <laughs> is a white people problem always seemed bizarre to me. And it's, it's, it's like, okay, what do you know about the history of black people in the 20th century? And what would your understanding of this be? without you know patterns of migration to the north that were to a large extent you know about getting these industrial jobs right right seems to me with opiates uh you you were talking about capitalism earlier jason all Mm -hmm. the money the new frontier is in for-profit drug rehabilitation there's there is a good amount in there um but, what do you do you know, if you can't go to if you can't go to a for profit retreat run by Bain Capital and you're addicted to opiates? Mm-hmm. What's available to you here in America? It always depends on where you live. There's something it may not be to the level of the private retreats. Right. Um, there's the places that people like uh, Stephen Tyler go <laughs> in Malibu. Right. And then there's the places uh, that look like uh, every horrible 90s movie you saw where someone got dropped off, which you can't really do anymore, into a, into a drug rehabilitation center. We don't, outside of the private sector and certain aspects of the private sector, we don't really look at drug rehabilitation um, the, the way we, we should I definitely have my issues with harm reduction, but I understand the importance of trying to keep people alive. But I don't think we're trying to really give people a better quality of life. Mm-hmm. And that's how we should always be looking at uh, rehabilitation. Because if you're trying to give someone um, a better quality of life for any services, uh, unhoused services, uh, drug rehab services, which are usually gonna cater to like a lot of unhoused people, um, they don't look like the resorts that you get in other parts of the country where people have an absorbent amount of money and the Cadillac insurance plans right. that can cover that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. 
Why do people become addicted to opiates? It's because they start off partly because of the the Sackler family getting them addicted to painkillers like Oxycontin. Yeah, but also like look, uh, most people who who take um, most people who take painkillers to the hospital for a while don't come out of it as addicts, right? Like like that's that's not. Um, I mean, I, I think that the, I mean, I think that I think addiction is more complicated than that. I think that you have, um, I think, I think a lot of, you know, I don't, I don't want to be too simplistic, but I think a lot of it has to do with what kind of life you're getting back to, you know, when, right. um, you know, like, I mean, just, just a historical example. I mean, like, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but I mean, there's a pretty absurd percentage of American soldiers in Vietnam who were using heroin uh, while they were there. Uh, it was, an, and, it was like unbelievable. I think. I'm going to yeah. say something like half. Is it? The, it was something. Yeah, it was. It was, it was something. It was believe. something ridiculous like yeah. that, right? And most of them stopped when they got back. That's interesting. Right? You know, like it, it, it. It's not. You know, I don't want to say like I. I know. I've known people who struggled with, uh, with addiction. You know, to both of those things actually, and and I. I know it's like complicated and people are complicated and there are all kinds of reasons why people start doing that and you know whatever but like i also think it's like not a coincidence right that this right. this kind of devastation and deindustrialization and you know plunging people into into poverty and collective despair you know coincides with this epidemic right and, and then just it's just like it's not a coincidence the crack is and then you have <laughs> you know people who are like mitt romney who become addicted to, yeah, he's he's not addicted, but okay. So I, I, what you said it sounded like. But he he uh, Bank Capital owns all these for-profit drug rehab centers, but there are people who return to mansions from these rehab centers. Yes, are, and, and then, well, the thing you have to look at is you know different classes of people are going to get affected by this stuff differently. So if you don't have any money and you get popped as a young person on drug charge, your life is ruined. You don't get to go to the retreat where you get trust falls and mountain climbs, right? Mm -hmm. You get to go to, to either little kid jail or sometimes big boy jail. And what we were talking about in the 90s, they wanted to send 13 year olds to big boy jail. Cats right. didn't care. You know, you actually see it with the with the Central Park uh, Five. I think one of those kids, the oldest one's like 16. And like, you're going to big, you're going to Rikers. The rest of these guys are going to juvenile hall, but you're going to Rikers. We don't care if you're 16 and deaf. So. And he was innocent. People, and he was innocent. Yeah. You know, yeah. But, you know, poor people, you don't have to do much for people in general. And, and I really want the audience to, to think about this for a second. Poor people don't have to do much for the American public in general to feel that their punishment is justifiable. Right. Yeah. And, we, and we should always remember that. Um, we don't all have to be, you know, Angela Davis style prison abolitionists to have some sort of heart when it comes to feeling that uh, everybody can be reformed, if you will. I don't know if that's the right terminology to use, but no, uh, I, mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, look, you, you know, I mean, you don't have to like look ahead to some utopia of like we figured out how to have a society without prisons at all. Or we, you know, we were in the, you know, whatever fully automated luxury copies <laughs> in the 23rd century or whatever. Like, you know, you could just say, Look at look at other countries that exist in the world right now. Norway uh, doesn't do life in prison or the death penalty. I mean, they. Uh, uh, but like Anders Breivik, unless they change the law, is going to get out of prison someday. You know, everybody gets out eventually. Uh, mm -hmm. And the actual prison he's staying in is a hell of a lot nicer than American prisons. You look at the you look at the pictures. It looks like he's staying in a college dorm room. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and yet, despite having this vastly more humane and rehabilitation focused prison system. Uh, Norway has a way lower crime rate than we do. Like, why? I mean, that's, you know, I mean, unless you have some sort of like magical, you know, mystical genetic explanation about, you know, Nordic people or something, they, uh, it's, it's because, it's because they, they have a more equal society. They have, they have like a much more extensive welfare state, you know, strong Thanks. unions, you know, better life. Everything in this country, when it comes to the poor, as Jason just said, is about punishment. I was talking earlier about the the refugees coming from Central America. 
Mm-hmm. There, there's no statute that says they belong in a concentration camp. Mm-hmm. And yet that's what we've decided to put them in, in for-profit concentration camps. We demonize them. Uh, they're not criminals. They've, they, there's no reason you can't just let them in, give them an administrative court hearing. They all show up to these hearings. It's, there's not like an epidemic of refugees getting into America and then running off and not being found. Like eighty. Well, they'd also look at the double standard with the Ukrainian refugees, which you know I'm not oh. saying I'm not saying we should yeah. take those people in. We should absolutely take those people in. You know, but like it's it is also like the thing that's really grating about it is it's like okay if you're a central american refugee so you're fleeing from conditions that we actually created right you know then like fuck you but i mean if you're right. you know but if you're fleeing from somebody else's uh, imperial project then you know yeah, yeah i think in. we created you the know. situation no, i mean we, we certainly did help <laughs> we certainly unless, did. unless uh, you know ashton kutcher and mila kunis who's ukrainian they fundraised i think like 30 million dollars and I know, I think it was a good portion of it, maybe 10 million went to Airbnb to host uh, Ukrainian refugees for up to two weeks. But Ashton Kutcher was a, uh, an early uh, investor in Airbnb. So, wow. you know, the private wow. sector- Wow, hang, hang on, you can't just throw that out and move on. What, Ashton Kutcher yeah. invested in Airbnb? Ashton Kutcher is Mr. He's like, Peter Thiel for the Zoomers. <laughs> wow. You know, awesome. Am I so lying? he's getting rich off. No, the, no, that's I think that's I think that's probably right. Uh, that's, he's getting rich off line. the refugee crisis. He figured. Wow. Look, man, look, man. Yeah. This country. You, you ever go to Vegas and lose your ass and a dealer looks at you and says, this place wasn't built off winners. <laughs> hey, next time you want to shake your head and get mad at the world, just see that dealer looking at you going, this place wasn't built <laughs> off winners. <laughs> well, so there is at some point you're down in Mexico mm-hmm. and Professor Ben Burgess, you're in Georgia. Is that still part of the United States or you guys? Technically, <laughs> technically yeah. Okay. Yeah. At some point, do we have to come to terms with who we are as a people? And if we don't like it, now how come Ethan doesn't have a lower third? I was so happy that Dr. Hershenfeld had a lower third. This What's is all a lower third? <laughs> well, I don't know. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I want. David, you were over here using show business terms with these guys. Right. Yeah. Can I they can I give myself a, a a subtitle like you guys have? Well, you're supposed. He was to. supposed to do that, sir. And uh, oh. there's been a, a mess up somewhere. And hey, Jason. Now he's going to fire the producer. Well, it actually wouldn't be appropriate for me to have a subtitle because I don't even have a title. So. Right. All right. W- w- we're going to wrap it up. Uh, I have other guests that I must turn on. Yeah. Uh, so, so speaking of speaking of Peter Thiel, though, I would just say. I'll just I'll just I'll just tease it and say that in the last part of the article about J.D. Vance, the Daily Beast, I do talk about Peter Thiel and uh, that guy is something else. Yeah. <laughs> you are something else. He's something else. <laughs> I love you, Burgess. Thank uh, you, love Jason. You. Love you, Jason. This is this is revolution. Listen to it. And thank you for for showing up and uh, wearing a shirt and sound being good, Jason. I appreciate it. Uh, I'll be on Ben Burgess's show with Ture Reed uh, Sunday. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, now, yep, when you so, show, uh, I'm just curious, will you be doing it from your porch? Will you be doing it? Fuck from yeah. Your- I'm going to be doing it. I'm going to be doing it from right here. Not uh, from your set. No. And there'll probably be uh, a woman next to me. Okay. And we're going to talk about movies. Yeah. Okay. Should be fun. I'm going to look, my whole goal is look like a Bond villain. All right. All right. Uh, professor, read Professor Ben Burgess over at Jacobin. Read him over at the Daily Beast and listen to give them an argument wherever right. fine podcasts are downloaded. Thank you both. All right. Love you Thanks, guys. David. Thank you. Thank you. And who doesn't love the Hershenfelds? One of them gets a, uh, a lower third. One of them doesn't. 
And this is all I'm thinking. You could tell me that I just won $20 million in the lottery and I'd be saying, yeah, but I can't get all my guests to have lower thirds. This is... Uh, is, that, is the lower third that it's that thing, that banner? Yeah, I mean, I was watching other people's podcasts. Oh. And I was thinking, I've been doing this long enough. Maybe mine should look professional. It doesn't, I think it's too big and it's blocking like key areas like the pectoralis majoris and the deltoids. It's blocking, it's, it's, you're detracting from the titillating experience that your viewers have of okay. getting to interact with Maybe. Adonis's like the Hershenfelds. <laughs> like the Hershenfelds. Dr. Philip Hershenfeld is a Freudian psychoanalyst, a psychiatrist, and Ethan Hershenfeld is. Besides being a brilliant comedian who you can see on Thug Thug Jew on YouTube right now by streaming it, he's also in all your favorite shows. All of them. Bull. I Red love Lucy. Notice. This is your life. Red Notice. Red Notice. The Red Buttons Comedy Hour. The Red Buttons. I've... Okay. I have some things I want to talk about. And I, before you go, yes, I have go something ahead. It's just burning. It's burning a hole in my mental pocket. I got to spend this thought. There's a shortage. By the way, these ice cubes I was just showing you, they're shaped like muscle men. Oh, let me so see. Just, yeah. They're from Provincetown, where you can get things like that. See? It's like a muscle man. I love a that. Muscle. Yeah. He's like a, a, an ice cube with a big bicep. Anyway. there's, what, a, there's you, a have a of, you have a buzz. You have a buzz. You hear that? Oh, oh, that's a, a, a neighbor doing construction. God damn it. Yeah. So should I go inside? I should. I mean, you heard the guy. Excuse me, Dr. Philip Persian. I don't want you to hear this. I thought he was finishing up you at 7 o'clock. You are about to come on the show. You know that there's construction going on. No, there wasn't. I thought they're finishing up. And, and plus, Ed, Ed, yeah, see, it stopped. Well, now I have nothing to be angry about. Yeah. See if he can start it up again. If it happens again, I'll, I'll go inside. I got people eating on the toilet doing my show. Oh, but I took your I took your guidance as far as acoustic uh, quality very seriously. We had a we had a Zoom. In fact, several of your guests we had a group Zoom to just discuss it, discuss whether we want we were in favor of it, whether we wanted to oppose, whether we wanted to form an opposition block, oh. vote you out. We had all sorts of. We decided let's just go with his recommendations. Okay, did you? Because there are two things I want to get to. So, but I'm dying. very quickly. Let me just say my yes. thing. Similac. There's a shortage of Similac, um, and other fake milks. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, and you know the solution is very clear, as far as I'm concerned. It's the breast brigade. We have to get all, there needs to be a brigade uh, of women lactating, women have to band together. And it's like Tesla charging stations. They have to just get out there <laughs> at strategic locations along I-95, 80 West, all the major thoroughfares. Get these babies to those charging stations. They right. got to get them out there. And there are enough women. I mean, back in the day, that's what the Middle Ages were all about. You right. had a wet nurse. You had people who did this. Um, and the more you a, a, a woman never stops lactating. And a baby never stops sucking. That's what they do. <laughs> They're just thirsty. It's, per, it's a match made in heaven. Dr. Hershenfeld. Yeah. If if a do you mind leaning forward just so we can? I've been getting. I want to get all the sound. I'm I'm being a little anal today. About, I'm being anal about my. Thank you, thank you. Closer, closer. I'm being anal about my oral. That's what uh, the sound. Uh, uh, Doctor Hershenfeld, if yeah. a uh, the mammaries, if a woman is breastfeeding and the baby never stops. She will continue to produce milk, right? I think so. I think that's the idea. Yeah. So theoretically, theoretically, a, a yes. woman could be this could be an opportunity to put people to work. Listen, I I, I don't I, I feel like there could be some blowback from this suggestion. It sounds a little bit like Handmaid's Tale. It sounds a little bit uh 19th century, but I feel like that's where the country's going. I mean, uh, as far as our sexual politics, um, what's going on with Roe. Suppose we called it artisanal breast milk. 
And also, you got to carbonate it. You want to carbonate it and make it an egg, sort of an egg cream experience for the child. A little u bet syrup. And you were, we're in business. Okay, more importantly, what, what were you going to Well, no, about? I like... Wait, wait, wait a second. Today is my father's birthday. Oh, wow. 100, 112 years old. The reason I bring him up... But he's not, he's, not, he's not with us. You can't say 112 years old. He would have been, you have to say. Um... He had a story. He had many stories about himself. And one of the stories was that he was nursing until around four years old and he wouldn't stop. So his mother got advice from a neighbor, which which was very primitive advice that she should get some paint and paint her breast some color. And then when she uncovered, it would scare him to death. So cruel. And it worked. And I think it was responsible for many of my father's psychological issues. Yeah, to the, and and to, for for the entire 90 years of his life, whenever he saw the color green, he got extremely thirsty. <laughs> How is it? Because I believe in psychiatry. I believe that you doctors know what causes trauma and neuroses. How did people survive before Freud? The the amount of trauma inflict. This must have been a world that was just completely traumatized before Freud, right? And it's, it's totally unchanged. Why, you think Freud all of a sudden made everybody behave better? I don't think so. A little better. Maybe a little, maybe some people a little more thoughtful, which makes a big difference. A little more thoughtful, yeah. And I, I like your idea, the, the the breastfeeding stations. Yeah, Tesla, I think Elon Musk, could, yeah. he'd get on board with that. I like that, that idea. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Instead of Twitter, it's called Titter. <laughs> All right, let's download talk, the app. <laughs> let's talk about a story that I didn't follow because I found it sad, depressing, and a symptom of a larger problem involving our prisons. Vicky White was transporting uh, a, a a fellow prisoner. Also, oh yeah, the story. Yes. Yeah, she was uh, transferring uh, uh, Casey White out of a jail for a fake court appointment, and they fled Alabama and. They ended up being found in Indiana. He's been captured. She apparently committed suicide. That's what we've been told so far. It's a very sad story. And as always, it's the woman who who pays the price. There turns out to be a a, a mental condition called hybristophilia. What is hybristophilia, Dr. Philip Hershenfeld? It's the it's the you just love Hebrews <laughs> and brisket. Hebristophilia <laughs> is another in the long line of psychiatric diagnoses, which are meaningless, useless. People love making them up. They don't mean anything. Maybe some drug company will come up with a new drug. I'm serious. <laughs> For hebristophilia. That, that could even be the name of the drug. That, that's a great name for a drug. Here's what's going on. All of us, men, women, children, we all have an id. Our ids are filled with all sorts of fantasies, sexual and aggressive. Regular cesspool. <laughs> but then we all have, to some degree or another, an ego and a superego that hopefully controls some of these primal desires. 
But that ego and superego is is distributed distributed unequally throughout the population. So for example, show me a woman who careful, doesn't. careful. <laughs> Cuz I happen to have one. <laughs> who Go doesn't ahead. take a look at Marlon Brando in Streetcar in his wife beater Whoa, 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 whoa. That's what they call these these shirts. Yeah. yeah no, no, we know what they're called. Okay. That's, that, that's putting it politely. There's another term for that that we can't mention. Okay. About. Show me a woman who isn't slightly turned on, excited by that he man masculine image. Well, there's there's millions of them. Let there. the man finish. Okay. I was going to say, show, I, I held my tongue. I, you say, show me a, man, a woman who isn't turned on by Marlon Brando and a wife beater, and I'll show yeah. you Mrs. Marlon Brando. But I held <laughs> yeah. my tongue, exactly. Ethan. Exactly, yes. Or show me a man who isn't turned on by uh, some character played by Marilyn Monroe. This is, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't let this heteronormative uh, heterocentricity go unchecked. I'm not kidding. It's so, this is like a monologue out of a play from 1958. I was born in 1941. Give me yeah. a break. Yeah, but I mean, seriously, there's, uh, yeah. Let me make my point, then you can demolish me. Is that I'm not demolishing you, just you need to include the, include there's there's many yeah. types of people on the planet i'm including all the other types of people so let's say there's a woman who's turned on by marlon Brand. land the plane dad land will the you plane. let let the man let the man finish. Were my, my whole childhood was like this <laughs> so was bringing me up. his whole childhood was like that too i couldn't get a word in edgewise <laughs> Uh, now, some women will say, that's a really interesting, exciting guy. However, they will say, do I really want to be married to a guy like that? Potentially violent, doesn't have a job. But, so she'll, she'll say, he's, he's exciting, but I'm going to pass. Same thing with uh, the Marilyn Monroe character and Some Like It Hot. A lot of guys would say, boy, wow. But if they think it over or if they met somebody like that in a bar, they would think it over. Now, let, say, let me ask Ethan a question, if you don't mind. Yes. Some, I don't mind anything. Oh, I, by I, the way, I'm just, I'm just Googling these celebrities you're mentioning. Okay, from a some era. like it hot. No, no, I, I know. If I know. you had to choose between Jack Lemon. Tony Curtis. Or would you go with Tony Curtis? You don't even have to finish the sentence. Tony Curtis. Great calves. Great calves. You see, I, did, I would have gone with Jack Lemon and some like it hot. I found him hot in He'd the He'd be apartment. somebody to talk to afterwards. That's okay, cool. I'm going to land the plane. Okay. The land the plane is a lot of people, a lot of women, for example, love a bad boy. Right. But only a very few of them suspend their judgment to the degree that they throw over their life, throw over their marriage and run off with this bad boy um, on his motorcycle. Some will, a very few. And that's what this thing is. That bad boy in jail, that criminal, for, for some people, maybe for most people, there, there's an aura of excitement and power about him, but only a very few people will have the uh, insufficient ego or super ego to turn over their lives, suspend their judgment, and end up getting killed. Can I? I'd like to respond to that. So, hybristophilia is a sexual interest or attraction to men who commit crimes. And it's there's a phenomenon of women writing to Richard Ramirez, the, the yeah. night, the night stalker. Uh, I wrote to him, but that's a I, I want to know if he took requests. 
<laughs> I just do you take, I got a list here that maybe you could no. Um when I was a virgin <clears throat> last week? Last week. Uh, no, the first time I was a virgin. Uh, I noticed like in elementary school, high school, and uh, last week, that tough guys were exciting and women, you know, they, they smoked cigarettes and they were prone to whatever was crime back when I was growing up. And I used to pretend to be a lot meaner and tougher than I actually was because I thought this this will cure my virginity. Uh -huh. And I did notice that they're acting tougher. Uh, this was like, you know, that women in a way found me safe. This was what I played in my head, that I was safe because they knew they were not going to have sex with me or go out with me. So I was safe to be around. But they also figured that now this is my imagination. This is not rooted in any of my reality that I figure hebristophilia stems from a woman who was abused either from, you know, by her father or another man. And by being with a criminal, he will keep her safe from other men. That's one of the theories, but I don't think that that's the primal excitement. The primal excitement is over this powerful man and everything that that means. Because for most women, her father or whoever the father stand in was when she was four years old, looked like this huge, powerful, somewhat dangerous, exciting guy with tattoos and a leather jacket and a mustang right. and a can of schlitz by the way with your father's problem of being unable to give up breastfeeding <laughs> what what my father did and i did this with all my kids is when uh the the wife and the kids weren't looking i would sprinkle hot pepper on her nipple <laughs> and as the months went on i would increase the dosage of the hot pepper so uh, now, now, now one of my sons can only, what's the joke, Ethan? Yeah, he can only eat Thai food. <laughs> to get an erection. <laughs> uh, two stories I want to talk about. I want to talk about Ed Koch's tombstone. I, I would assume both of oh, you, yeah. you yeah. both read that piece in the New York Times about Ed yeah. Koch. But... I was an armchair psychoanalyst earlier this week talking about Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, who was confined to a wheelchair. He's an anti-abortion crusader who went for a jog in 1984. A tree snapped his back. A tree fell on his back and he became a paraplegic. Is there without getting anybody into trouble? Uh, as, but am I on the right path to suggest that you cannot separate the fact that Greg Abbott has been in a wheelchair since 1984 and he's also the face of stringent anti-abortion laws that dictate a woman must keep a baby even in the case of rape or incest? Is there a connection? I didn't know this guy. I've seen photos of him. I didn't know that about him. Is it like FDR? They don't show it or what? Yeah, no, he's he's, you know, and I'm uncomfortable talking about this, yeah. but. And I feel a little guilty, but I don't think you can separate. Uh, the face of the anti-abortion movement being in a wheelchair since 1984. I, I think that the, the idea that somebody's telling women what to do with their bodies when he can't tell his own body what to do. I, I don't mean to be glib and cruel, but yeah. I don't Listen, think these are healthy people psychologically. You can't separate 
anything from anything else. Every experience, especially every major experience that we have undergone has some kind of influence on our feelings, on our fantasies, on our emotions. So you take two guys who've had the exact same accident, you can't predict what effect it's gonna have on either of them, but it certainly is gonna have some effect and in part it's gonna be related to their previous personality. Right. And one guy will become totally hard assed and enraged. Well, they'll both be enraged. Right. And they just have to be. But how they deal with that rage? This guy deals with it through sadism towards other people, masquerading as, you know, good republicanism. The other guy may may mask his rage by becoming a, a lifelong do-gooder and, um, you know, start a fund for kids in wheelchairs or whatever. But of course that kind of an experience is going to be very important for their whole future development. I just, I want to jump in and I just want to say, I disagree with everything that you've said tonight, dad. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Your mom That's must not... be looking really hot tonight. That's that all I can tell you. Sense. <laughs> this is why I had a son to stop me from getting, you know, overly impressed with with flows out of my mouth. I no, told no, you, no, Dr. I, Hershenfeld, that I had a moment with one of my sons three weeks ago. Yeah. And I thought, he doesn't want to kill me and sleep with his mother. He just wants to kill me. <laughs> he just he's not he's not even thinking about sex. He just wants to kill me. Go ahead, Listen, Ethan. Me and this guy here, we have a really good relationship. I know, I know. But no relationship, none, is without its dark side. And the dark side comes out in his wonderful humor. <laughs> oh, Jesus, you're really on a roll tonight. Jesus. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that, that is a giant soapbox you're sitting on tonight. Oh, my God. He pays, he pays me a lot of money to come out here and spout psychoanalysis, so I've, I've got to do it. What can I say? Right. I think no, the you, two of you model, in all seriousness, I think you two model a perfect relationship between a father and a son. I well, do, I, do. I, I thank you for that. And I, I take all the credit. Uh, I really... <laughs> When it's whenever it's a risk of you can see how I have to rein him in. It's like, <laughs> like with a, a wild horse, you got to sometimes you just got to you can't let it just do its thing all the time. You let it do its thing and then you have to. It's because of that painted breast. <laughs> my father has to death. That's like the Yersh the Yersh Kaczynski novel, uh, the, the Painted Bird. Your father's is the Painted Breast. Right. <clears throat> you, you were going to say something, Ethan. I interrupted you. I, I really, I, it was whatever it was. Now, are you up in Massachusetts? Yeah, but I'm coming back tomorrow. What are you have, so grumpy um, about? You're in Massachusetts. <sighs> well, the neighbor's construction. No, ah, no, no, no. no. The construction. Yeah, go ahead. I was very grumpy today. I, I had a, a lot of. I was anxious because I had a whole bunch of I did a whole bunch of auditions yesterday. Then a whole bunch more came in. And then I also have a big comedy show on Saturday night. And then I was worried about I, I just I, I was I was in a pissy mood this morning. I guess maybe you're, you're still feeling the Well, uh, I've been in a pissy mood. The, the remnants of it. I was know? in a I, I said you, you weren't here. I said I wrote a, an opening for this show that would have. You know, if Theodore Kaczynski read it, he would have said, hey, I'm crazy, but this stuff is like you can't show this to anybody. This you know, it's funny. I looked him up the other day because I was helping someone with a joke they were writing that involved people who dropped out of college and they were naming. They were like with Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. And I was like, oh, what about Kaczynski? I looked him up. 
not only did he graduate, then he got a, a master's and a PhD. So like it, MIT it, and Harvard, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, and then he was at Berkeley uh, teaching math. Uh, anyway. yeah. um, it was his brother who turned him in. You can't trust it. All right. Let me let me bring up Ed Koch. Yes. So the New York Times. Well, you saw my 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 suggestion for the epitaph. How did I do? <laughs> right. But I wanted your father. Well, let me let me okay. bring this because I. Right. So Ed Koch was the mayor of New York City, elected three times. Very successful politician. I'm not a big fan of his because I think he turned Manhattan over to Wall Street. And there were. But uh, he was your a, a silk stocking liberal. He was right on all the the, the big causes, but wasn't particularly uh, interested in class struggle. But he said all the right things. There were always rumors that he was gay. There was a rumor about his involvement with a firefighter. And then you began to realize, well, he's asexual. He's like, he must be asexual. The New York Times did a big expose because what what's all the stuff that's going on with climate change, Ukraine, democracy under threat. The New York Times did a, you know, five fifty thousand word expose on whether or not a dead guy was gay or not. And they finally got to the bottom of this because this is what the New York Times should be doing. It turns out they got to the top. <laughs> And it turns out Ed Koch is gay. Breaking news. This is the moment. Right. Here's what I saw. I'm reading the story and they had a picture of his tombstone. And I thought, oh, I want to show this to Dr. Hershenfeld. OK, oh. I would assume you read some of that article, right? I read it. Yeah. OK. Here was his tombstone. He died uh, in 2013. And this was a man who lived in denial. He even after serving office, he couldn't come out of the closet. And on his tombstone is the Shema. But above that, above the Shema is. Quote, a quote from Daniel Pearl in 2002, just before he was beheaded by a Muslim terrorist. I've never seen a tombstone like this. This is a quote. My father is Jewish. My mother is Jewish. I am Jewish. Daniel Pearl, 2002, just before he was beheaded by a Muslim terrorist. The idea that Ed Koch would put that on there, it's, you know, the, the only logical response to him saying that is no kidding. <laughs> that, like, that Ed Koch is Jew no kidding. Yeah. That Ed yeah, and Koch is coming out as Jewish. It's like, oh, <laughs> right. like Woody Allen coming out as Jewish or like Moses coming out as Jewish. Dr. Now, David, you were talking about these little signs that, that we have, some of us have in front of our names. Mm -hmm. Well, that tombstone looked great. <laughs> By the way, uh, Daniel Pearl, if you know, if somebody's going to kill you because of your religion, you got to right. get that's a pretty profound yeah. thing to say. You got to respect that. He was beheaded. Yeah. Uh, so and not by a moil, but for the mayor of New York to put that on his tombstone, what does that mean? For a, you know what? It, I don't know what it means, but it, what, the first thing that pops into my mind of what it could mean was a rebuke to himself that he could not be as forthright as Daniel Pearl. I'm putting down my paintbrush. When okay. I, that, well, okay. That is absolutely Ethan. I have a. I'm gonna. I have a, a, a competing theory of, of what. <laughs> no, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on for one second. Let's Compete, hang on one second. Let's do this right. 
God darn it. Oh, here we go. All right. So let me put some. All right. We're putting okay. money in the kitty there. All right. Yeah, the competing series. Well, hey, Dr. Hershenfeld, you say that uh, Ed Koch's tombstone was a rebuke against himself for not being brave enough as doc, as, as as Mr. Pearl was yeah. to state his truth. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. Sort of an, uh, and now uh, your competitor, uh, your colleague, Ethan Hershenfeld. But unconscious. It was unconscious on, on, yeah. on Koch's part. Um, I, my, my theory is that he was attracted to Daniel Pearl. <laughs> and he was clearly, by listening to Shema, he was, he was a believer. Mm-hmm. And he was trying to essentially curry favor and court Daniel Pearl, like kind of a little sycophantic uh, epitaph, so that in the afterlife he had a chance of getting laid. I, I think the game. By the way, let me just say you, get, you won. Proud. You beat, not, you beat the psychiatrist. What? I'm, 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 I'm not proud of that theory. Oh, wait, 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 wait. The judges. Oh, the judges have something. Oh, we're getting word that there's no such thing as an afterlife. Point goes to Dr. Philip Hershenfeld. <laughs> close, Ethan. You were so close. I, I, I have to admit that my learned colleague <laughs> had a much deeper, <laughs> um, penetrative to the unconscious understanding of this than I did. Mine was much more superficial. Ethan is basically saying, Ethan is saying that Ed Koch had a fantasy of going to heaven, walking up to Daniel Pearl and saying, you want a little head? (laughs) 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 Say it like it is. That was a shit show. It was startling to see that it was 20 years ago. I'm sorry, what? It was startling to see that that Daniel Pearl died 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. I, but um, enough time has passed that... That we can, yeah. We can laugh at him. <laughs> the official I, count is 20 years, and then he's fair game. No, um, I apologize. Now, I apologize to bridge. anybody who... <laughs> Apparently that bridge laughter listen, laughter is 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 healing. I disagree. Okay. Laughter is I don't care. <laughs> laughter is there's been a tragedy and I couldn't care less I have my own to worry about. I don't know. But what I, I'm looking forward to them renaming that bridge. I, there's never, I've never met a bridge with more names than that thing. It was, it was 59th Street. It was Queensboro. Now it's the Ed Koch Bridge. What's it going to be next? I think that there, there's a movement afoot to, to rename it. Um, oh, uh, I have a dirt. I can't do it. The Ed Koch Bridge. No, I'm um, not going to do it. You 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 guys both li- I think live you can see your, that bridge is close to both of you I feel like maybe it should be the, uh, the named in the honor of both of you how about that I would like a bridge named after me it's the why bother you won't make it turn around there's nothing on the other side for you to get to Dr Philip Hershenfeld yes. psychiatrist. This was fantastic. I appreciate this. I really do. And I, th- I, thought, I thought you were about to offer me some reward or something or award. Uh, in the, the portentous way in, in, in which you enunciated my name. I felt like he was, gonna, he was about to punish you. It's Let's, this is your reward. Yeah. Your okay. son is a genius. Oh, okay. Let's not. Let's not. Uh... Let's not stop there. Keep going. <laughs> so, and everybody um, should go download right now or stream Thug Thug Jew on YouTube. Yeah. And, um, you know, do they say success is its own reward or is or is that what they say? Or is, no. is that an expression? No. Living well is the best reward. That is it. Revenge. 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 Is it? 
No, revenge is not the best reward. It's a dish. Revenge is a dish best served Living cold. Living well is the best revenge. That's the saying. Okay, so therefore, by transitivity, living well is best served cold. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> It's very confusing. All right. Revenge, okay. revenge is a dish best served cold, which means yeah. you can only get it at Chipotle. I think is the, lukewarm. Lukewarm. It's lukewarm. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Doctor Philip Hershenfeld. Thank you both. And let me let me also just say this. Yes. True wealth. People have a misunderstanding about that. They think it comes from the things that you accumulate or your your bank account. It really comes from the people who lend and give you that money. Yes. It's not. It's not the. It's not the. Okay, I think I Jesus said that. Jesus said, "Blessed are the money lenders, for they will give you wealth." At uh, oh hey Jose Jose wow. hi hi sorry. I just, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, we're in OT. Goodbye. God bless. Oh, okay, well, okay. thank Goodbye. you. Thank you, you. Dr. Hershenfeld. Goodbye, Jose. Bye bye. Bye bye. The, the yeah. Jose Arroyo, Emmy bye. Award winning comedy writer, and you don't have a lower third. <laughs> so, whatever you say, I'm just going right. to be thinking. Okay, I, you know the show sucks because nobody has lower thirds. Even though, uh, <laughs> so what, I won't even be listening. Just oh, the snapped shoelace theory is yes. something you taught me twenty snapped. years ago. Oh. Tell me about the snap shoelace. Wait, wait, you'll have to refresh me. Uh, every time I come on, you quiz me on something I told you twenty years ago. All right, Jose Arroyo. <laughs> the pressure you put me under, David. Jose Arroyo is a beloved comedy writer, and I, I'm going to be honest with you. There are, there are two comedy writers who taught me how to think differently, you and Chris Kelly. Oh, sure. It's, it's just two, it's, I, I would read your stuff and I go, oh, there's an other way to write comedy. And you're, you taught me that contained within words are puns that can become jokes that are not punny. They're not punny, right, right. But, but, um, but, but if you look at word origins, there's a reason puns exist and oh sure and word origins are punny because they are related to something related to that word anyway that's not why i'm right right okay you're an emmy award winning that, right that broken shoelace uh what, what's the and you are a just let me remind and you're also besides being a brilliant comedy writer you're one of the few people who has actually gotten his cartoons published in the new yorker Yes, from time to time. From but yes, between yes. But that's like that. That is like an amazing accomplishment for for. Well, I yeah, I I, I it's uh, something I love to do. I love to draw, and I love I I've always loved to draw, and I obviously I work very hard to get funny. Um, it takes time, and <laughs> and so I combine them both. I think my drawing skills are about. 15 years behind my joke writing skills, but luckily uh, in the New Yorker, and, and this is rightly, I think they're correct to do this. They favor, you know, they prefer a, a good punchline over a clean, perfect cartoon uh, drawing style, you know? Right. Um, and you're Thurber, there, you're, you're, you're there. I mean, your stuff, you're, I hope you, you brought some potato chips with you that we can. I did. Bring, I did bring some potato chips. I, uh, I brought some potato chips, you know, in a classic overcorrection. I brought quite a few. Good. Um, and, they are uh, like potato chips. He'll start showing these cartoons and I could just shut down the rest of the show and just have him show us these cartoons. And what's especially enjoyable for me is they were all rejected. They were all rejected. <laughs> fact, I, were the ones they, they said, nope. And and they sent them back. Uh, so, yes, what we're, what it, we're it's getting, perfect for me. It's perfect of failure. You've built an empire on failure. This is, <laughs> this is perfect. It's perfect for me because I I get to enjoy the the cartoon. Then yes. I get to enjoy 
that it was rejected. So I'm not threatened. Exactly. I'm not threatened by your success. And I get to enjoy <laughs> your pain. Your confusion. Well, there's a writer, a, a cartoonist named Matt Diffie, who actually publishes a book called The Rejection Collection. And it is a collection of New Yorker cartoons that were rejected mostly for being utterly tasteless, um, some scatological and so on. And he's got a second ver book uh, of that coming out very soon. So look for The Rejection Collection. I am not featured. I was rejected. <laughs> Fun. How does that make you feel great? I I listen. Okay. I I'm dead inside. Uh, I like to be. I, I'd rather be protective of you than looking up to you. That's my. I understand zone. exactly. Exactly. It's better to be condescendingly comforting than it is to be admiring someone. Right. I I totally believe that. It's we like, oh, we no, worked on the Dennis Miller show together during sure. back when the Dennis Miller show was at, you know respected. I would say he was at the time an equal opportunity offender. Right. That's that's the way I've always phrased it. And I had seniority over you. You did, yes. And but yeah. I realized you were better than I was. So I used to go into your office and I say, let me give you advice. <laughs> Do you mind if I just give you yes. some paternalistic yes. advice? And then you, you say have this way of talking that is extended and slow <laughs> and portentous. And so it sounds important mm -hmm. and real. And then and then uh, you hear what you say. And then it's like, oh, wait, OK, I would I would weird. literally go into his office. I, I had a bad night with the family. I'm not feeling funny. Let me just give you advice. And then you thank me for it. And I would put my feet up on his table on your desk <laughs> and give you nonsensical advice you for like me, yes you gave me stock tips you said give me your money i'll invest it for you i did say. give you good stock advice <laughs> i did uh you you did i guess yeah yeah you you, you gave me lots of good stock tips i, I should have believed you i, I uh what did i tell uh, you what did i tell you everything on zoom <laughs> <laughs> Do everything on the portable digital device that Microsoft is coming out with. It's going to change the world. What did I do? No, seriously, what did I tell you? Uh, again, we're looking at 20 years ago. I, you thank you're, you're the only person I, who thanked me. You're assuming I paid attention. No, no, you did. You, you're what, the only person who ever called me up and thanked me. Oh. Oh, my gosh. Well, I can't. Re I can't. Re oh, uh, was it index funds? Yes. 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 Absolutely true. Yes. And a that was actually backed up by the John Bogle book. The guy who created Vanguard said, don't gamble on any individual stocks, put it in an index fund. It goes up and down and so on. And you've heard, you've said that many, many times. I, I'll give you that one. This I, was like I, 25 I, years ago. I would come into your office, true. not feeling funny, insecure. Not feeling <laughs> and, I, and, and you were and I was your seen. I, I was the senior employee. You were the senior employee, and yes, and I um, and I needed to feel I could dominate you, so I gave you financial advice. You, you gave me exactly, and then and you would sometimes you would I would be writing in my office, and I'd hear the door handle, and then you and Leah Krinsky would just peek in <laughs> and just stare at me, and then cl close it. It's, these are alpha moves of intimidation, <laughs> but I'm still. Where's Dr. Hershen? There were no laws in that writing room. This was a no, lawless writing room. It was a lawless writing room. But it was actually, I, I thought the, 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 the horrible discourse was at a high level. Is it possible? <laughs> right. like, some of the jokes were terrible, but but very high quality terrible. Right. So. right. Um, um, anyway, I have very happy memories of. Uh, so let's look at your uh, your failure. Let's look at oh, my phase of okay. failure. You know, it's funny. I I wrote a song about you. Have you heard the song I wrote about your show? No. OK, I wrote a song and I thought and I actually sent you a copy, but you never played it or heard it because and I think it's because you're afraid of being brought down low. Yes, I don't. I, I can't. Yes, that, that I'm the out in this relationship. I have to be you have to be the alpha. The alpha. Yeah. Right. Well, when you get the confidence to hear me sing a song about your show, I'm ready. Okay. In the meantime, we'll let's go to the comic. But you cartoon. know my personality. I I can 
dish it out, but I yes, exactly like the classic bully. Yes, who when confronted gets right. freaks out and and overcome. Yeah, right. exactly. And exactly. if you know something I don't know, that I feel less than. <laughs> so let's enjoy your failure, please. Oh, Emmy, this failure. is Jose Arroyo. Okay. A, 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 the following, <laughs> the following uh, drawings were rejected by the august and historic New York. But now describe uh, the, the picture because we're on of course. a podcast. Of course. So, so what we're looking at now is it was Mother's Day recently. So this is a one that I, uh, I actually posted on Instagram. It's uh, uh, it was related to Mother's Day. It's two Vikings in a long ship. They're heading toward a unsuspecting village. They're rowing toward it. And one Viking is turning to the other and saying, what are you pillaging for mom? <laughs> There's that one. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. Sure. I, I, to do the reveal for our virtual studio audience here in Zoom. Yes. Why don't you start like just lift it up and like this? And well, like bring it up pop. like this so that the, by the time you're done describing it, we can see the caption. So start. Oh, I see. OK, so so bring it up like this. Yes. Yeah, so then... start. Hang on for one second. So lower the whole thing. Lower it right, and now start bringing it up. OK. And as you're describing it, then when I you see. get. To, yeah, I that will be a good reveal. That. Sounds uh, good. All right. I love alpha dogging you. That was good. I, I loved alpha dogging. Yes, you. That was really. That was Thank so you. Much. That was a classic example of that. Yes. Um, OK. More failure. So more why, failure. But, uh, more more of your failure. More failure. These are two slugs, garden slugs. They're just sad and they're ugly and they're looking at each other. And one says, I looked it up. We're not considered a delicacy anywhere. <laughs> okay. You don't have to laugh. I love that. I looked it up. We're not considered a delicacy anywhere. You would think okay. the French would. Ah, ah, your words, not mine. Yes. But some somebody would have batter fried these by now. Right. And it's and it's just I, I looked I couldn't find anybody who eats slugs. If right. uh, your audience can correct me. That's the one behind that. Well, a um, couple of Russian soldiers in Ukraine are eating some slugs. If you know oh, what I mean. there we go. Mm -hmm. yeah, 50 caliber slugs. <laughs> USA, USA, <laughs> USA. All right, more Jose failure. This is great. Okay. I love these, these are, are all these are, the, these are all fail failures on failed, his part. These, the New Yorker looked at them, turned up <laughs> its snooty nose and said, pass. This is Jose's okay, so pain. One. Let's enjoy Jose's pain. Go ahead. So here's uh, two two goldfish. This was an easy one to draw because I was in a hurry and I was trying to get that quota, you know, an, an, a limit, a number. Uh, so I decided, oh, quick, two goldfish talking. One is upset, the other's behind, and it's saying it's been twelve seconds and you're still angry. <laughs> Again, take. That's brilliant. I mean, short term, but they don't have memories exactly. that last. They have no memories. How exactly. could you not? You're a failure. How could they not love that? <laughs> I agree. I'm a complete How could they not utter, get that? This is a travesty. I don't know. Maybe here's my suspicion is that maybe someone else had one that was similar or uh, they're like, oh, no, because, you know, two people may have the same idea. Or it's, maybe, maybe it's offensive to readers with short term memory loss. But, but they would forget it. You're exactly right. Exactly. But maybe they so have a goldfish who can't remember anything past uh, three exactly. seconds and they're offended. This is so much fun enjoying your failure. Right. Please well, continue. More, <laughs> if you'd like that. <laughs> All right, here's a, here's a kind of a horrible machine that's destroying uh, buildings and uh, two scientists are running for their lives. And the caption is, we got so caught up in, can we make an unstoppable killing machine? We never asked, should we make us an unstoppable <laughs> killing machine? Wait a second. Unstoppable killing machine. Wait a Why second. Why would you even make them? Wait a second. How could they reject that? That's... Again, I, I'll, okay, a full disclosure. How could they there's reject a brilliant, that? There's a, there's a brilliant cartoonist named Paul Noth and I, in the back of my head, the little marble was going, did Paul Noth do something about we got so caught up that we forgot this thing? And I don't know if it was Unstoppable Killing Machine, but he may have used that comedy sort of phrasing. We got so caught up, we never thought of doing this. 
which I think comes from like a, you know Jurassic Park or something. Right. Um, that that maybe it was too similar to that. This is so, the guy, I, Mr. Big from Sex no, and the no, City. That's, Paul, <laughs> that's Chris Noth. That's Chris Noth. Paul Noth is a cartoonist. <laughs> it's very very funny. Um, okay, okay, this is so, great. Let's enjoy your pain. One, this is this makes pain. me so happy because these are really funny, uh, <laughs> and he's in pain. So right, would you I'm like not, to, I'm uh, not threatened. Would you like to try? This is would crazy. you like to try to caption one of the drawings that I made no, and see no, what your caption no, was? No, no, okay. no. I just All want right. to enjoy your failure, your rejection. <laughs> There's plenty. I don't want. There's plenty. I don't want to uh, reveal how unfunny I am. Go ahead. All right. Well, here's a cutesy one. It's three. It's uh, coyotes looking up at the moon, and one has got his mouth talking, and he's just saying, "Let's take it from a <laughs> I'm so happy they rejected uh, that. There's I, no I justice. I thought it was silly. And, and sort of cute. this, this explains uh, this. Hang on no. for one second. This explains so much. There's no justice in the world that they would. Re <laughs> this, well, isn't that what got us into comedy? Like, didn't you told me years ago on on uh, on uh, Dennis Miller's show that we get paid something like we get paid for the amount of stuff they reject from us because you would write a ton of stuff for Dennis for a specific show. And what would you say? 80% was all of it was rejected. All of it. All but two or three lines, right. one or two paragraphs in the rant, a couple of photos. Yeah. This is why, you know, there are giant writing staff so that everybody can pick up the slack, but nobody gets right. you know, all of the stuff in. In fact, it was a legend that Leah Krinsky once wrote almost the entire Dennis Miller rant, but it was, an outlier in how brilliant she was in that particular one. And it's usually a team effort and always a lot of stuff on the cutting room floor. Um, right. I don't write for the show. I write for the rejection. I write for, <laughs> I write to go home and go. Well, I hope so. Well, you better <laughs> give your record. Oh, my gosh. Oh. All right. More, more rejection, more failure. Uh, more failure. OK, so you go by these cliches. Of course, there's the guy who climbs to the top of the mountain to, to talk to a guru. And I thought I thought this one actually might work either for The New Yorker or for The Wall Street Journal. But it is a man addressing a guru. He's just climbed up and you can see. And the guru is saying, you're going to hate me, but the answer is more money. <laughs> You know what? You should send that to Dennis. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I, I watched. I, I hope he he's did, doing he well. did a trip, I think, to Nepal, and uh, his wife made him climb. They did. He he of all people did that journey and amazing. spoke to some guy in a. He, he sought enlightenment. Oh my god! He would love. You should send him that. <laughs> I would be happy to. I'd be happy to. Um, this one, I think. Uh, Maybe a lot of women uh, in your audience would enjoy. It's a woman looking through a microscope and she's saying, you lied about your height. <laughs> I like that. I'll tell you why I love that. It's imprecise. <laughs> there, there, there are many. I, you, you see, you're so smart you save that for last because this yes, is one we can talk about that's the one we can talk about now you have How more do you, say, do you have more when you say it's imprecise well i don't think anything's going to top that one so no no no, no. I, I want more uh, you want a, you want the residue you want the, you want the part of the coffee at the bottom where it's all muddy right you right. want the really rejected one Let, let's keep going but I, I, that oh, one boy. is but that would right, be the one this. i would want but go ahead i I, th I thought it was pretty good, but again, uh, other other people didn't. Um, these are more conceptual. Um, this is two devils. One's about to poke a human into a lake of fire, and he's kind of looking happy, and he goes, it beats the banality of good. <laughs> wow. But you have to know that Hannah Philosophy, the banality of evil. You should send that like, to Mark Breslin. 
would love that. That is so mm. brilliant. Mm. Uh, yeah, you have to know the banality of evil. But yes, exactly. But exactly. Uh, have you tried sending that to like, uh, well, the New Yorker should that should they should love that. It's again, we, we you know, that's they're, so they're, good. They're the, the cartoons they pick. You they are pick so for great. their own reasons. You are so, so great at this. You oh, are. Please. You really. You, you know. You you really are. And and what again? The fact that this stuff has been rejected, it it just reminds me that. The universe, it, David, it bends the the towards world. injustice. The universe but bends I, towards I, injustice. It's no, I, I would say any writer or any comedian or any person listening to this, please know that it's a numbers game, that it's that you have to write, uh, you know, 90 and then maybe they, re, they accept one or two. It's it's just the way it is. No, and no, I, no. It's so it's it, <laughs> I don't get me started on waste. There's so much waste in our society that that you have people at the top who are paid not just to you know spew carbon into the air and waste, yeah. but they waste people's ideas. There's so much stuff that just gets wasted, and people there's certain people who delight in wasting other people's time and talent. More this stuff is you know in all seriousness, this stuff should not be rejected. This is this is well there's. But I'm happy. I, I'm happy it was I, rejected. I'm happy with them. I'm not. I'm not rejected. I'm proud of. Ah, you're I a loser. To <laughs> <drop in. It's laughs> you're a loser. Come on. <laughs> no, I mean, there, there. It's you should be very angry and you know what, <laughs> yeah. filled with. What, what? 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 Good would it do? It, it would was, make me happy to see you I'm angry right. and I'm depressed. <laughs> I love this. I love uh, this. This is great. And do you have any more? Because they're potato chips. They're, one more. The last one. The last one is uh, is just uh, people in a in a huge amphitheater, and they're all looking back at a megaphone. Wow. Uh, they're in a stu- stadium. Right. In a stadium, and the megaphone is blaring something. They're all looking back at it, and the stadium megaphone is saying, "Statistically speaking, two of you are murderers." <laughs> Again, we're just the numbers game. But wow, that is that, again the numbers game. Yes, uh, yes, I agree. By the way, that what we could say is a lot of quality is set aside, but for other, usually for other quality, and that's where somebody's judgment comes into play. Oh, uh, they're both funny, but I prefer this one. You know, it's it's almost like deciding. Um, Colors or or songs or something. Well, which? Right. How do you rank things that you know, there are millions of really good ones? Why is this one necessarily better than another one? Um, right. So anyway, I, I just I you have to. Now, how how long that. does it take you to turn out that many? Or do you do a cartoon Most, a day? That's that compilation there was over months. I took out of you know a bunch of the so the ones that that weren't topical or would resonate maybe with your listeners a little more. Um, but uh, it, that's, yeah, it, it takes me a long time. I'm very, very slow drawer. The fact that I, it took me years to do that comic book that. Uh, uh, yes. Let's plug LA. it. Where, where is it? Oh, uh, here it is. This is uh, treating the Oedipal complex by Jose. Arroyo. <laughs> it's a brilliantly funny <laughs> cartoon. It's a little late for Mother's Day, but. <laughs> Where is your book? I have it somewhere oh, on my it's desk. It's fine. It's fine. I, 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 Where is it? Sure. Yeah. What, what is the name of your book? One oh, Day in L.A., somewhere, right? Somewhere in L.A. Somewhere, somewhere in L.A. And uh, you left the shot. Oh, there you are. Somewhere in L.A., a and it's a day hour. in the life of Los it's Angeles. Kind of a day in the life of the lo- of the of Los Angeles. So every, and it's a great gift. Every day is something like. Uh, 3.29 in the morning. I think we've talked about this one already. Somewhere in L.A., a waitress inches out of the bed of one of the stars of The Expendables. <laughs> just getting, just sneaking out. Now, back again, before pandemic, The Expendables, with which was a franchise with Sylvester Stallone and a lot of aging uh, action stars, was going to they were going to make a third one and so i thought oh let me get ahead of this i know this movie's right. coming out right. and of course it never did so that one feels a because little because of covid 
on the day because of COVID. You've exactly. really paid a price. For, when I think of all the people who have suffered from COVID. <laughs> you're, you're, right, I'm not saying that I. <laughs> no, it's unfair. No, it's you're un right. You're right. It's unfair that they that COVID did this. Comparing my suffering to anyone else. No, I think. No, no, I think we're up coming up on a million who died from COVID. Yes, <laughs> a million and yeah, one. I, I will say it's a yeah. million and one. <laughs> <With that. laughs> we uh, can you we do? Me, you put my. You put me in my place. Thank you. Let, let's uh, let's plug your book. Uh, how do people oh, this buy is, this? So this is uh, still available on uh, uh, another billionaire site. Um, I, you know, I stopped. I stopped tweeting after after Elon Musk bought Twitter. But I think I don't have the courage of my convictions to leave Twitter. Right. But I'm confessing to your viewer, to your listeners, that um, I'm just dragging my feet about posting on there because I, I just think. Instagram is another billionaire. Twitter is this billionaire. This is available on Amazon, another billionaire. It's like, I feel like, do I have to give money to a billionaire? Is that is right. that required now to have some kind of social well, life? Or we, ha we have, I, we have, <clears throat> we have the Reverend Barry W. Lynn coming up. Oh, maybe he can give you special dispensation. Let me see. The Reverend Barry <laughs> W. Lynn. Do you know the Reverend? I, I heard him in the in past. Yes. 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 He's. Uh, I'm on muting. You're on muting. Can I you do for you, Reverend Lynn? I, I was yes. just wondering if there's a way around staying, uh, staying sort of in in the public light yep. and not having to fund one of three or four millionaires, whether it's uh, you know an Apple uh, or or Amazon or Twitter or Facebook. Can we avoid? Well, billionaires and still engage in our society. You could rob their homes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't recommend it, but it would. Uh, it's one of the I, things I, that could happen. No, all right. I, um, <laughs> wow, Reverend. That was the same, the same dilemma, though. You know, I have this this book that I hope is coming out in a few months. And because this is my main source of uh, connection to the world, um, I have to I think I have to sell it on Amazon, but it creates a big moral dilemma for me. And so so for you, the dilemma is there's other there may be other ways to distribute your book, but none as as immediate um, as, as fast to send a link to your to your people. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's absolutely I, right. I think that's... But it's, um, I too have tried to get off Twitter and I announced on this show a couple of weeks ago, I'm leaving Twitter. I don't care if the deal goes through or doesn't go through. We knew that he was going to be a terrible person. Um, but it's very difficult to actually get off Twitter. Have you it tried is. to literally get off Twitter? They have directions, you know, the old 16 steps you're supposed oh, right. to take. <laughs> right. yes. You know, and, I can't. I don't do any of those steps, so I don't know what to do. For me I, on Twitter, you know, yeah. For me on Twitter, it, giving up Twitter for, for me is like giving up show business. It's you already done it, huh? You've already done it. It, it, it did it for me. Twitter and show you, business. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> why even? Why even go through the motions? <laughs> are, are you there, Reverend? Let's see. Do you have a lower? I'm third? here. Lower thirds have failed me tonight. Everybody was supposed to get a lower third. You know, the shows have been so great because I have a lot of people helping and I want to thank the, yep. the people who are helping. They are Grace Jackson, Sarah Bush, Hannah Feldman, Dan Frankenberger, Andy Brown, Professor Jonathan Bick, uh, Joe in Norway and the Invisible Ninja. They've been helping, and so I feel like I owe it to them and the listeners to make the sound and the visuals look better. And it's not, uh, I'm not getting what, what I... What, what is a lower third? I don't even know what that means. That's the level of hell. Where I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, Dan, the quiz master. There he is. We're waiting for your guest to arrive. You have, a, guess. you have a guess. Yes, don't we you? are. Yes, so we do. We have scheduled the quiz master, Dan, for a quiz. <laughs> and 
now is when I humiliate the two of you, where I, I will I will win. Be, I know all the answers to whatever he asks because he shows me the questions an hour before the show starts. No, he doesn't. <laughs> Hello? So uh, let's put some money in the kitty. Boy, I really enjoyed Jose's cartoons. They, they were just they, perfect. They are fabulous. Are you, are you going to play in the fabulous. game? Jose, do you want to stick around? Uh, I'm, I'm happy I'm happy to play. I just don't yeah. want to take up the Reverend's time. The, the Reverend oh, Barry W. Yeah. Lynn is joining us. We're waiting yeah. for his guest. The Reverend is a uh, a lawyer, a member of the Supreme Court Bar, <laughs> and he, for nearly a quarter of a century, ran Americans United for separation of church and state. Besides being an attorney, he's also an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. By the way, it's been two years since I did the joke. I know. And I get, I think, in, I wanted to do it for Jose. <laughs> Go ahead and do the joke. He's an. I used to do this. This was his introduction every every day. And he's Go an ordained. He's an ordained minister <laughs> in the United Church of. I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> I did it every introduction, it. Every and day. finally it. it uh, but, that's uh, good. I hope I'm pronouncing <laughs> this yeah. Christ. <laughs> People are begging for it. Dan Frankenberger. Nothing gets done here without Dan Frank. What are you going to be quizzing us on today? So tonight we have a five question quiz. And, why isn't uh, that? Why is everybody sound good tonight? I don't know. I don't know. We're off I brand. A, <laughs> I got I lost my laryngitis. Oh, OK. So I had that for two weeks. It was a bummer. I had laryngitis, which was tough because I talk out of my ass. I don't know what that I'm, meant. <laughs> I have I no either. idea what that means. No. It's a but, coffee enema thing. It's yeah. okay. All right. Um, so tonight we have a television's longest running game show is hitting the road and going all around the U.S. on a tour where they, uh, they're they going to stop at 50 cities across the country to celebrate its 50 straight years of being on the air. Meet the so press? Quiz. Meet the press. <laughs> <laughs> tonight, tonight's quiz is on The Price is Right. Oh, the price is right. Five questions. And Capitalism at its best. You've put money in the kitty. Yeah. Aww. By the way, it's kind of unfair. I'm going to kick everybody's ass on this. I don't want to go into reasons why, but I can assure you I'm going to win this. Did you pick this especially for me? No, there's no way I can't. Answer. I'm going to get everything right. Go ahead. All right. We have five questions. Um, who goes Nick first? My, uh, Reverend Barry is going to go first. Okay, I'm um, winning. It's th I, I've do. got three points. I'm already winning. Whoa, uh, Reverend, what? Wait a minute. What? Remind me of the rules. This is this is a game show I haven't watched since I was seven years old. Well, we're, it's a multiple choice. Okay, Please, that's all. And you're going to lose. Team. You're going to lose, first. Reverend. You lost. <laughs> you lost Roe v. Wade. <laughs> Yeah, you you you've lost a lot of things as as a a lawyer and as a minister and once but again, none as important <laughs> as, as this, 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 right? Is that what you were going to say? Yeah, because tonight it's your dignity. This is it. Right, right. You lose what's left of your dignity. Okay. Question number one: Immediately before Drew Carey took his job, who was the host of The Price Is Right? Was it Pat Sajak? Bob Barker, Alex Trebek, or Plink Cohen? <laughs> Bob, Reverend Barry, you're first. Bob Barker. Jose. Alex Trebek. You, you don't know the answer to that question? I don't know the answer to that question. You don't know don't that it's Bob Barker? I did not. I figured that Bob Barker retired and then they threw someone in there before they gave it to Drew. You that worked in the Bob Barker studio at CBS for Absolutely. We would tr pass the wheel and the Plinko when we went up to the studio. Yes. But I didn't realize that. They, I thought there may have been a gap between. Okay. Well, Dan, help us out. Well, there, Actually, I, these, David's I'm, clearly saying Bob it's, Barker. It's, it's Bob, Bob Barker. Barker. Of course. The answer is Bob Barker. <laughs> So, 
no <laughs> let, let me just check the scores. I'm so excited to win something. Uh, I never win it. I, I tried to get the five thousand dollars a week from Publishers Clearing House <laughs> I, uh, for eight years, and I never won ten cents. Okay. So thank you. Let's I'm go. On a roll now. Go let's ahead. Go, let's go the over the score. Question. I have three points. The Reverend has one, and Jose has zero. Just watch it. Yeah. I have three points. Who's up next? Question number two. Uh, Jose is first this time. Okay. Uh, in the popular cliffhanger game, how many steps can the mountain climber take before he falls off the edge of the cliff? Is it 25, 15, 10, or 12 steps? I'm going to say 10. Dave is next. I have no idea. Oh, I know a funny story about the cliffhanger, though. I, I, I remember they go, yodel, 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 yodel. Yeah, I remember that. But there was also uh, when Dennis James was hosting The Price is Right, one of the models had a husband or a boyfriend who died in a mountain climbing accident. And he didn't know that. And he used to call that guy by the name of the model's dead boyfriend. And one of the many lawsuits that stemmed out of <laughs> poor Dennis oh, James. <laughs> uh, like the model would cry every time. I don't know. What, what, what are the choices? Uh, was it 25, 15, 10, or 12? I'm going to disagree with Jose just to win. Absolutely. What is your number? You can't just disagree. Can't disagree. There's, there's three other choices. No, it's yeah. to agree or disagree. No, 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 no. You have to no what the kind of rules? <laughs> See, this you have to pick one. You got to pick, pick a number. The rules. Just pick a number. This is not that difficult. Pick a number. Oh my please. God! For a man pick of a number. For a man of Christ, why are you going all revelations on me? Uh, that's revelation, by the way. I've told you this before. I had to tell Stephen Colbert when, you know, when he was doing those uh, interviews with people before he got his own show. And we were doing an interview about the Ten Commandments monument down in Alabama. And he mentioned the book of Revelations. And I said, Stephen, it's the book of Revelation. It's the revelation of St. John. Now, they cut that because it wasn't even funny, but. Right, let me rephrase but I wanted, it. But I felt like I had to correct people, including Stephen Colbert. For a man of no. Christ, you're going all Old Testament on me. Did I get that right, do, at least? Yes, yeah, you did. Okay. But do I get my guess now? What's the question? It's the same question. Oh, are what you, what game climber are you playing? How many steps, yes, how many steps on the mountain climber thing? So I guess 10. Yeah. Dan, what were the other choices? The, the possible answers were 25, 10, 15, and 12. David? 12. As an alcoholic, I'll say 12. Or oh, it's the 10 step. Pro is it a 10 step program? No. We're no. 12 steps. No. no. Two of the steps it's I never just, did. So, just, how many commandments are there? There are 12 commandments. I'll go with 12. Yeah. 25 steps. Huh? The answer is 25. So the reverend the takes one step for each dollar. The contestant misses the price of an item. So if uh, if there's a blender that was 25 bucks and the item is 30, the mountain climber takes five steps. So okay. you have to keep that to a minimum. So and that's two yodels on the way. Mm -hmm. that, that's right. Two points for the reverend, zero for Jose and 100 points for me, if I'm adding yeah. it up properly. I have one point. I have one that point. Is <laughs> Question number three. I'm David is first this time. Okay. There's Who no was, way I can get this wrong. There's, Who uh, was the first announcer of The Price is Right? Johnny Olson. Was it Johnny Olson, Rod Roddy, George Gray, or Hulk Hogan? Johnny Olson. Reverend Barry. It's Johnny Olson. It's Rod Roddy. You don't want to win. Well, you guys said Johnny Olson, and so I look how like, quickly I no. answered it. If I knew, if I was that confident, jeez, 
You're yeah, absolutely I, right. Okay. okay. Jesus, no wonder you got all those cartoons rejected. <laughs> <laughs> the correct answer is Johnny Olson. I was Johnny Olson. So everybody gets the point. Google wait, wait, Rod. Wait, by the way, wait, read wait, about wait, Rod. Wait, wait. Jose didn't say 20. I said Rod Roddy. Not everybody. No, Rod Roddy. This is, yeah. Yeah, I'm still. So at he doesn't zero. get a point. Oh, okay. he's at zero. Still at zero, and and you now guys. Now we have are... the utmost respect for people who no, are I, zeros. I, my field. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, so Google so Google the our, on read about Rod Rowdy in the uh, National Enquirer. David Weiss was obsessed with Rod Rowdy. Oh. And okay. Uh, Rod I have Rowdy. A little, a little like background a... on Johnny Olson. I have uh, Johnny Olson was the first announcer on The Price is Right. He was the announcer from the show's premiere on uh, September 4th, 1972, until his passing in 1985. He never missed an episode. Incredible. After his oh. death, auditions were held to replace him, and it was eventually decided that the replacement would be Rod Roddy. Right. So from 72 to 85, never missed one. That's pretty How many years straight? The show didn't start until Rod Roddy got it. That's just right. That's, that's a lot of people believe that. 72 to 85. So 72 to 13. 85. Wow. Wow. Question number four. So we're back to uh, Reverend Barry being first. Okay. Which and, and your guest isn't here, by the way. So I don't, I do not know how to reach him. I could attempt to call him, but now we're in no, the middle of the game. You're not your game. brother's keeper, Reverend. You're not yeah, your brother's but, keeper. But, I don't have anything to say. If my guest isn't here. I don't have anything to say. No, stop it all hasn't this stopped foolishness. Us for four hours. I no, think we should be all right. Okay, what? What is the question? question number four? Yes. Which cause is Bob Barker passionate about? Is it environmental protection, the Make a Wish Foundation, animal rights, or the foundation of American coffee enemas? <laughs> animal rights. He's a very strong supporter of animal rights. That, oh, that's my guess as well. Animal and, rights. And I, and I, he would end every show. I did a switch. On. I say, don't forget to spay and neuter your children. He would just say, <laughs> don't forget to spay and neuter your pets, which everybody should do. So animal rights, same thing. The yeah. correct answer is animal rights. Okay. <laughs> Four points for the reverend one point for jose and three for david and you should spay and neuter your uh, your animals including your kids <laughs> last question question number five jose is uh going first this time the catchphrase on the price is right when an audience audience member is chosen to play is come on blank is it come on up come on down Come on, let's go, or come on these. In front of you, did, <laughs> come on. welcome. Well, the just one? as the just as the rev, uh, the other reverend, uh, reverend. is showing up, yeah, and, and exactly, we're trying to. Okay, <laughs> we have two reverends someone here. On the, someone on the commentary was saying, "Come on, these nuts," right, which I don't think is correct. No. I believe it's "Come on down." That's my guess. David is next. Oh, okay. I'm going to say, come on down. Dave is next. Uh, come on, Eileen. The song. <laughs> Dexy Midnight Runner. It's, it's, it's come on up. Come on up. No, it's come on down. I don't But know. it should be come on up. You're actually right. They do climb stairs, right? Yeah. Come on down. Dan, what is the answer? You know, it's come on down, but it should be come on up. We should write a letter to Drew Carey. <laughs> The correct answer is, come on down. All right, great. That's great. That's great. Okay, so the Reverend, oh, you got that wrong, Reverend. Yeah, I did. And Jose, did be... you get it right or wrong? I think I got that one right. So you have, okay. Right. And I got, uh, I, I think we, we, we have, okay. I don't so... want to get everything right. I don't want to be prideful. That exactly. is not a good Christian virtue. And I think Reverend Schenck and I would agree on that. Okay. Yeah. I I choose to be prideful. I have no choice. I have an embarrassment of things to be proud of. 
<laughs> I wish I could be as humble as you, Reverend Barry W. Lynn, but I mean, look at yep. my CV. I mean, it's just, well, here are the final score. We have a tie. The yeah. Reverend has four points. I have four points. Jose only has two points. So uh, you lost again, Jose Arroyo. Thank you for playing our <laughs> I'll take my New Yorker cartoons and my quiz. I think you might enjoy this next segment if you want to. If you want. I, I will. I'm going to uh, take the video off and enjoy it. I will. Right. I was gonna, that was my other request that you turn your video off. <laughs> <laughs> Jose Arroyo, let's plug your book. It was a pleasure. Show, show your show. book. Thank you, David. Show your book. Show your book. <laughs> Oh, uh, the book is uh, Somewhere in L.A., A Book of Hours, 24 uh, images, one for each hour of a day in Los Angeles. Uh, enjoy hey, it. Bye-bye, here, everyone. Here's Thank the Feldman you. the Feldman guarantee. Buy the book <laughs> right now. We, we got special dispensation from the Reverend. You go to Amazon, buy the book, and if you don't love this book, I will reimburse you. Tell me you didn't like it. I'll reimburse you. Buy 10 copies of that book and give it to a library or people you love. The, the book is so much fun to read. Dan Frankenberger, thank you so much. Yep. Thanks, Jose. Thanks, Reverend. And you thank and I you. need to, you, we need, Dan and I need to talk. Well, Reverend Bob Schenk has a lower third. Bob Schenk. Well, yes, he Bob, is. As I'm otherwise known. <laughs> yes. And uh, the Reverend Barry W. Lynn doesn't have a lower third. I'm going to stick around for a few minutes and then the Reverend Barry W. Lynn will take it from there. All right. Sounds let me good. let me tell you a story about Rob. Uh, Rob and I used to disagree about almost everything. And when you go to Washington and you try to promote a cause or yourself or your institution, it's really good to have a public relations department. And when I worked for the United Church of Christ, they had somebody up in New York who never really understood anything about what I was doing. Even the ACLU pretty much do your own Washington based press. Don't depend on the people in New York. When I went to Americans United for separation of church and state and stayed there for 25 years, I had an excellent communications team. And every time I would go to the United States Supreme Court for some big case involving women's rights or the LBTQ community or separation of church and state, I was always highly impressed with what Rob Shank was doing because he would wear a collar on behalf of, I believe it was called the National Clergy Council. And he would always have a prop, a cross, a podium that you might see uh, at the uh, in a church. And he would always get enormous attention. People would come to him, the press would flock to him and they would show his picture and they would get his really wonderful, although at the time, 100% wrong statements about whatever the court was deciding. So Rob, am I misstating this or what would have happened say 20 years ago if there was an LGBT case before the United States Supreme Court and you went to the court to explain your position? Am I wrong or were you just really, you were really good at this? Well, thank you for the sort of um, backhanded compliment. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Um, Barry, you know, you were my nemesis. And frankly, I was a secret admirer of yours. A secret um, admirer. I was. I was. I, I thought you were always reasonable. You were sober at least every time i saw you you were sober in mind and blood chemistry mm -hmm. uh, and always very well spoken on your opinion um and i've got some confessions to make uh tonight Maybe okay I'll before you do that let, 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 so as i understand this the reverend bob shank author of costly grace you have a book you and the Reverend Barry W. Lynn were on opposing sides Completely. Of, of the the social issues facing the Supreme Court. And Diametric opposite. Diametrically. So if the Reverend Barry W. Lynn was in favor of abortion, you would be 
uh, completely contrary to that. I was for. Right. If you were. So if the Reverend Barry W. Lynn was for uh, same sex marriage, you would be opposed to say. Yes, yeah, not necessarily because he was for <laughs> what I'm against, but uh, I didn't mind kind of I playing that role to, you know, to its max. OK. And so you would argue and appear on Crossfire and you were. Yep. OK. Yep. Great. That, that, did a so, lot of those. OK. You know what? This is fast. I'm going to disappear because I want to hear this. This is fascinating. Yeah, oh, Rob, yeah. so no, he's he's waiting in the wings. But um, the big changes started to come as I understood the trajectory of your life, not over abortion, gay rights, separation of church and state, but over guns. When you met Abigail Disney, a philanthropist, and she, what did she ask you? Yeah, she asked me point blank, pun intended. Um, how can you be pro-life and pro-gun? And she was referring to my evangelical community. I'm an evangelical minister and white evangelicals in the United States are one of the uh, one of the subgroups in, in the American population to embrace gun rights uh, as unfettered yep. Second Amendment without any restrictions, any limitations. And they are also uh, one of the groups most likely to either own lethal firearms or have access, immediate access to them. So that was a surprise to me when she announced that. Of course, I saw guns in a sure. lot of places, including churches in those days. But it, it, it surprised me. And she dared me to take on the question why that was true. It took me a while to say yes, because as I tested the question in my own community, I learned that I was putting my career, uh, my my calling as a minister at risk uh, because I was, uh, you know, uh, I, I would be ostracized if I took an opposite position to the sure. communities, I would be banned and banished and uh and eventually i was but that was that was the question that started pulling at the thread and and she made a documentary about you and the gun rights claims and people can still get that see, see that yes it's an emmy award-winning yeah. uh, feature-length documentary called the armor of light it's really not entirely my story it's also lucy mcbath's story mm -hmm. Uh, who is in Congress now. But when I met her, she was a flight attendant who had lost her son to an obscene act of gun violence. Her 17 year old boy uh, who was playing his music a bit too loud. Uh, he being African-American, uh, he was with four other black teenage uh, males in a car. They were all playing their music and enjoying it when a white a uh, contractor of some sort, I, I guess he was a building contractor, drove up, uh, told them to turn the music down. They said, why don't you roll your window up? And with that, uh, he let loose a volley of um, nine millimeter bullets into the car that killed uh, young Jordan Davis uh, and took Lucy's only child from her. And that was that was uh, life altering to meet her. And by the way, she identified as an evangelical, Bible believing, born again, spirit filled Christian. You know what all these of terms course. mean. A lot of people don't, but let's just say she was just like me, except she was black yeah. and a woman. And two, two distinctions. Um, and she had her head maybe, on straight about things that I didn't. <laughs> um, there are people who quote the Bible to justify, in fact, there was a, a church in Pennsylvania a couple of years ago that had a dual service one Saturday, a reaffirmation of your marriage vows and a blessing of your AR-15 assault rifles. 
And when asked, what's the Bible say about it? They quoted from the book of Revelation. We had a little discussion of Revelation earlier. The rod of iron, that one phrase justified in the minds of these, I don't, fundamentalist, which you are not, a fundamentalist Christian church, justified possession of one of the most deadly weapons you can find in this country. Was it also also something you notice within the so-called abortion, the anti-abortion movement? Were there people there lining up, carrying weapons and What did you think of that at the time, even before you were a part of this documentary? What were they like? What were there guns in the possession of people who wanted to shoot abortion providers if it came to that? Well, I didn't think I knew any. Um, We knew they existed for sure. And, and, uh, you know, the folks... Uh, joining tonight may already know that I had a prominent position in the national anti-abortion movement. Um, It would fly under different flags. The one that was specific to me was Western New York Rescue, a part of the National Rescue Operation Rescue Network. And um, I didn't think I knew anyone like that. But then oddly, over time, some of the male leaders, uh, and there were plenty of women in the early days of that movement, but they gradually disappeared. They were muscled out uh, by the male leadership. And and some of those uh, male leaders started showing up first with empty holsters on their belts because they were worried that they were going to be arrested uh, and charged with something related. So they would just have the empty holster as a show of, you know, machismo. Sure. Or something uh, pretending to be that. And uh, then I heard talk that some of them had weapons in their cars, uh, glove compartments behind the back seat of their now red pickup truck. And it it was a, it was a, um, a transformation that took place over about a 10 year period until finally, yes, some of them told me that they would never be separated from uh, their firearm. And it was always with them. Now, none of them committed, the ones I'm talking about did not commit any blatant acts of gun violence against anyone, but there were of course shooters in our movement. And that was, disorienting to me, but not enough that I didn't learn how to compartmentalize it, put that box sure. on a shelf and say, I'll, I'll come back and visit that at another time. When you talk about compartmentalizing things, but well, one thing that you never compartmentalize is the fact that you do identify and still identify as an evangelical Christian. I do. And when it comes to the f- the problem with many of the people in that movement, including Randall Terry, who started uh, Operation Rescue that you just mentioned, Falwell, Pat Robertson. I mean, I knew all these people quite well. Yeah, I know you and, uh, uh, but um, they could not stop merging their theological understanding with their political agenda. It was one and the same. And you have gradually been extracting yourself from making that comparison. How difficult is it though, when there is an issue like choice, reproductive choice, to move away from what is a core issue? I mean, I think I I could be wrong, but I think that the most, the so-called members of the religious right, they're more concerned about abortion than they are about guns, maybe a close call. When you start to separate that, What was there one moment when you said, wait a minute, um, I I think I may be wrong about this. Bill Baird, who was my guest last week, had that a a terrible story when he was at Harlem Hospital and found an African-American woman in the halls bleeding all over from her efforts to do an abortion, self-abortion with a coat hanger. Was there anything like that 
when you started to say, wait, I could be really, really wrong. Yes. Yes, I was. Um, Now, I'm going to say that the, 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 the ground, you know, the the hardened ground of my mind was softened uh, already by reading uh, the work of a young, brilliant, dead German pastor named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, who was one of the first uh, Protestant leaders in Germany to stand up against uh, Hitler's uh, racialized uh, dictatorship, would pay for that Uh, with his life uh, when he was hanged by the Nazis at age 39. But he left behind a wonderful body of literature. I know you're very familiar with Bonhoeffer, uh, Barry, and and, uh, and many people are because they encountered him in college reading or whatever. And he dealt with ethics. He was really an ethicist more than he was anything else. He was many things. But he was, uh, in his writings, an ethicist. And so I had started reading him uh, and that was kind of shaking things up and i was realizing that i had separated myself from the reality of people's lives and their suffering i had my cohorts and i had created a fictional world we had developed a a highly complex fantasy and in that fantasy every pregnancy involved a child whom someone wanted desperately that a mother any mother should want and there was plenty of support for anyone in crisis pregnancy there were people ready to pay their medical bills ready to offer them free child care ready to give them a job uh ready to pay their kids college tuition whatever it was it, it was there why would anyone want to to have an abortion when you have all those support systems. But what we had in our heads was a fantasy about, first of all, a young white woman living in a middle to upper middle class community, likely part of a church family where everybody was ready to just marshal whatever was required, including uh, adoption to ensure that that child had everything, well, the mother and child had everything they needed. Mm -hmm. That was not reality. Of course not. And it took a a really jarring experience when I was in Alabama, and you know I was jailed many times for my protest work, pro-life, anti-abortion and otherwise. I was in jail, I was in the Montgomery County Jail, and they threw me in the psychiatric wing which many people found appropriate. I didn't, but they did. (laughs) And it was co-ed. There were men and women uh, on that wing of uh, this really miserable jail. And uh, there was a woman about three doors from my cell who was suffering some form of mental illness. She, but uh, black woman, very poorly clad, very unkempt. Her skin, I remember, was had lesions and infection and she was just screaming and saying i have three babies i have three babies who has my babies who's taking care of my babies who's looking and suddenly barry that was like an intervention that shattered these defensive walls of fantasy that i had built up over years and suddenly i saw This woman was not white. She was not middle class or upper. She didn't have support systems. Nobody cared about her. And nobody in the jail cared whether she had childcare or not. Nobody cared about her. And that was um, that was a real reality check for me. Uh, Unfortunately, it would take years more uh, for that to take effect in my heart and mind. But it would never leave me. When was it that you actually started publicly to say, I was wrong to be a part of this anti-reproductive choice movement? I was wrong. I got it wrong. I I didn't see things. When's the first time you ever said that publicly? Well, I guess it was somewhere around 2012 when 
uh, we were shooting the film The Armor of Light. Hmm. And Abby Disney, uh, who, by the way, I must uh, say, uh, is not, you know, the heiress people think, you know, okay, right. she is a very smart, uh, very engaged successful businesswoman she is a philanthropist world-class philanthropist anyone in the women's rights movement anyone in reproductive rights movement anyone in the arts knows how much she does with her wealth for all those causes and a lot more and she's an award-winning filmmaker so we were doing something somewhere and she just said i, I need to ask you a question and then she told me her own abortion story, which went to her years when she was in college. I think she was 21, 22, something like that. And she said, um, had you been in exactly my frame of mind, in my circumstances, in the situation I was in, uh, in, in my relationship with the man who was, uh, you know, who was my intimate partner, what would you have done? And she said, don't you give me one of your movement slogans. Don't you give me one of your bumper sticker sayings. You tell me what you would have done. And until you can tell me that, I, I don't want to hear anything else. You tell me what you would have done. Now, uh, you know, okay, I'm bearing all with you, Barry, because I trust you. You are my confessor. You are you are a pastoral figure to me now. And so I will just say I was in therapy by then. Yeah. <laughs> I had a therapist yeah. who was really helping me face the truth about myself. And, and so it was the right time to ask me that question. And I sat on it a little bit. And finally, I told Abby. I would have done the same thing you did. I would have yeah. had an abortion. Yeah. Well, to some that may seem like the yeah, no. stupid guy, but for me, it was a tectonic shift in the way I saw the universe, the way I yes. saw God, <laughs> the way I saw me and everyone around me. When you have these seismic changes in personality, when anybody goes through this, um, you still maintain a core that never leaves you. And I think, you know, many of the people who listen to this show are atheists and uh, they, they would say, but how can you possibly maintain your belief in God when you are having these own doubts about your original understanding of the connection between God and some of these issues, not just guns, not just abortion rights, but also gay people, the LGBTQ community, separation of church and state. How can you change so dramatically in so many, we're gonna get into some of these other changes, but how can you do that and still maintain the core belief that you learned in part from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who's Dietrich Bonhoeffer Institute you've created here in Washington, D.C. Well, I wish I had a pithy answer to that. I, 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 I don't, except to say um, I, 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 there was a long period of time when I, when I replaced my core belief in God with a highly politicized being. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I say I had three conversions in my life. The first conversion was from my the nominal Judaism of my youth to born again Christianity. I was 16 years old and it was sincere and it was life changing. Uh, then came another conversion from that the jesus who blessed the poor who cared for the suffering uh who um uh, who, who who blessed peacemakers uh was against conflict and war and i was converted uh to ronald reagan republican religion which i've since learned is distinctly different from christianity and i would spend 35 years in that yep. wandering in that uh, in that desert 
Uh, and there were times when I wasn't sure of the difference between Jesus and Ronald Reagan right, or, or right. someone like him. And it took coming back in a really radical conversion to that first Jesus who challenged me. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, Jesus was the consummate one for others, not for himself, not to justify himself, but for the other. And so I guess it was really a kind of reconversion to a, a renewed or even new faith. That's the best yeah, I can do. Well, with I, I can't and I think pe- people need to understand that when you were in those 30 plus years of being tied very clearly to Republican politicians. I mean, you were their minister. You didn't just uh, send them $10 a month. I mean, you were praying with them. You were ministering to them here in Washington on a regular, regular basis. And you had certainly uh, flirtations with even Jerry Falwell, who's, I, I understand his, uh, his fundraiser was hoping to gain you into the clutches of that money machine that Falwell was creating when when you change these issues do you ever go back to some of these senators for example many of whom are you know, still around and explain this shift to them because they could actually do something about correcting the error of their ways which i guarantee you in almost every case is attributed to their claimed profession for the love of Jesus. Well, one of the things I've resolved these days is to do more truth telling than I did in the past. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so truthfully, I just now 10 years into this new odyssey, uh, I've just now started to reach back here and there. Some of them have reached out to me. Some of them just because they say, I can't believe what, what's going on with you. Did you lose your mind? Did you have some kind of nervous breakdown? What happened to you, Shank? Um, and, and so I give an answer uh, the best way that I can. And I would hope that could be salutary. I, you know, I've also given up on uh, blithe optimism and I've tried right. to be a little more realistic right. about hopefulness. Uh, but I spend much more time with younger, aspiring leaders, both in the church and outside the church, and even in the public sector, to talk about how to avoid this kind of political co-optation that I've seen take possession, almost like a demonic possession. I'm going to get that sure. weird, exactly, uh, because with the Trump. Uh, with Trumpianism, the Trump, what I call the Trump heresy within the evangelical church, it is so inexplicable at times that it does appear almost supernatural. But now I'm getting out in the other <laughs> limits. So I'll, I'll come back. Well, one of the things I want people to understand this, that when you turned your back on the anti-abortion movement, when you started to embrace, and as I understand, even hire at least one member of the LGBT community. And then in the last election cycle, you did the unthinkable. You told people to vote for Joe Biden over Donald Trump. So I would imagine, I'm speculating here, but that's what we do in the media, don't we? Um, that, that, uh, There were people who said, uh, okay, so Rob's, uh, he's changed his mind on this issue, maybe, uh, uh, but surely he wouldn't endorse voting for Joe Biden, but you did it very publicly. You voted for him. You put it on Facebook. You put it up on social media. And then I imagine the blowback got even worse because now you weren't just changing your mind about an issue. You were taking a person who literally is viewed in a godlike manner by so many what I would call evangelical fundamentalists. What did what happened to you then? Yeah, well, I lost a whole bevy of people who whom I, I thought were friends uh, or at least collegially friendly. Um, 
but um, I was called everything except the Antichrist, although I was told that I was cooperating with Satan for the destruction of the gospel and that I was now a certified baby murderer. Um, I had lost my soul. Uh, actually, Barry, I think I probably could have retained some of those people if I had renounced Jesus Christ, but not <laughs> right. Donald right. Trump. Right. The one of the things that, um, just as an aside, a reporter once asked Jerry Falwell if he thought that I was the Antichrist. And he said, no, because the Antichrist must be Jewish. And I don't think Barry is. <laughs> so, just, just a little little tid tidbit. Um, when you, you know, write, my father was Jewish. My mother was <laughs> Christian and converted to Judaism to right? marry my father. So they might have a closer call with me on that one. I don't know. Well, you unfortunately you can't. just add the anti-Semitism to it. Ex exactly, all. exactly. If people go to your website and they look at your blog, these are some of the headlines on recent blog entries. White American evangelicals are the new snake handlers, only more dangerous. How about this one? No apology for comparing Trump to Hitler. Um, I would never... I think once I actually referred to people on, in the conservative evangelical front as snake handlers and my, my, uh, my, my very highly qualified communications people said, don't ever do that again. And I never did that again. But here you are using this language, comparing Trump to Hitler. Why the powerful words? Why not just say, okay, he's a bad guy or Hitler? Well, I believe that, by the way. I believe that if you put a, a list of the most, the four biggest despots in modern history, it is Stalin, it is Hitler, it is Pol Pot, and it is Donald Trump. But that's me. When you say it, it carries a whole different meaning. Well, you know, one is, of course, I'm an evangelical and I'm speaking to my fellow evangelicals. You know, the, the uh, Deutsche Evangelische Kirche, the Evangelical Church of Germany in 1933, declared Adolf Hitler a gift and miracle from God. And that's where I go to is the error is made as much on the side of the worshiper of Trump as in Trump himself. And this, so for me, this is the same egregious error that was made by Protestant evangelicals in Germany in 19, you know, late 1920s up to the 1940s. It's, it's a replay. And uh, yes, the, you know, there's no genocidal machine going or wasn't under Trump or under the MAGA movement right now. But neither was that true of the Nazi movement right. when Hitler first came to power. It was giving Hitler and his minions the right uh, atmosphere, the right uh, authority and, and so forth to commit that uh, those atrocities. So, you know, which Hitler, what phase of Hitler's despicable existence yeah. are we talking about? Mine, I would peg it at 1933. Yeah, there was a group uh, I got involved at the tail end of it. it. They produced a film and a book called Theologians Under Hitler. And it was an effort to, because there'd been a lot of writing about how the Roman Catholic Church had kind of caved in and, and the understanding of a lot of the German people we, we, we lost in World War I. We, want, we don't care who brings us back, but we want to be proud one more time. And a lot of theologians, of course, Protestant theologians did the same thing, as you just pointed out. What I've just got to make a note that Steve Martin, who made that film, Theologians Under Hitler, based on Bob Erickson's, uh, the scholar Bob Erickson's yeah. work, 
is now the secretary of my board. So terrific. Trying terrific. To keep good company. <laughs> it's very good company. It's uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, on the other hand, uh, even if people read him in college or think they've heard of him, they probably think that he unequivocally was involved in that July 20th, 1944 effort to assassinate Hitler. And this was an effort, a failed effort. A bomb had been placed in a briefcase. A briefcase was on a table in a room where Hitler was sitting with a number of other people. And um, uh, it went off and he was injured, but wasn't killed. Now, there is some scholarly question about what role Bonhoeffer may have actually played in the planning of that. Tell us what that means. I mean, tell us what you think the historical truth is. And then also, how do you reach a point? I mean, I am I, I am not a pacifist. I'm just the closest thing most people have ever come to finding one. But um, here was a man who preached and found a biblical reason to be a pacifist what role, if any, did he play in that assassination attempt? Yeah, I think it was peripheral. Um, he seemed to be an F, uh, uh, an advisor on the morality and ethics of tyrannicide. Um, but he did identify with the movement that would eventually make attempts on Hitler's life. He writes about it between the lines in his magnum opus, mm. Ethics, which I challenge anyone right. to read. It's really a, a mind expander. But long story short is whether he did or didn't. And Professor uh, Mark Thiessen uh, Nation makes a pretty good defense that he wasn't embracing the actual act of assassination. But I'm not sure. Uh, I, I favor that he was, but in a un, in an entirely unique way. He said, it, basically, it was an unrepeatable act, unique to that circumstance, unique to that moment, unique to that tyrant, Hitler, and and was not a model for anything anywhere. And then, in fact, he was risking his own soul in even be, yeah. being identified with that movement. So it's a it's nuanced. It's not simple. Uh, It's anything but simplistic. Hmm. When you come through this journey and you look at what could be done now, obviously, and I uh, I frequently uh, blame Democrats for lots of things and including on this on this program. But you enticed me into doing something when when we were still on the opposite sides of things. When the Monica Lewinsky story broke, um, I was um, you called me and you said you were doing a a thing that was going to be aired on C-SPAN with a lot of pastors. And but you didn't have any progressive pastors. Would I come and do it? And I said I would. And I was glad I did. But I'll tell you in a small way because it didn't get huge amounts of attention i got more hate mail from participating in that than i've done in anything else i've ever done in my entire life but it was the right thing to do because you cannot look at what happened with bill clinton and say oh she seduced him He's a grown up. You can't allow that kind of conduct. You cannot excuse him for not being literally the grown up in the room and resisting that. And even Hillary at one point, I think right after the, the her loss in the campaign, accused Monica Lewinsky of being a seductress. If you're right, you're right. If you're wrong, you're wrong. And It's amazing, I think, for many people to realize how much you have suffered from acknowledging that you really got it wrong for 35 years. I I commend you for that. And I, I mean, there are people in the chat, which I'm not supposed to be reading, but are commending you for the same thing. And I, uh, I think in this movement, there were, people that that you are unique in my experience because you always seem to be a person who cared deeply about 
people. You cared about what they were thinking. You cared about what I had no idea that I was having any influence on you at all. But I'm glad to hear that. But I also think that talking to Jerry Falwell, talking with Pat Robertson, talking with uh, Lou Sheldon and the other luminaries of the right at the time, I never sensed that they had any humanity. They had talking points. They were reciting the bumper stickers, but I didn't think they really cared about people. And so many of the politicians, including some Democrats today, who talk about women's rights and being pro-choice, they don't spend five minutes of extra time trying to make that a reality. So they put up bills like yesterday's doesn't even get a majority vote and they know, and they knew it wouldn't. And now they're all crowing about what a wonderful thing. Kristen Cinema, a democratic in name only Senator from Arizona was out today explaining how she voted to protect the lives of women. She of course could have cast a vote to do away with the filibuster and then it would have meant something, but her vote, yesterday is literally meaningless. Well, Barry, um, may I use this opportunity first just to say, I always saw you as a person of integrity, always felt you were the real thing, genuine. It helped, it gave me pause on some of my uh, ill-formed opinions on many things. But the other thing I want to do is publicly apologize to you because there were many times when I was rude, when I uh, gave you a hard time simply to give you a hard time, but at night wondered whether you were the one on the right side of the equation. And I, and I never thanked you for that. So I'm thanking you for it now and begging your pardon for the, 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 the bad times, uh, but uh, I'm glad to be in your company now. I'm sure glad you survived your life-threatening uh, moment. Uh, well, I, I, that was, that was uh, when you told me that story. Uh, I'm just thankful to still have you here so that we can spend a few more years. I, I'm, I'm very aware that I did a lot of damage during those 30 years, a lot of damage. And many people remain very mad at me for that. And I understand their anger. Uh, so maybe I can collaborate with you in doing a little more of that, of that repair work. Well, I, I really appreciate that. And of course I accept your apologies and wasn't even looking for them, but I, know. I, I understand that. Uh, David has rejoined us. David, do you have any uh, final uh, questions or comments you'd like to pose here? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> this was uh, an amazing interview. Uh, I, I'm kind of speechless. Uh, this, is, this has been a beautiful, beautiful conversation. Just perfectly beautiful. Uh, I don't know if I can even come close to doing justice to it. Let me revisit your uh, your third conversion. Uh, that would be turning your back on Trump and the right to life movement. Uh, changing people's minds. What what changed your mind most? Conversations with Barry, the Reverend Barry W. Lynn, arguing the world or experiencing the world? Experiencing it, yeah, David, experiencing it. Uh, again, taking down the walls, the, those, those um, artificial sceneries that I had built, the, 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 the fantastical landscape that I had built and facing the real world, real people, their real lives, the real reasons they made their decisions, not the, the reasons I imagined them, uh, you know, to have, but that they really had. And, and that was not an easy thing. Um, and it took a lot of work, uh, but it was really facing 
the reality of people's lives. What I say now is that I spend an awful lot of time demanding that other people join me and live in my non-reality. And now I understand that the challenge in front of me is to live with them in their reality. And that was a, a complete, it was a seismic change in the way I structured my, my life and the way I related to other people. So that, that's really the short answer. What advice could you give to, to our side? And unfortunately, there are two sides. What advice is there to win over more people like you? Or do we just have to depend on life itself, experience? Is there anything we can do to, to bring people to our side? I think first we have to be careful not not to immediately go to contempt in our in our that's my default position with others. That's my, that? my default position is contempt contempt for <laughs> for the other side and even more contempt for my side so it's but, but you have developed it into a beautiful art form oh. which allows you to get away with that some people are just so hand-handed and clumsy and ugly about it right. <laughs> but you do do it exquisitely um i've watched you oh, uh but um yeah i think that's part of it you know one of the stories i love to tell is about the most trumpian financial benefactor that I had in my old world uh, who had a gun collection. I don't even know how many guns he owned. I want to put it in several hundred. Mm. And he always said, I have one at easy reach wherever I am. Um, he was that kind of guy. He was more Republican than any Republican you've ever met. Uh, and yet I met Don on the southern border when he and his wife were sweating in a in the kitchen of a ramshackle little church filled with immigrant pastors, many of whom we all knew were undocumented, who you know were uh, uh, you know we used to call them illegal uh, in that church, and yet Don and his wife were cooking three meals a day. They were very wealthy, uh, lived in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, uh, Siesta Key, Florida, and uh, Dayton, Ohio, depending upon the season of the year. Um, and yet they were there serving these folks for a whole week, didn't have to, were giving themselves. They were people of very mixed motive. Uh, and when COVID came around, he wasn't going to let anybody tell him what to do. And he didn't wear a mask and he died. And that still chokes me up because I loved this man. And as complicated and problematic as he was, and when I turned on Donald Trump, I'm sure he thought I was the Antichrist. And yet, you know, human beings are complex. They're a mix of everything, sometimes a mix of a lot more bad than good. And maybe Don got that way, and maybe I did too. But I think we have to, you know, show people uh, the same honor we want to be shown, uh, and and yet challenge them because that's that's part of doing good is to help somebody like me reassess my opinions. So I'm not talking about you know being mealy mouthed and mm -hmm. and silent. I, you let them have it. You do that masterfully, uh, Mr. Feldman. So does Barry. Please you call do it me masterfully. Please call me Reverend Feldman, please. <laughs> there you go. Mr. Mr. Feldman's my father's <laughs> name. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's the best I can do. <laughs> that's uh, uh, this. I, I please. Uh, I would like to repeat this as much as possible. This is between you and Reverend Barry W. Lynn. Uh, uh, I have, a, I have so many questions that I wanted to ask you. The, the people who don't agree with us, I'm, I've got it in my head that most of the people who don't agree with me don't believe what they're saying. They're just trying to irritate me, 
own me. Owning a lib is the new expression. Try to get a rise mm. out of me. They, and if they do believe what they're saying, there is something deeply, deeply wrong with them psychologically. But when you describe your friend Don serving undocumented Americans in the heat, uh, he believes, you're saying he believed that he was on the right side. There was nothing fraudulent about it. No, no. But there were moments that we had. Let me give you an example. We were talking about um, LGBTQ folk and he would slip into the ugly use of the F word for male, for for uh, yeah. gay men. And I'd say, hey, uh, uh, too far, Don, too far. And then he'd say, don't, don't get me wrong. Let me tell you something. I die for my cook. The guy who cooks for me, we lavish him. We take care of him. We love him. He's as gay as you get. I love him. I knew national evangelical leaders. Barry, you would know every one of them. Yeah. At least a couple who went to the same sex weddings of their children's friends and celebrated, danced, yucked it up, had a great time, never said a disparaging word, celebrated those marriages in that moment, then sadly would return home only to write uh, the most vitriolic, disparaging, insulting, uh, you know, uh, missives that would go out because that was their job. That was the business end of it. And for a lot of them, that's all that it was. It was a business and you had to bring in the bucks. And there's a big difference. If you got on anti same sex marriage, anti abortion, anti feminism, you could bring in a hundred million dollars a year on that. Let me just write that down. Hang on for it. Anti gay. <laughs> he's, he's, he's attempting to develop a theology for yeah, the Church of Feldman. Anti gay, anti feminism. I could do that. Mm. I, I could. Hundred million dollars. And do I get to. Hundred million. It's all tax free. I've told you this many times, David. Right. Hey, let me ask you one thing because I know we we got to wrap this up. But when I interviewed Randall Terry, who just for remind people, he was really the most formidable creator of Operation Rescue, the most well known person, and you worked with them and him on a number of occasions. But when he um, he had a little problem with in the church that he was a member, he. Uh, at an affair and was with another woman. And when that news broke, I called him up and I had him on a radio show I was doing at the time. And I said, you know, Randall, for somebody who can find opposition to abortion in the Bible, which I could never find, but I said, it's unequivocal. You can't get a divorce. How do you mix um, you getting a divorce with the clear statement in the Bible that you shouldn't have one. And he said to me, um, well, Barry, we're all human. We're all human. And in that one th moment, I thought, well, he's explained, he's told the truth, but he's also explained why he's wrong about almost everything, because we are humans. Well, well said, well said. Why don't we do this real soon? This was one of the most, I have to say this, and I'm looking at the chat room uh, on YouTube and on Zoom. This is one of the most uh, profound conversations we've had on this show. And I thank you, Reverend Bob Shank. And your book is Costly Grace. How do we buy that and support you? Anywhere you prefer to buy your books. Um, when did it come out? It came out two years ago, but it's okay. still it's still doing well. I'm glad it has a life of its own. Here's a little secret. Unless you are a multiple New York Times bestselling author, you'll never make any money on a book. <laughs> so don't anybody think, you know, uh, have a fantasy. 
I'm actually in debt to my publisher. But anyway, all that to say, I'm really glad the book continues right. to have a life of its own. And I'm always humbled when people uh, write me and tell me that, that they found it uh, meaningful. Costly grace. Yeah. Reverend, Bonnet, Reverend Barry W. Lynn, uh, just amazing. Thank you. How, how, why don't you wrap up the interview and I'll say good night to you. And uh... All right. Um, listen, uh, Rob, why don't you give your website? Because it's got all kinds of wonderful writings, explorations, uh, discussions of why you are still an evangelical. And uh, tell us your website. Yeah, it's real simple. It's just Rev Shank, my last name. Uh, he's the Hungarian and Dutch yeah. spelling, not the German, S C H E N C K. So, okay. Revshank, R E V S C H E N C K dot com, Revshank dot com. Terrific. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you. And uh, um, we will. Uh, we will leave you now and we will see you, uh, David, I will see you next week. Yes. And unlike Reverend Bob Shank, <laughs> I'm not apologizing for what I've said to you <laughs> over the years. <laughs> and I, Absolutely. <laughs> no, thank you. No, thank you. Reverend. Certainly. Thank okay, you so much. Stay out of trouble, Reverend. Oh, only good trouble. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Reverend Bob Shank. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Reverend Barry W. Lynn, very, uh, I'm kind of speechless. Uh, as I'm, I'll bring in the professors in a second. The, the, the thing that makes me proud to be a human and an American is our capacity to change. Uh, Pee Wee Reese, I always think of Pee Wee Reese, who played for the Brooklyn Dodgers, who did not want Jackie Robinson to, to join the team. And he protested and used the N-word and uh, had nothing to do with Jackie Robinson. Bad guy, Pee Wee Reese, until he saw Jackie Robinson play. And then there was a complete 180. And I always think that's the most beautiful thing about humans, that, that, we, that we can see, see that we can ch change completely. And I think we all hold ideas that are wrong and letting go of wrong ideas is the, the, the height of humanity. We all are born uh, pure, some might disagree, but then we are taught horrible things. Uh, with the best intentions and to learn to change, to let go of what's wrong is uh, the height of humanity in my estimation. And I, there's a 60 Minutes episode that I've never forgotten. They went back to a high school. I was bust in the 70s. And in the early 70s, there was a famous busing story from the South where white kids were bused to a black school and it did not go well. There, there were fights in the gym. They had to shut the school down. It was a semi-famous story, a very turbulent year at this high school where they were trying to mix black students with white students in the South. 60 Minutes went back to that same school, I think 30 years later. Yes. And they brought all the kids in and the white kids, or at least the ones who showed up for the interviews, and they had pictures of them throwing rocks at the black kids. Every kid who you know, vociferously protested going to school with black kids, every kid, there were pictures of them protesting, had changed their mind. And yes. it was... I know they caused damage to those black kids, but the fact that they could apologize and know that they had done harm and seek uh, and apologize and ask for forgiveness, it was one of the most beautiful episodes of 60 Minutes I've ever seen. And I think all of us 
all of us have wrong ideas. And as we get older, to let go of bad thoughts, bad ideas, is the height of humanity. So I, I really have tremendous respect for you, Reverend Bob Shank, and I hope you come back and continue this conversation uh, with Reverend Barry W. Lynn. Uh, this was a beautiful interview. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you. Bye bye. Well, let us now go to Joe in Norway. Uh, and you have a uh, well, and, and you have a lower third. It's time for ASMR for your eyeballs. Mm. By the way, thank mm. you again, Reverend Barry W. Lynn. Uh, really, that was something. Uh, Joe in Norway. Joe keeps Good evening, David. you you keep the show going, uh, especially office hours. So thank you. And you have a a cooking segment on our show. What are you cooking tonight? Yes, we have a uh, my partner and I have a a um, funeral to go to tomorrow. You have a you have a uh, to go to tomorrow celebration celebration of life ceremony tomorrow. And I thought I would make uh, a nice, rich green tea, cashew cream pie at the suggestion of Dave Ami in our community. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the best kind of baking I do. It's a, it's a no-bake <laughs> cake. Is this so, raw food? This will be a raw food and, shall we say, uh, gluten-free, I guess, if you can. All of the isms, there will be a little bit of white sugar because I couldn't find the agave syrup. This is but, this uh, is the kind of food that none of us can afford. This is that like really great. I'm going to, I'm like, going to attempt to not bleed into the pie while I'm making it. My nose is still bleeding from when I picked this up at the grocer. I'll, you, you I'll be billing a, whoa, whoa, whoa. Dave afterwards. We have a no, we had a nosebleed today. At the prices we have to pay for all oh, this I protein and tea. Okay. So I'll be making the, uh, a very um, uh, nice pie for, for the funeral tomorrow. And then I have to prep some black beans. So I'll be making, cooking black beans in the pressure cooker. You don't have to soak these. It'll be cooked within the hour and all, all ready to, to eat for the next few days. All right, we will keep an eye on you. So far, everybody has a lower. Th oh, <laughs> Professor, I'm so glad to see <laughs> Professor Marianne, but no lower third. Everybody and has lower thirds on the screen, <laughs> except for Professor Marianne. And we have to fix the. Leslie doesn't like the color, so we have to fix this. But uh, we're, well, we're getting one more, more announcement. Yes, sir. I have, if anybody would like to send me recipe ideas or suggestions, anything they'd like me to prepare on the show, they can tweet at me at Joe at Joe Umami on Twitter. Spell the last part. J O E U A U U M U J O E U M A M I. Those are my first words that I said to my father. <laughs> you mommy. <laughs> you mommy. <laughs> How many hours into the show is this? Four and a half hours. <laughs> I'm still trying. So joining us, it's time for the professors and Mary Ann. Thank you, Joe. We'll check in with you later as you continue to torture us. It, this, you're getting... It's more and more each week it gets more painful to watch what you're making. I get so hungry. The, uh, Professor Marianne Cummings is a particle physicist. She is a parks commissioner. She's our only elected official here on this show. Parks Commissioner Aurora, Illinois, still holding a Nina Turner for Congress poster behind one of your amazing paintings. You you painted that, didn't you? Yes. A dangerously brilliant individual, as is Professor Ann Lee, who you can read over at the Daily Co's. Her uh, byline is Annie Lee. And Professor Jonathan Bick 
joins us, and he's over at Office Hours every Friday night at 8 p.m. teaching Star Wars, not Star Wars, Star Trek. It's hot in here. <laughs> Star Trek and the Twilight Zone. Let's uh, do Professor Ann Lee, and let's see how your sound is today. Hello. No. Testing one, two, three. That's good. We, we still have to figure out how to even get it louder. But hi. Even, lo even louder. <laughs> yeah. We want, it's very frustrating because you're one of the smartest persons, persons, peoples in the world. And not to be able to hear you, it, it's uh, frustrating sometimes. But well, my students felt the same way. But anyway. Okay. <laughs> What would you like to talk about tonight? Well, we had uh, talked off uh, offline uh, that we might talk about uh, the little ice, ice age. Uh, but if others don't want to talk about that, that's fine. Um, sure. Uh, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, what was interesting, because it is the idea of a quote unquote little ice age, uh, because most of us think an ice age is global and um, the current literature and probably it's used as a counterfactual for climate crisis, climate change, is that, you know, that there are uh, phases or cycles for uh, uh, in terms of uh, sun rotation and stuff that uh, Marianne probably knows much more than I do about. But I, I came across a... Uh, an interesting text in preparation uh, for this. Uh, the, the basic problem, of course, is that uh, at some of the most interesting times that have uh, influenced the world, uh, mainly the world economy, or at least uh, one way of looking at it is the world economy, are these uh, uh, brief moments, these kind of 11 year solar cycles that can uh, sometimes uh, at, at their height and their depth uh, produce, uh, well, at the height you get sunspots and other things which uh, affect uh, climate on Earth. Uh, the, the problem, of course, is to generalize from that and to say that the um, a little ice age, which occurs actually in a very formative time, at least in the European context, is uh, it's a useful, uh, useful tool to talk about history. And uh, unfortunately, Adnan is not here. And I think he would have, uh, I, I think he's probably actually read more on this, which is why he brought it up originally. But uh, I, I think it's a really compelling topic. Help me out here. First of all, is there is that good news, perhaps, that we're about to have a little ice age that might slow the death of our climate? Well, uh, no, the problem, of course, is in the 21st century and in, in the Anthropocene uh, is that we've gone beyond the limits. We've gone past the guardrails <clears throat> and uh, in in the uh, the I, the little ice age, uh, which whose bottom point is somewhere in the uh, somewhere between 1645 and 1720 uh, is we're never going to get there. And it's going to just keep going up. That's the, the real problem. That's where <clears throat> uh, Michael Mann is is showing that uh, this is that hockey stick problem is that it's way, way worse. But this one book that I uh, uh, took a look at, which I, I actually am I'm not quite through with, but I it's a for me, it's a fun book only because I have sort of interest in the area. It's a uh, and I like the name of the guy, uh, a, a guy by the name of Dagomar. De Groot, uh, no connection to Guardians of the Galaxy. Although I, now I, I can't think of him without thinking of mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a permuting uh, piece of wood. Uh, <laughs> I, he does really an excellent job of describing the North countries in the um, 17th and 18th century, or 16th, 17th and 18th century when we have the Little Ice Age. And he, he goes through with some really important elements about how, on the one hand, it was a very good thing uh, for the Dutch. It, cre it caused resilience. On the other hand, it, it caused all kinds of chaos 
Uh, so it, it had good and bad things. And so anyone who wants to claim that uh, a, a shifts in climate can be good are really quite uh, are going to be misled once you actually look at it from a historical point of view. But it, it is part of a much larger view of history, um, uh, which I, I think uh, both Adnan and I uh, uh, sort of subscribe to, and that is called an all school theory. A what? Uh, I'm sorry, a what? An all school theory. Uh, history a n n a l e s uh it's it's named after the journal the french journal another thing to blame the french for but it uh it's a description of long swings through history and uh history of people who don't who aren't um usually included in major histories um some of the major writers in in that school of of historical thought uh write about poor people right on on people on on everyday life and um the the cinematic example of that is uh for example martin gear um uh uh and and uh some of the writers of that that type of history are um uh, bradell uh and and la Duhi. um needless to say it's another reason i hate the french but on the other hand uh it engages both science and regular history and that's the kind of beauty of it and i think that's um i think that's why adnan was interested in it and um why i uh, looked at this one little book which is on uh dutch uh, uh dutch history um uh, uh that refers to a, a kind of golden age which which is often uh the term used for uh you know the period of of rembrandt and uh and the like uh the period past uh, past the early Northern Renaissance, but uh, sort of before the Baroque or during the Baroque, depends on how you want to measure it. But in fact, that's the real real question for historians: is how do we how do we look at periodicity? How do we how do we talk about the periods? Because many historians and scientists believe that the Little Ice Age endured for around six centuries. So. It, and people would like to say, well, that that shows that it's that has a, a certain shape of regularity. Well, in fact, it doesn't. There's lots of little gaps in it. And uh, what some of these historians have shown is that amongst these gaps, some major things happen. Uh, we could say, in fact, that the worst times of this ice age were actually the times of, of greatest creativity and strength. But also when the next uh, swing occurred of an even worse uh, or similar uh, uh, climate. Uh, there was an incredible, you know, destitution, uh, 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 famine, war, uh, a variety of other things. Um, and and for the Dutch, it was it was good in the first uh, in the first dip in this uh, in this er in this time period, but in the second time period, uh, the Eng the English. Uh, uh, that wiped them out in, in a variety of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, ocean-going sort of activities. So it, it, it's an interesting question. Um, and uh, the person who writes this book, this fellow, uh, De Groot, uh, and I still can't <laughs> stop thinking of him as a wooden guy uh, <laughs> who only uses one word. Mm -hmm. And anyway, uh, <laughs> it uh, he makes a comparison between the Dutch being uh, uh, explorers and uh, Tokugawa Japan, which was incredibly isolationist, and yet both survived or prospered within the same context. So there's no one historical model that fits this, but it does show and in a very important sense. And I'll conclude with this is that interdisciplinary history is incredibly important and that uh, uh a variety of, of scientific approaches, whether it's economic, political, et cetera, uh, can be better integrated with what is often called a kind of narrative history. Um, and that uh, to ignore one is to uh, really ignore some of the, the richest uh, studies. And also technology has improved our ability to deal with all those time periods, because obviously they weren't drilling core, core samples for geology in the 15th century. So a lot of the data is not as clear, but it's much clearer now, now that we have more scientific ways of looking at, at that kind of thing. And so for those of you who want to read a, an interesting little book that is a, a fun read, particularly if, you've, you know, if, if you like the Netherlands, uh, the, the Dutch part of it, uh, as uh, uh, 
as I do. Uh, it's called The Frigid Golden Age, Climate Change, The Little Ice Age, and the Dutch Republic, 1560 to 1720. Uh, it's a Cambridge University Press, and uh, it's Dagomar de Groot, D-E-G-R-O-O-T. And I think that's going to be my new stage name, <laughs> da- Dagomar de Groot. Groot. I like that. <laughs> Professor Marianne, you, were, you wanted to say something about this? Oh, uh, yeah, I think they're, they're, they're kind of... Oh, you're muted. Yeah. This uh, something is flickering on my on my screen here. I uh, can you hear me now. Yes. Okay. You know, if you could lean in a little bit, we're. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, how about how about that? Good. So, um, yeah, it's. I, I read a book on the when I was a kid. I read a book on the 14th century. I was like, the historian escapes me, but she wrote the Guns of August. She was like Tuckman. John F. Kennedy. Tuckman. Yeah, Barbara, Barbara Tuckman. Tuckman. Yes. And she went into uh, quite a great detail about what the Little Ice Age meant. You know, whenever you have a settled society and the Europe was becoming, was developing, this was post uh, Crusades and the beginning of the Renaissance. But whenever you have a developed society, um, any change in like food chain or anything like that, I mean, can be incredibly disruptive. And uh, disruptive in an interesting way because it forces people to solve problems or move or sometimes, you know, it it dislodges people who have been in power. Uh, I think a more I think she would say the more disruptive, disruptive thing to have happened was like 40 years later in the century when they had that big bubonic plague. And that certainly was hell for a lot of people. But on the other hand, certainly it's kind of like cutting down the forest and all the little trees that have been growing under shade get time to shoot up, you know, so, but, um, but these, uh, but, but again, you know, these are things that when you have smaller populations, you can deal with. Uh, I mean, my, my problem and the reason why myself and Peter Kalmus and, you know, in some sense, I'm kind of like, ignoring the fact that I know to be true that this climate change, this global change is is going to be hellish because, you know, we've got all the good land. We've we're, humans have settled on all the decent land. You know, we are I mean, this uh, between COVID and this war in Ukraine, I mean, it's sort of tested the fragility of all this interconnectedness, which gives us our modern 21st century and technology. But we are very fragile, you know, to any major disruption. What I don't think anybody here in, in the United States really knows what it means to have even the hint of a famine or a food shortage. People are uh, the, the, ba- the, the, ba- the babies. Babies in America are starting to learn. Isn't that amazing? Did you hear what Jen Psaki said earlier this this week? No. That you know there wasn't. Yeah, you know, there really isn't much we can do. We can do it. It's like, isn't that an emergency? You guys just uh, came up with $40 billion you want to send to keep a war going. Wow. But something so critical to to the health of your people. Well, I I wanted before I I got on here, I just noticed that there was an article in the New York Times. Somebody had, uh, but they were talking about the baby formula um, oligarchy. So even before, you know, COVID and the shipping problems, there was a problem when you allow one industry, when something is, you know, a critical need and you let, you know, a very small cabal of people run it. Um, Yeah, I mean. Yeah, we talked, Abbott, not Greg Abbott, the governor, but we talked about at the top of the show that it's big big baby formula is the problem. Mm -hmm. It's monopoly. It's not the FDA cracking down on Abbott causing the supply chain issues. It's a monopoly. You don't mm-hmm. get your food from one source. We know you rotate your crops. You make sure that you have other sources of nutrition. Uh, Professor, yeah, it's just stunning. yeah, it's just stunning to me that because I had I had a lot of arguments many years ago with uh, other physicists at the lunch table who saw no problem with. GMO foods and Monsanto like messing with the foods and you know like coming coming up with these uh, pest and and uh, weed resistant strains of weed. I'm going. Have you, have you ever heard of evolution? 
<laughs> I mean, yeah, it turns out that we, the Monsanto discovers uh, evolution with identifying these super weeds, which are just ma- mainly the weeds that survived the Monsanto mass Monsanto planting of this, uh, what was it, the round, what was in the roundup? What was uh, glyphosate? Glyphosate. glyphosate. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, and then the, the problem is, is that um, their motivations are completely decoupled from the the welfare of the societies they're in. Um, that's what you have when you're trying to let market and the profit motive. I mean, and legally, they're bound to maximize profit for their shareholders. So um, time to start unwinding. Some of those you show me you show me a problem that's life threatening. I'll show you somebody's greed. The the source of all death, unnecessary death, is mm-hmm. is greed. Even somebody killing somebody, like Kyle Rittenhouse, it comes from greed because ten years ago, an idiot like Kyle Rittenhouse would never have been able to get his hands on an assault weapon, but the greed of gun manufacturers sell these assault weapons to anybody. Professor Jonathan Bick, and it's good to see Professor Adnan Hussein joining us. He has a lower third. Everybody's got a lower third today except Professor Mary. I'm obsessed with... Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm a little neurotic. I don't even know what you're talking about, but that's okay. Okay. Uh, I I just wanted to add uh, regarding Abbott, you you were talking about the baby formula manufacturer. Uh, But Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, did say something in regard to this issue. Uh, He said that uh, he was criticizing Biden, President Biden, because apparently um, we're providing food to babies that are in uh, concentration camps. Uh, uh, because the, their parents migrated to this country without proper paperwork. No, this can't be true. Is he complaining that we're giving baby formula? Yes, he is. He's he's saying that the precious Texas babies should get uh, the formula, uh, and if we just deny it to the uh, to the migrants, you know, there there, there won't be as much of a shortage. Somebody, so needs wants to, to, somebody needs to Leon Klinghoffer, this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a cruise somewhere wow, that we can put a, him? <laughs> that's an old reference. Uh, that's pretty good, David. Yeah. Wow. I mean, wow. What does he think we should do? Like, we should, they should be uh, slaughtered and, you know. Oh, just, just, uh, the, you know. The that's not his concern. Uh, only American babies are his concern. He didn't. Say, I can't believe. I can't believe he said that. He's a oh, monster. Yeah. No, He's a he monster. Did say that. He said that today. I yeah, believe- I'm, I'm looking at the report right now. Oh my goodness. He's a monster. Yeah. Do you have it there, um, Marianne? <clears throat> yes, uh, it's a Texas. My screen is blinking at it, but it says Texas governor under fire after calling feds reckless for giving migrant babies formula amid U.S. shortage. And that was from Border Report today. If you were writing a screenplay and you wanted to have a villain, nobody that you would be told not nobody would say that you can't have somebody say that that's it's not believable. Well, he is the governor of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, it, it, it took two of them to make a joint statement. In a joint statement by Abbott and Border Patrol Council President Braden, Brandon Judd, they said on Thursday, quote, children are our most vulnerable, precious uh, Texas assets and deserve to be put first. <laughs> Yet President Biden has turned a blind eye to parents across America who are facing a nightmare of nationwide baby formula shortage. While mothers and fathers stare at empty grocery store shelves in a panic, the Biden administration is happy to provide baby formula to illegal immigrants. 
crossing our southern border. I just, I, who raised these people? Who raised them? <laughs> Who's writing? Who's writing this? I mean, maybe they were raised on baby formula <laughs> exclusively. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't get the nutrition they needed for proper brain development. Yeah. Raising Arizona. Why aren't you breastfeeding them? Our mother didn't breastfeed us. Look how we turned out. Well, the problem is that's a, breastfeeding is a luxury. If you're uh, living at or below the poverty line, you don't mm -hmm. have you don't have time to breastfeed. But Ethan Hershenfeld had a great idea to have well, little, what you know, just have wet nurses where you can just stop and drop the kid off. And anyway, I'm not doing it justice. Uh, go ahead. I just want to point out this yeah. is on top of his statement from uh, earlier in the week, or was it last week, um, talking about his intention to challenge an earlier Supreme Court ruling from the 80s uh, that provided that all children in the United States should are entitled to an education. Uh, he he wants to deny education to the children of uh, uh, undocumented immigrants. That because that's really going to benefit our society, isn't it? And and yeah. the world to deny children an education, and when they grow up, what what kind of activities do you think they might get involved with? I mean. You know, to deny someone the chance to have a decent life and to have basic skills that they need to, uh, you know, participate in life. What is the thinking there? You know, it's just it's this it's along the same lines of just cruelty of of blind hatred. Well, maybe Ariana Huffington could explain to us why she supported that idea when she was running her husband for Senate in California. I think we talked about that last week. Ariana Huffington, the great liberal, as recently as 1992, ran her husband for Senate on the platform of denying education and health benefits to undocumented children. Ariana Huffington, who works on her sleep hygiene. It's amazing she can sleep at all at night. Professor Adnan Hussein, what do you have David. to what do you have to appall us with? You want to go back to the, <laughs> the little ice age? Well, I mean, I, I apologize for being late, and I thought we might um, want um, Professor Ian Faluna uh, to add the uh, climate science side of it. But it was fascinating on my drive. Uh, back home i managed to catch a few of uh, professor ann lee's brilliant remarks on it on a topic that uh, i thought would be interesting for us to talk about from different perspectives um, but i can appall us uh, by um, talking a little bit about um, a 51 year old journalist uh, who was recently shot and um, killed uh, in Janine in the West Bank uh, recently, a few days ago, and whose funeral took place today, Shireen Abu Akla, who um, American. Was a, yeah, Palestinian American, uh, um, who was uh, probably among the earliest uh, female reporters for Al Jazeera network. Um, and, um, you know, very well respected and has been reporting from uh, difficult areas in the Middle East, particularly Palestine for a long time and was clearly marked, um, you know, wearing a kind of high vis uh, vest that indicated that she was with the press and she was with several other uh, journalists as well, quite far from, um, you know, uh, an area where there was some live fire going on between Israeli forces and Palestinian resistance, uh, but they were very far away um, and had informed the authorities of their presence. Um, and so this is a kind of shocking event that has gained uh, a fair amount of attention and become a renewed focus, uh, you know, building as it um, as it does upon several weeks of, of intensified conflict and suppression of protests and arrests and, and so on that had been taking place in different places in the West Bank. But so this um, journalist, Shirin Abu Akla, 
um, you know, received something almost like a state uh, you know, funeral today. Um, with 5,000 people uh, came out um, and lined the streets um, as her coffin, which was draped in a Palestinian flag, was uh, taken through the city of Ramallah um, in the West Bank. Um, and um, uh, the Kalandia checkpoint, um, you know, to her home in East Jerusalem. Um, so that's where she, you know, has been residing. So her body was sort of brought back um, to East Jerusalem. And uh, I don't know if people have seen the video uh, of, there is video that um, has been um, shown on, you know, all sorts of channels and so on. And um, that shows um, her, you know, gruesome uh, death and shooting. And it's a, a real tragedy that shows the continuing violence uh, of the occupation uh, in Palestine. Which so they've just something. approved 4,000 new units for the settlers. Uh, yes. I mean, it seems that there is um, absolutely no slowing down of the building of these illegal uh colonies, settlements, uh, and the expansion into occupied territory, violating all kinds of um, uh, conventions and uh, uh, international law. Um, uh, so this, this, however, is uh, something that did elicit some, um, you know, remorseful sounding statements um, by uh, I think it was the uh, foreign minister uh, of Israel because it just is a a really obvious uh, case. But I think that's the that's what needs to be pointed out is that um, this isn't exceptional for the people who live there. This sort of thing is happening all the time. It's just that um, you know we have these particular taboos that when those are violated, they get a little bit more like American, attention and American so, yeah. journalists. But yeah, they, they also right. Israel also said we're not sure it was IDF. It may have been Palestinians right. who shot her. They're not taking full responsibility. Yeah, that I mean, I mean, I think, uh, uh, you know, one can't prejudge these things. And of course, there should be an investigation. But it clearly seems to me a lot of, uh, you know, dust throwing to uh, obfuscate the situation because it really does look bad. And the footage is very clear and disturbing. Um, and uh, so I think to uh, kind of wait for temperatures to cool down and to try and avoid, um, you know, some of the backlash that might happen in, you know, uh, the international uh, political realm, uh, you know, they can raise some doubts and uh, perhaps hope that this, you know, won't lead to further pressure politically on uh, the Israeli government. Um, but I guess, you know, I would say, look at the outcry, the hue and cry over, you know, Jamal Khashoggi, you know, um, you know, if you compare the two events, I think it'll be important and interesting to see, you know, what public reaction globally and internationally is and whether it will lead to any genuine political pressure. I think that actually did have something of a decisive um, effect on um, at least the public portrayal of MBS, you know, in the U.S., in U.S. circles. Uh, I think fundamentally the real reason why uh, MBS is being isolated um, is, of course, because of his position in the Ukraine war and willingness to maintain all kinds of diplomatic and financial and economic ties with Russia and unwillingness um, to uh, boost production in order to alleviate global oil prices. So I think there is, of course, a geopolitical and economic basis for it. But, you know, the attention that the Khashoggi uh, murder and killing and the fact that, you know, CIA reports directly, you know, connect him uh, as responsible in giving the order has certainly been politically damaging. Uh, will this you know, killing of a journalist in um, Janine um, have similar consequences in isolating, you know, Israeli uh, government officials and policy uh, that has been going on for such a long time and violating uh, international law and in continuing an occupa occupation. It's, of course, you know, very doubtful, but um, at least it's the moment to, to raise the issues again and talk about um you know, possible prosecutions uh, in the International Criminal Court uh, and so on. Um, so 
Abu you know. Mazen said he's going to take it before the the, pa- the Palestinian president. Said yes, that. yes. I mean, and I think what's interesting here is clearly, um, you know, you don't hear a lot from Abu Mazen, you know, um, on a lot of issues. Okay, he'll make these perfunctory statements as well. He has a role to play. Uh, but I think he might be under some pressure here. I mean, this is the kind of situation that can produce a little bit of political pressure uh, and force him to actually, um, you know, make diplomatic moves um, that could at least bring to bear some political attention in the international arena. Um, but of course, uh, you can't actually try people in the international criminal court if they're not parties to the treaty and if they don't recognize the authority of the court. Um, Israel, like the U.S., uh, is a rogue nation. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, we talk about rogue nations that uh, violate the rules based international order. Um, You know, this is a very strange kind of accusation to make against uh, many of the countries um, that the U.S. routinely does uh, raise this, uh, um, you know, charge against uh, when, you know, and also I just I we have all enjoyed seeing you know how i think as ben burgess uh, has has put it that uh, the media and u.s government officials have suddenly recognized that cluster bombs are really awful and um you know uh you know uh, possibly illegal uh, that they're weapons of mass destruction um so so all of a sudden we're discovering that war crimes uh, exist right. you know uh, because of uh, russia's invasion of ukraine uh, will we recognize that these are war crimes uh, taking place routinely by u.s allies over whom we actually have quite a lot of leverage and could do something that would change the situation if our government decided to do so and landmines we're pro landmine Despite the our love for Princess Di here in the United States, we couldn't sign on to uh, not making and selling and using landmines. Now, Israelis on the right will say there's a whiff of an intifada going on. How big is how dangerous is it for Israelis right now? Well, I mean, you know, that's hard to predict. Um, this is a replay in some ways of what happened last uh, last year, um, you know, around this time, um, uh, trying to stop the forced evictions in, um, you know, Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood, as well as um, conflict around trying to protect use of, um, you know, the Al-Aqsa mosque and, um, you know, uh, the, the area uh, there on the top of the of the of the hill. Um, so, I mean, did it ever really go away? I mean, um, it's true that there is an upsurge of protest, but um, all through the summer of, of 2020, when there were Black Lives Matter, you know, protests taking place in the U.S., there were similar kinds of um, manifestations and violent suppression of, of these uh, uh, demonstrations and so on. I think um, there might be peaks and valleys of intensity of um uh, the suppression and, and whether there's resistance. But I think the reality is, is that it's constantly happening at a low, low level all the time that there is the occupation doesn't work as um, just crushing, you know, through military control and and um, obvious violence. Uh, it's systemic. It's land you know being taken away it's a bulldozers coming and toppling a house it's a family that you know becomes homeless um because they've made an illegal addition in other words they've repaired their roof or they've done something without receiving a proper permit it's this it's the intersection between you know legality and the way it's being deployed um to um you know the construction of roads and of um the encircling of villages uh that separates a population from the land that they till and makes it really impossible for them to move and you know visit their orchards and and tend to their orchards you know these things are happening all the time and i think that's important to remember is that on a daily basis 
there is a slow and continuing process of dispossession um, and of, you know, legal kind of violence, uh, the systemic sort of violence. And occasionally there will be moments where resistance is mobilized and organized in such a fashion that it elicits a more draconian kind of response um, where you have shooting and you have, you know, actual, um, you know, violence. And that's when the media pays attention. But, you know, all those other daily activities of expropriation, of humiliation, of suppression, um, you know, don't really uh, rise to our consciousness. Yeah. I just want to, uh, I subscribe to Haaretz, which is kind of like the New York Times of Israel, where they try to, you know, it's they're going to present middle of the road, both sides. There is a vigorous debate inside of Israel among Israeli citizens about the West Bank, about Gaza. In America, we only hear one side. We hear Bibi Netanyahu's side of an argument that is going on in Israel right now. And to American Jews who see Israel more as an idea and an abstraction, I suggest you start reading uh, Israeli newspapers to get the other side there's an alternative to APAC. You're getting hit in America. You pretty much get APAC's version of events. And the Democrats and the Republicans are all parroting talking points from APAC. And I suggest that America, especially American Jews, start reading about what other people say about the West Bank and Gaza in Israel. There are, uh, there's, a, there's a much bigger side to this story and we can't seem to have that conversation here in America. If you don't parrot APAC, uh, you're branded almost an anti-Semite. And I was reading in Haaretz that now the Anti-Defamation League has made anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism synonymous. Absolutely, yeah. Where the hell does the Anti-Defamation League get off saying any criticism of Zionism is tantamount to anti-Semitism? So there can't be any discussion about the state of Israel and its treatment of the Palestinians, otherwise you're immediately branded a, an anti-Semite. That is not a recipe for a, a positive outcome for Jews in well, America. I agree. I agree completely. And I think it's actually intellectually, socially, politically very important to distinguish between Zionism, uh, uh, the policies of a government uh, um, and a form of racism, of religious or racial discrimination, you know, and the latter is anti-Semitism. Uh, and the former are, you know, a nationalist ideology or the policies of a state. And um, I think it's dangerous, actually, um, and actually uh, increases the uh, possibilities of anti-Semitism uh, by associating them closely. Right. I think that's not something that's to the benefit of Jews in the diaspora, for example, to be tied to, you know, uh, closely and identified uh, with, um, you know, the activities and behavior of, of right. um, the Israeli government. Um, and we've had this issue. Uh, there is a new def the definition that uh, was developed um, by the International uh, Holocaust Remembrance Alliance in around uh, 2012 as a working definition of anti-Semitism uh, that includes a number, it uh, includes 11 examples of possible, you know, uh, examples of what might, you know, count as anti-Semitism. Anti and seven of the examples relate to characterizations of the Israeli state or criticism of its policies um, and, and, and behavior. And this definition 
which the actual definition is a really anodyne one. It's not a particularly interesting or useful definition. There are many different other definitions. The very idea that you need a definition is also kind of a question mark, but it was developed. The, it has become uh, very important in campaigns uh, globally. Uh, it's recognized now in Germany, for example, as the basis for determining anti-Semitism and um, has been used to keep scholars uh, who've been invited to give talks. Uh, uh, you know, Akilim Bembe, very famous African political scientist, political theorist, uh, was uh, disinvited from uh, a conference uh, because he has criticized the occupation uh, uh, in, in uh, the West Bank and Gaza. And um, it is now increasingly being embedded in law as the definition for anti-Semitism. And what it does is it very closely associates criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. Boycott, divestment. There, there are certain government contracts that you can't get if you support boycotting and divestment of Israel. Yeah. As, as but my point is, is that the reason why this is preferred, like it never became, there never was a campaign around a particular definition of anti-Semitism or not. The only reason why there is a big campaign to adopt this definition is precisely because it includes these examples that do associate, you know, criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. I'm not saying that it's impossible that there can be criticisms of Israel that are anti-Semitic. That is a possibility. But what it tends to do here is um, make it uh, synonymous in just the way that you were you were mentioning. It makes it synonymous, and um, it also prevents Palestinians actually expressing their political positions and experience and advocating for you know their solidarity so we actually had this come up as a question in my own university uh, because there was a new harassment and discrimination policy promulgated by the university and in one of the footnotes for the section on you know anti-semitism among many other forms of religious and racial discrimination it cited the ihra definition that i was just talking about and we had to raise it with them that many of us teach the Middle East, teach Middle East politics. We are not going to be able to conduct our curriculum or do research, you know, if we have to worry that class discussion about, you know, policies of what's happening in the West Bank are now going to be you know, characterized as anti-Semitic. You simply can't have these discussions anymore. You can't study history. You can't study, you know, politics. And so we had a, a, a vote to actually join the coalition that is saying uh, we can't use this definition. It's, it's, it's invalid. And in fact, actually, we should adopt, for example, the Jerusalem Declaration, which is a wonderful peer review definition of anti-Semitism that hundreds of scholars have agreed to. And it doesn't include these kinds of examples right yeah yes uh to be continued uh now i'm going to get emails telling accusing me of being against the state of israel you can say things about israel in the state of israel that you cannot say here in america about israel um, that's why bernie sanders was such a threat i mean he was double inoculated being Jewish, having worked at a kibbutz, having had his family wiped out in the Holocaust. And I would say politely, but firmly critical. And the, the, the political cynicism of a government in Israel that would first embrace the dominionists during the George Bush, Dick Cheney era, people who, you know, <laughs> their, their Christian belief means that, you know, the Jews ought to have to convert. And then later on, Donald Trump, whose followers include some genuine swastika wearing Nazis. I mean, this has just got to be like just an extreme exploitation, cynical exploitation for just political power among the Likudniks. Speaking I mean, of it is, but uh, just quickly, it does it does have to be emphasized. And the problem in these discussions is when you criticize, for example, this definition or the, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, characterization of criticism of Israel uh, uh, with anti-Semitism, if you criticize that 
uh, you have to be very, you know, insistent and careful at the same time to affirm. In fact, anti-Semitism is on the rise. It is a huge problem. Uh, but the problem is not that we're criticizing Israel. That's not the source of anti-Semitism. The source of anti-Semitism is this right wing upsurge, you know, that is happening globally. Um, you know, and that is where we need the focus. So I think, you know, it's important in, to contextualize in these discussions. That so you're saying the, 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 the rise of anti-Semitism isn't linked to the treatment of the Palestinians. It's linked to the right wing upsurge. Yes. Yeah, yes, I agree. Exactly. With you. Well, look, look what happens with the Tree of Life massacre in Pittsburgh, this horrible uh, attack on worshipers in a synagogue. Why did that happen? It happened because, you know, um, well, I mean, you have this kind of Trump right wing, you know, identifying of the Jewish Immigrant Aid Society. OK, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society as collaborating, you know, in this international conspiracy to bring Syrian Muslim refugees into the country. And so you have a replay from exactly what my research is on, which is the association of Muslims and Jews in this you know, Christian crusader imagination. This is exactly the same thing that is happening in this right wing view of, you know, the internal enemy of the Jew being connected with the external enemy of the Muslim in subverting Christian society and culture, in this case, America, but bringing Syrian refugees. And that's one of the reasons I think why that particular synagogue was attacked is because it was active in you know, uh, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. And so you had this linking of Jews as part of some kind of global conspiracy, uh, you know, with Islamophobia together. And this is what made it so powerful and so violent. Uh, that's what we need to really uh, uh, be clear about um, and, and, and stop. Yeah. Uh, wow. A lot to mm -hmm. think about today. Uh, Professor John, Professor Ann Lee, would you like to add to this? No, it's all very well said. Um, this is uh, pernicious, to say the least. Professor John? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we. I'd only add that um, we need to be careful when banning speech uh, because then it can those those bans can be used against people who are trying to uh, protect speech and to protect uh, people that are uh, oppressed. So I'm I'm very cautious about that. You know, when it comes to things like accusations of anti-Semitism, accusations of being pro-terrorist. Um, you know, when we try to ban language, uh, that can often backfire, and it can be those those prohibitions, those that kind of censorship can be used against people uh, in a way that was not anticipated. Right. But I guess that's a topic for another conversation. Uh, Rand Paul is delaying the forty billion dollars in aid to Ukraine. Just thought I'd bring that up. That's what's coming in right now. Thank you, Professor Marianne Cummings. Thank you, Professor Adnan Hussein. Thank you, Professor Ann Lee. Thank you, Professor Jonathan Bick. I can't, I'm very appreciative for this conversation. I was gonna introduce Professor Harvey J.K. and Alan Minsky, but we have to go to Joe in Norway for ASMR for your eyeballs. You need more time. Usually you, you, ah, oh, and raw, this is raw food and you need more time. Interesting. Professor Harvey Baking. J.K. Joe. Baking is my Achilles heel. It's going to take me a little bit longer. But you're not baking. It's raw food. <laughs> yeah. Just the whole idea threw me for a loop. Do you have any idea what that pie would cost in New York City? Uh, That's like a $50 pie. Are you looking at that, Professor Harvey JK? It's it's raw cashew pie. What 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 do you call this? Uh, this is this is a um 
almond crust with with cashew and green tea, matcha powder. That's wrong. So I'll I'll press out the the crust and then I'll pour in the pie and then throw it in the freezer. And then when you're ready to serve it, you just pull it some hours out and how much sugar? How much very sugar? thinly? It's very rich. How much sugar? Um, about eight tablespoons of it was supposed to be agave syrup, but I just used a regular, regular sugar. And how much oil? So, uh, 62 grams, not including what's in the nuts. So we got we got who's nuts. <laughs> These nuts have <laughs> enough protein. We'll have enough protein for our. <laughs> That's when we take to the streets, we're going to scream, whose street, our street, whose nuts, these nuts. That's how. Uh... Oh, thank you. You're too kind. Uh, anything else you want to tell us? This is torture. Torture, Joe. You're torturing no, me. No, I'll, I'll come in at the end and I'll, I'll give you a okay. shout out. And is Dave in PA here with his, with Chad? Or, I guess not. And my apologies to DPA. To what? My apologies to Dave. Or you can just come back. I don't think Dave in PA is this. here. Oh, well then I'll, I'll take his spot. Okay. Well, it's time now for Professor Harvey J.K. and Alan Minsky. They are together again. I'm going to talk over this with all due respect to Professor Mike Steinell because we're running a little behind schedule. It's hard. It's hard. I can't talk over it. That's okay. Don't. That's okay. Professor Harvey J. K. is author of Take Hold of Our History. Go buy this book. If you don't like it, I'll reimburse you. It's got the Feldman promise. Go, go read, take hold of our history. Pick up FDR on democracy. Pick up the fight for the four freedoms. And this fall, we'll be publishing and promoting, not publishing, promoting Professor Harvey J.K.'s very first book, a study of British Marxist historians. So that... That will be amazing. We're celebrating the reappearance of the British Marxist historians. Okay. And, and before I forget, since I saw Rodrigo popped in there, on the, I think it was on the chat, um, but I, I have tried again, Rodrigo, to uh, bring Nomiki Konst on tonight, but she begged off for tonight. She said she's exhausted, but she promises very soon she will not pass up the invitation. So hopefully soon. She saw the, she saw the show. <laughs> hey, I, very quickly, I have a note here. I want to thank Todd from Tucson for uh, his super chat. Thanks for all the great things, says Todd from Tucson. And I want to welcome our new mods. We have new mods in the YouTube chat room, and they come to us from the Majority Report. Autumn Leaves. M Autumn Leaves, my buddy, Autumn Leaves. M. Toussaint. Toussaint, yes, indeed. I know them well. Midi Doctors. Uh, Jesus, what a crew. Ro Bob Carmondi. And S. Scout hmm. uh, is not a Majority Report mod, but is a mod here, I believe. So thank you all. So the mods outnumber the actual people who are watching us? Yes, and even the mods don't watch us. It's just basically you and me. This is like a really bad Twilight Zone episode. You, me, and Alan, and I cut you off before you introduced Alan. Alan, but he's, eating, but he's eating anyhow. Oh, he got the memo. We're trying to improve the sound, and we got... Uh, we're trying to Alan Minsky is executive director of Progressive Democrats of America. He is a lifelong activist who has worked as a progressive journalist for the past two decades. And there's so much to talk about, so much to talk about what happened Tuesday in Nebraska and West Virginia. And we can revisit what happened in Ohio, if you want, on if you if you would like and then we can talk about next week 
Let me ask you. Tell me. I, I want to make sure I know what I'm talking about. What, what happened in West Virginia? The. The I think Trump's guy won. I think the mill. Who is it? Is uh, what's his name? Mansion actually uh, campaigned with a Republican to challenge Trump's support for this guy who actually won because he opposed the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Millhouse, what was the guy's name, Alan? Um, I, 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 what I do right now this time of year in this election cycle is I focus on races that have progressives in them. And of course, I pay a little bit of attention to what's going on elsewhere. West Virginia, and other than the one congressional district in Nebraska, where we have almost no chance of winning. However, I am interested to see who comes out of the Democratic primaries. Um, of course, in some state elections, but particularly in the federal elections. And um, I want to look to see who the um, who got the Democratic um, who's going to be running as the Democratic candidates in those two congressional right. seats, because they could be quite progressive. And then we would endorse them for the general. We weren't going right. to put a lot of energy into it. Let me primaries. just clear this up. And what, there actually was a little bit of good news out of West Virginia behind the scenes, you might say. And that is the Democratic Party had elections to its council. And apparently the mansion folks were defeated in many areas of the state. Uh, the fellow I was talking to uh, lost election, but he had a, it. They have all these strange rules that you can only have a certain number of people from a certain number of count, you know, certain counties and all that. He may yet get, make it up in, by way of a not large seat. But the point he made was that he felt good because the mansion folks looks like they're being driven out of the party. That may, of course, drive him out of the party. But it, he, he said he came away feeling pretty good about his fellow party members. This is West Virginia. Yes. Is there hope for a progressive in West Virginia when Donald Trump won the state by what was it, like 50 points? He beat Biden. Is there any hope for the Democrats? Even I know Bernie beat Hillary in West Virginia, but I mean, that isn't West Virginia a lost cause. Well, you know, when people say lost cause, it's undeniably a lost cause right now. And nothing's going to change there right now. It's more the case of whether or not, period, the Democrats, and I know Marianne Cummings is, is nodding her head yes when I ask this question, whether or not the Democrats are totally a lost cause or not, because increased progressive presence and increased possibilities of unseating leaders who are getting on in years may open doors. And in fact, if we could, it, progressive voices could win in a place like West Virginia, if if indeed they embrace a really significant, almost radical kind of uh, economic politics, I think. I mean, that, look, you're talking West Virginia, which was not not a Republican state, right? In the, okay, and um, you know, similarly, look at Wisconsin. I mean, I'm in a state that was always sort of purplish, okay, actually back in olden times, rather Republican, but they were progressive Republicans. And that's why the Democrats were able to stand on their shoulders and, and gain strength in the state. And then the, the Democrats for so long, how many times have I said this, for so long turned their backs on, well, for a start, on the working class, but equally they turned their backs on rural areas and together they lost the state. Look, the most probably the most Trump area of the state, the northwestern part of the state, which has like one congressman for a vast area that was held by a Democrat, Obi, for years. Um, it, I mean, it's look, the <laughs> this past couple of weeks has been tough, you know, <laughs> it's really been tough. No, all we did was lose the right to abortion. Nina Turner. The chance that we lost the chip, the one chance I think at, at most immediately of sending someone to Congress who could not who would not be suppressed and would not repress herself in the face of corporate Democrats. Alan Minsky, well, you're grimacing. Go ahead. Um, um, you know, it, it could get a lot worse as of uh, the upcoming elections on Tuesday. 
Yeah. Um, they basically deploy. Can I ask you to lean in? Do you mind? We're, yeah. I've been get, get, yeah. getting complaints about hmm. the sound on the show. So I've I, done so many so many interviews, and it seems only to be this show that it doesn't come through. Um, I'm going to put in the chat an article I wrote that was published today on Common Dreams about the race in Oregon's fourth. It's pretty disturbing just to begin with. But for what it's worth, the candidate featured in that article did not enter these last few weeks before the end of the Oregon voting period on the 17th um, as as the favorite. At no point was I think do I think that Doyle was the favorite. But we have Jamie McLeod Skinner, Summer Lee, Erica Smith, and Nita Alam, all of whom entered these final weeks of the election as the front runners. They are all Bernie Sanders left progressives. Okay. Um, and um, all they'd be exceptional um, additions to the U.S. Congress. Um, are any of them as forthright as Nina? Um, Summer Lee's close. She's pretty exceptional in that regard. She pretty much speaks her mind very clearly and relates why her positions are beneficial for the communities that she's been a part of her entire life and would be for the you know country and the world. She's great. Um, oh, did I mind posting that? Panelists only. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm what? sorry. I posted the panelists only. Let me put that link into everybody. There we go. Yeah. Um. And and so what's happening is the same strategy that defeated Nina Turner in Ohio is being used across these four districts in particular. In fact, um, the um, uh, American Prospect wrote the best summary article of what's transpiring about eight days ago or so. I'm going to put that link into the chat. All right. If every, you know, if you could stop everybody, I'm getting if everybody could focus on the audio and not type if, if it's possible. Okay. I'm getting because we, we had a meeting yesterday about the sound quality on the show. And we're asking that everybody just kind of not type because it. So if you don't mind. Sorry, wasn't typing, just copying, pasting and, and putting in the chat. Right. But that, that's and, a very important article because. What this is, is a concerted effort by big money, big money generally affiliated with the Democratic Party, though occasionally these people have supported Republican candidates too, but really, really, really big money uh, to knock out these four progressive candidates with massive ad buys, just like they did to Nina Turner back in August. So that is the template. I heard your previous segment, of course, DMFI and APEC are central to this. Right. Um, but so are some uh, PACs that are run by crypto bros, um, as well as some of these other packs. I mean, so they're up, we're so up against cryptocurrency and crypto fascists. <laughs> there we go. And um, but there's some other other packs like Team Blue, which is a Hakeem Jeffries, Hakeem Jeffries, Josh Geithanger pack. There's um, also the Third Way pack that went against Nina as well. But this is all taking place this upcoming Tuesday, and um, we have a chance of winning some of these still. There's no doubt. But if we lose all four. It's going to be devastating. So it's um, Jessica Cisneros in Texas. No, no, that's Tuesday. That's the following. That's Tuesday. Nita Alam in North Carolina, which you haven't. And then Summer Lee in Pennsylvania. Summer Lee and Erica Smith are veteran um, veterans of their state legislatures. Um, Summer Lee in the House of Representatives in Pennsylvania, Erica Smith in the state Senate. They are both running against candidates. In Erica's case, a Democrat who is anti-choice. And in Summer's case, a Democrat who used to be a Republican worked as a Republican staffer and has endorsed publicly Republicans in recent election cycles this is a big swing. Kurt Schrader, very right wing Democrat up in Oregon versus Jamie McLeod Skinner. And then uh, Nita Lam, a chance to get a real great, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders uh, Democratic type advocate into the party as well. All four of them. There's no doubt that if we go into the next House cycle with these four in Congress, we will have a, a stronger squad, a stronger left anchor within the party. And if we don't, that's why these guys are funding this. And it's, it's totally the people against money. It's the plutocrats against the people straight up. And um, yeah, and the whole strategy that we have certainly a PDA of taking over the Democratic Party. Of course, Nina Turner is incredible, incredible, incredible. Um, but, um, you know, these are four seats. And How do we kick the plutocrats out of the Democratic Party? When are, Professor Kay, when are the Democrats going to do what Mayor Dinkins did in New York? When Mark Green was the uh, the public advocate 
here in New York. They wanted to ban Joe Camel ads. And he was working for Mayor Dinkins. And Philip Morris came to City Hall and they said to Mayor Dinkins, if you ban these Joe Camel ads, we're going to move our headquarters out of New York City. And Mayor Dinkins said, here's a dollar. I'll pay for your subway ride out of my city. When are we going to start saying to these people, get out of them, get out of my party and get out of my country? We don't need them. We really don't. Th th we've somehow this they've convinced us that we need the billionaires. If they take their money elsewhere, we'll be lost without them. We would be so much better off if Jeff Bezos took his billions and left. And we were able then to have legislation that protected the 99%. We don't need their billions. We can generate new billions without him. And we can take over Congress and then repatriate that MFers billions. Just take them, take it from him. When are we going to stop falling prey to the idea, this Ayn Randian idea that, you know, if we lose the billionaires, if they just take their ball or they give up, we're going to let them go. Let them leave the country. Go live someplace else. You hate America. Obviously, move and get out of my party. When are we going to kick these plutocrats? You can't be a Democrat if you're if you're a billionaire. It's if or you can be a Democrat, but shut up. You have no right to dictate policy. Why don't we money? But wait, I, wait a minute. Corporations are people. Yeah. And money is voice. Right. So we got I mean, I'm just stating a matter of legal fact right now. But the Democratic Party doesn't have to obey that. Right. That's right. That's right. Uh, by the way, everything you just said, I assume, was a rhetorical flourish because I, you're asking me to predict when that'll happen that was a plea on your part for it to happen i i don't have an answer well okay. let me let, i don't believe in accelerationism i don't believe things have to get so bad that people will finally come around and realize that they were wrong however there's a no in fact if that were true they would have we would have already seen the rebellion yes we get the resistance we would have seen a rebellion i mean i'm right look so i'm giving this talk tomorrow down in uh, the milwaukee area how can we save democracy okay and i mean it would have been easy to just say we can't and and take the hundred dollars or whatever it is they're going to give me but in fact i i sat seriously and i thought you know we, we have plenty of evidence this is the whole point of you know my work for too long now we have plenty of evidence as to how we can save democracy we've we've saved whatever is considered the american promise at the time a good three major historical moments we did it at the time of the revolution we did it during the course of the civil war and we did it in the course of the 1930s into world war ii okay and how do we do it well somehow americans this is an amazing thing to me americans founded in themselves actually to go radical in, despite all of their faults and failings all of their sins all the things they left undone in fact no, there's no denying what transpired it remains the case that somehow they transformed themselves from being loyal subjects of the british crown who were originally fighting to secure british rights and by way of you know we could explain it by way of thomas paine's pamphlet common sense and i do believe it made the historical difference it's the case that Americans somehow came to see they were Americans and that demanded a certain kind of action. And they literally stay. I mean, they staged a revolution for independence and at least the makings of a democratic republic. In the case of the Civil War, the nation divided. Right. Lincoln took up you know, the charge of, of sustaining the union. And what happened? Well, Southern slaves recognized that the Civil War afforded an opportunity and in mass, tens of thousands, at first hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands made their way to the Union lines and, you know, didn't quite beg, but demanded some kind of role in the war effort. And Northern soldiers who had come to the South, farmers and workers, saw how 
utterly abysmal the scourge of slavery was. And they realized, hey, this isn't about reuniting the house divided. This is about ending the scourge of slavery and creating freedom nationally. And then and and thus, you know, ensued the emancipation and the end of slavery in the 13th Amendment. And then during the, the Depression, a time where you'd imagine really radical change might not be possible. You found a president and uh, and working people determined to challenge the corporate powers that be and enacted by way of choosing their you know representatives and organizing labor unions, et cetera. They they enacted laws to enable them to rally, to give their labors to fighting the Great Depression. And they organized unions on a vast scale. I mean, we're talking about millions of workers and not just white workers, black workers and women entering into labor unions. And as a consequence, we eventually saw Social Security, the National Labor Relations Act, a rural electrification agency. I mean, innumerable transformations. We, we forget that was a revolution in the 1930s, not necessarily of the same sort as what we saw in the in the in the 1770s, or for that matter, the revolution that that ensued from the launching of the Civil War by the South. Well, it strikes me that we're surely in the same kind of crisis. We've been in this crisis long enough that one might have imagined that the movements that emerged, okay, I mean, I could dictate the movements. Look, there was a Wisconsin rising, in, followed by Occupy. There was the Fight for 15. There was the Moral Monday movement down in North Carolina. There was the anti-fracking, anti-pipeline movements. There, were the, there was the teachers struggle, the union, you know, the teachers union in Chicago, the teachers mass walkouts in West Virginia, was it Arkansas, Oklahoma, all the way out to LA at times. So, I mean, you know, but they didn't come together. We're lacking leadership. We also have a left that literally is spending more of its time worrying about clickbait to pick up money on YouTube than making political change. Right. Mm -hmm. So thus, when push comes to shove and I and eventually somebody asks me who is at fault, I'm going to say it's the Democrats and the left. Yeah. I I agree with you. What is it going to take, you know, 9-11, Pearl Harbor to to win the argument? What what does Amer what do Americans have to see? You know, Cronkite went to Vietnam and came home and said, that's it. What 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 do Americans have to see right now to turn their back on their oppressors and say, OK, I was wrong. You know, I'm not going to vote for corporate Democrats anymore. What has to be on our TV to get people to wake up? Um, no, there has to be nothing. No, there has to be nothing on our TV for people to wake up. Help, but uh, they yeah. just start watching their phones. Nothing on our phones. On our phones. No, I, 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 yeah, I, I get that. But what if we, if we covered, if we had a news media? That cover. Look, we discover. We just, you know, it's one of the. I'll tell you something. So I thought about that television question in a different way. So in my in the last ten years or more of my teaching out of the university, what I discovered was while all the social critics were blaming television and the media, my students didn't have any time to watch TV. My students were full time students, and they were working every evening at a job to be able to pay for their tuition. Okay. So in some ways, I'm reminded of an argument came out about 20 years ago that our biggest problem is drudgery. How do we how do we how can we liberate people from the general drudgery that they go through every day? OK, how can we spark them? Right. Mm hmm. How can we spark them now? What we've seen this past year has so many possibilities. Think about this. OK, I mean, you know, you can it, at times we grasp at straws, right? We grab at the straws. But Chris Smalls took on the biggest corporation I've ever, you know, one could imagine and organized diverse immigrant groups as well as American blacks and Latinos, right? And whites into, in, and into believing they could give the finger to Jeff Bezos and Amazon, right? Now, what 
and I understand, I I still insist, no labor movement, forget the left, forget changing the Democratic Party. I agree. But but we other than the true progressives like Sarah Nelson and others, the labor movement has not fully embraced the Chris Smalls thing. Okay. Um, and we've had lots of these things during this past year when the, you know, was it Kellogg's workers went out and workers all across the country. Did we see some kind of mass support? Now, I, you know, sympathy strikes may well be illegal, but you, at a certain point you say, fuck it. Half the things that big half, most of the things that big corporations are doing are all illegal or at least unethical and immoral. So, you know. So in when it comes to Starbucks, Howard Schultz is back. He's the CEO of Starbucks, multi-billionaire. Yeah. Howard Schultz has been fighting unionization. So far, 64 Starbucks across America have voted to go union. But Howard Schultz doesn't recognize these unions. They challenge the votes. He he breaks the law. A, a Starbucks in, in Memphis, Tennessee voted to go union. So Howard Schultz fired the seven union organizers. The it national- happened today in Wisconsin. One of the organizers of one of the Starbucks that succeeded in, in a good in a vote was fired. Was fired. That's yeah. Howard Schultz, who ran for president briefly in 2020. They That's are Howard fi- Schultz, who once upon a time was considered a damn good employer because he afforded his work, the workers at Starbucks opportunity. They could reach in and grab some health care. Well, he's breaking when, the law yeah. when the National yeah. Labor Relations Board certifies an election. You have to go union and you cannot, cannot fire anybody for organizing. And the NLRB said you have to rehire these seven union organizers who you fired in Memphis, Tennessee. And Howard Schultz said, well, we're going to challenge it in court. We don't recognize the the NLRB. We're going to take this to a judge. Now, I can't remember all the details of it, but I have to tell you, back in 1944, the head of the Montgomery Ward Corporation resisted. OK, in that fashion. And FDR ordered federal troops to to to, to arrest him and, and jail him. Well, I'd like to see Biden. Let, let him let him charge whatever they want. Let, how, you know, Biden brought Chris Smalls and some of the organizers into the, into the White House. You got to love it. OK, he just, yeah, he's all he's the Starbucks the limited liability corporation company is in the LLC. So it's not really Schultz who's accountable. He's a, it's right? a publicly held corporation. Right. And he, he's right. back Probably in as CEO or so. president, whatever. So what? what he, he well, I don't think I don't think he'd be I don't think he'd be considered legally accountable as a person. It's the company that's accountable, right? Uh, executives of corporations can be civilly charged and criminally charged for violating laws. And the, they problem start- is, the problem is, Alan, you see, you figured if Obama didn't go after the bankers, it must not have been possible to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you um, one thing people should do. I'm just saying I don't think I don't think that he'll end up in the in, of in course handcuffs over this. He doesn't recognize the United States. Howard Schultz, the CEO of <laughs> Starbucks, says, I don't recognize the National Labor Review Board. I don't like their decision. So I'm, I, we're taking it to the courts and we're going to tie it up for hundreds of years in the courts. Hey, Howard Schultz set up a corporate responsibility department over at Starbucks. He wants to keep the conversation going to make sure that Starbucks is a responsible citizen. 800-782-7282 is their hotline. Keep the conversation going. Call (laughs) Howard Schultz's Corporate Responsibility Department, 800-782-7282. And if you're thinking of, you know, you need a jolt of caffeine, go into Starbucks and write a note that says, I will no longer be supporting Starbucks until Howard Schultz steps down and Starbucks recognizes the unions and stops firing union organizers. I'm telling you, that will give you a bigger jolt than any coffee drink 
at Starbucks. I wouldn't step foot in a Starbucks. They're anti-union. Which side are you on, boy? Which side are you on, Howard Schultz? You're not on the side of unions. I'm not giving you a penny. You mean to say you wouldn't go into a Starbucks where they've success where they've successfully organized? They've successfully organized, but Howard Schultz won't negotiate. Same thing with the Amazon warehouse, where Christian won. They're not negotiating a new contract with the Amazon labor union just because they vote to rec- just because the workers vote to recognize the Starbucks workers union. That doesn't guarantee oh, that I, I, I realize that Howard I, Schultz is not negotiating with the I, unions. I don't, I don't He's firing into, them. I don't walk into an I can't walk into an Amazon and walk out with a coffee in here. But I, OK, so people, if you're pro union, I would not go to Starbucks until they start recognizing. Well, 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 what I would recommend there, David, actually, and I mean this sincerely, because the, the thing I said about Schultz, of course, he's a bastard, but I'm sure his lawyers have told him he has no personal accountability in the structure of the corporation. He has no accountability to anybody other than himself. No, he has accountability to a corporation that is structured to maximize profit for its shareholders, yada, 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 all that crap. I'm saying that, it, you know, there's structural issues here, not just, you know, a bad actor in the case of a guy who's probably serving the interests of the Starbucks board, right? Um, so, um, um, and they all have board insurance on down the line. This is one of the reasons this happens the way it does in America, too. But um, you could, you could you know, lock not, up you, there if you have you, there's no insurance against a, a, a prosecutor who wants to press criminal charges. Again, I, you have to look into the legalities of it, but I, there's, I, no, I, such I, I think th- there's no such thing as the law in the United States. It's all prosecutorial discretion. If you had a Justice Department right. that right. wanted to right. protect the National Labor Relations Board, they would find a reason to criminally charge Howard Schultz. I I agree with that. I agree with that. But there's, you know, there's, look, the courts are what the courts are. And and I'm sure the the reality of what we have to defeat is more than Schultz, right? In the case, it can be good for a publicity campaign to make Schultz the villain here. But I think we also have to, we have to look at what we're looking at in the the massive, uh, you know, service economy corporation like Starbucks in the United States and what the power dynamics are in terms of what we have to overcome to support the efforts of workers to unionize. Look, um, um, what was the other question you raised that, that, uh, cause I was also going to jump. Why are in you afraid to demonize horrible people like Howard Schultz? Because he is an interchangeable part. It can help or hurt a campaign. Now, I remember I was going to say, here's the thing about what you're saying. I'd recommend, and I, I really do recommend this is to go now to the SEIU backed, um, Starbucks workers United group and bring them on to um, to ask their advice. And, and, and but bring your bring your, your ire to them. Don't be shy about it. Say, I am so pissed, this pisses me off. Howard Schultz is the absolute jackass of the universe. I can't stand the guy, I blame him. I blame the board of Starbucks, the whole structure. But what do you want us to do? Because I don't think they're calling for a boycott right now. Well, I, am. I don't care what the union says. I'm telling you, go oh, into Starbucks. Star- if it makes you feel morally and ethically good, you boycott them. I, I, I would go oh, into yeah, a Starbucks and leave a note that says you don't get a penny from me until you stop firing union organizers. Yeah, that's about as good as as uh, walking to the over to the window, opening the window and shouting out. I've had enough. Oh, let me try that, too. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, you got to be attentive. By the way, to the audio. by the way, the audio, audio, David. as long as I've reached the absurd, I think we should all vote for Josh Hawley. So that he can break up big tech. Yeah. All right. Uh, You know, we're not a team in terms of labor and management. It has to be an adversarial relationship between labor and management. We don't work together. We work against one another. And you need a government, you need leaders in the government who protect labor. It's not a team. Management and labor do not work together. They don't, not in America. No, no, of course not. I mean, Jesus Christ, of course not. No, I think, I think you're, prob- David, you're probably right. I mean, just thinking through it, you know, just right now, it sounds like Schultz is, it would, as, as, 
you know, for his villainy would be a good organizing tactic to highlight what he's doing. He, and what he's saying. The name Howard Schultz should be synonymous with right. the Rockefeller and the Pinkerton guards. You have to demonize the name Howard Schultz because this MF -er only cares about his branding and tries to he is Mr. Woke. You know, he for a guy who makes caffeinated beverages, he works way too hard to appear woke. He is so full of shit. And you need to you need to demonize him until he bends to our will. You need to remind everybody that Starbucks uses child labor. They have eight year old kids in Guatemala getting 50 cents an hour picking coffee beans. And you keep repeating that over and over until Howard Schultz drops to his knees and says, forgive me, I will honor the National Labor Relations Board and do what I'm told. You need to break his spirit and will. And that requires all of us to scare Howard Schultz to scare his bottom line. There is no other way to deal with these people other than to intimidate them financially, to demonize the name Starbucks. Why are we being wishy-washy about this? They're not on my side. They're anti-union. All I'm, all I'm challenging here, first of all, is there is the question of the legality of Ralph Schultz, which I think I'm probably correct about. But then other than that, that doesn't really matter. The, what I'm wondering is, again, creating um the, the focus it's it's just a balance is it advantageous for the cause of of supporting not just this union drive but union drives across the board i think you're on point this is a huge moment where we have to propel Bill Sh Starbucks, if, if william Starbucks shatner in, william shatner right. flies in one of jeff bezos's missiles he's the enemy uh, Scarlett Johansson and Colin Jost do a commercial for Amazon. They're the enemy. This is also a cultural revolution where the 99% demonizes the toadies and the flunkies of the 1%. Which side are you on, boy? Of course, of course, of course, of course. But it is, is when Schultz then gets replaced and Starbucks replaces Schultz because he's been so vilified and so de demonized, right? He's not in the same analogous situation as Bezos anymore, right? I know he was involved in starting the company and maybe started the company, but he's not the you know, owner of it in the same way that Bezos is, right? So total war, total what? war, Alan, I, I, peaceful, what? but total war, peaceful, no, but, but total war. You get in the way of a union. We destroy your your family name. We destroy your fortune. It's the only way peaceful. No riots, no bullets, no violence, but total war. You get in the way of a union, total war, because that's what they're waging against us. Okay, peace, if you keep that, peace, is, if you keep that, no if you violence. Keep that, if you keep that is the clarity of what you're driving at when you're vilifying Schultz and not making it about him, not giving the impression that this one bad apple going away will everything will be fine when he's gone. That's what I'm worried you're doing too much with the focus on Schultz and the personalization of it to that degree. But Ad hominem. Keep... You have to attack these people personally. You have to make their children ashamed of their parents. You have to you have to isolate these people and and make the Bezos name synonymous. Hey, Ali, Hitler, total war against these people. They're murderous. They destroy <laughs> lives. They just fired seven union organizers at Starbucks. That's total war. That's seven lives. Do you know what Christian Smalls is going through? He was fired by Amazon. He's broke. They're waging total war against Christian Smalls. Where where's our side protecting Christian Smalls and the seven uh, union organizers who got fired from a Starbucks in Memphis, Tennessee? That's total war. Those are seven lives that can't that that are probably blackballed from other uh, coffee shops and, and fast food places. It's total war against those seven people. I have no sympathy for Howard Schultz. I hope he loses all his money and ends up living on the street. I would sleep very well if Howard Schultz 
and Jeff Bezos had to check into a homeless shelter. I believe in total war, peace, no violence, but you use every law at our disposal to engage in total war against these union busting monsters. They're monsters. I don't want to understand these people. Well, again, I agree with all that. Love My it. underwear just... is very tight tonight. <laughs> <laughs> look, it, look, it's a hugely important union drive. There's no doubt it's a groundbreaking union drive. I think it's more, it, it is even more sort of public facing than the Amazon organizing. And so um, it obviously is. Uh, okay, I found what I was looking for. Okay. I guess it's uh, 94. Roosevelt acted in a telling moment. He showed his solidarity with solidarity with labor by ordering armed U.S. soldiers to take over the Montgomery Ward Corporation. The reactionary chairman, Sewell Avery, who refused to recognize his workers union and repeatedly ignored National War Labor Board settlements, was forcibly removed from his office and the secretary of war was tasked with seizing company plants and facilities in six states. When Sewell sued the government in federal court, he lost. I remember this in the fight for the four freedoms. You wrote about just, that in the fight. For I just went to find the exact case, right? It, is it, were you reading from the fight for the four freedoms? Yeah, right. I know the guy who wrote that book. I used to know him well. Um, yeah. I believe in peace. I believe in nonviolence. I believe in obeying the law. Bezos breaks the law. Howard Schultz breaks the law. They destroy the lives of union organizers. We are not going to win this thing unless we engage in total war with the oligarchs. The same applies to abortion. The reason we are losing the right to an abortion is their side wants to eliminate abortion entirely. Their side secretly wants to arrest all abortion doctors and women. Their side has been violent. They blow up abortion clinics. They blow up abortion doctors. They, they assassinate abortion doctors. Our side we can't even say we're pro-abortion. We say oh, we're pro-choice. We're squeamish. We're wishy-washy. If you're squeamish and you're wishy-washy. By the way, I, I don't think the term pro-abortion helps it helps the case at all. I do. Well, I, I think you're really wrong and you're part of the problem. Thank you. I respect <laughs> that. No, I'm, I'm quite serious. OK, I, I think that's I think you want to win. You want to win. You've got to be able to speak in a way that wins, not not in a way that literally just stakes out your position and lets others take shots at you. Well, but that kind of thinking gave us safe, legal and rare. That's what I want from a stake, not an abortion. I was about to say, it sounds, sounds like a stake. You're <laughs> I, I mean, you're either that, for. I was saying, wait a minute, you're you're a vegetarian. What are you talking about? We, 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 there's nothing polite your deal. Uh, what was his name? Santorum? I'm not asking for politeness. I'm asking for the fact of understanding that there are people who will take your side if you don't shock their sensibilities. We already tried that. It's not working. No, we haven't tried that. The Democrats did not try that. The Democrats didn't do anything. You could say that about anything. The Democrats didn't, didn't do, do anything. anything. Hmm. All right. OK, right. All right. Now, everybody realizes that I'm really a Republican. By the way, right? now I've recorded everything you said in my brain. And tomorrow when I'm telling them how to save democracy, I'm going to tell them march on Starbucks. These are going to be the 150 <laughs> retired teachers. They'll march on Starbucks. Now, you know that I've been hired by the CIA. I'm part of the Wolitzer program to... <laughs> To the pretend to, program? Yeah. That's old school. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm getting funded by the CIA to present as a leftist and then undermine the cause. You're doing a damn good job. Thank baby. you. <laughs> You're being funded by the 1970s CIA. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why we can't get people to infiltrate the pro-life movement and get them to publicly declare that all women 
should be arrested when they have a miscarriage. That we hold women accountable for miscarriage. We just start pushing the right as far to the right as we possibly can and, and expose them for who they are. They, they, wait, they, wait, a, wait, wait a second. Let, let's start with this fact. It doesn't fucking matter what you're saying, David. No offense. The fact is the majority of Americans agree with the left. That's the case. The better question is, why is it that the left fails to engage those people? That's the question. The right, the, the right is, you know, they're there. We know what they're about. Everybody knows what they're about. OK, keep in mind, a president who look, I mean, the, the guy is a piece of you know what, but a, a president who was not elected by a popular majority appointed justices to the Supreme Court because the Democrats for too many years turned their backs on their own base. Right. So the trick is not I mean, what we don't we don't have to worry about the majority of Americans. We have to worry in the sense of, you know, their support for the right. We have to matter. What has to matter to us is that the majority of Americans who agree with us don't support us. And what does that tell? What, do, by the way, that's rhetorical right now. But we can talk about that another time. What does that tell us? Right. You know, the Republicans in the 50s, they invented communists and blacklisted them and destroyed their lives. We, our side has been accused of blacklisting people. I never read the list. Why not have a blacklist? It, any lawyer who does business with an oil company, any advertising agency, anybody who works for an oil company. What about blacklisting anybody associated with the fossil fuel industry? You, what you need. Your questions are, are are utterly rhetorical because they had unity on the right and they had organizations and the left doesn't have that. Well, let's so hold start on, guys. Black hold, on, hold on. Yeah, yeah, hold on. I, this actually goes back to a little bit earlier in the conversation where I think Harvey said something about the left posting on YouTube to get clicks. Um, uh, love you, Harvey, but uh, I, I do have to take a little bit of issue with that. I mean, if you're doing that and you're posting on YouTube, for clicks, whatever, by whatever definition you are the left, you're not really the left. I mean, right. you know, what is right. the left? The left, in, in so far as the term is meaningful, means you are supporting and struggling for and pragmatically as best as you can working to achieve both the political empowerment and economic empowerment of the sure, largest sure. pool of right. people possible. Right. right. Okay. In the United States, why is it that we have this situation? Famously, there was a study, I think. Are was, you leaning uh, on your laptop? No, you're the only person who complains about my audio these days, so I don't get it. But I'm um, a perfectionist. OK, good. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, look, there's a very famous study that was done around uh, 2014, which showed that the, the only way that the majority of the population gets public policy passed that they want is when it coincides with the interests of the wealthy. Yeah. Okay. Right. That was so, two guys from Princeton, I think, did that. Right. And um, we're seeing that right now in these races, two in North Carolina, one in Pennsylvania, and one in Oregon. You can't get over the hurdle that's being established by about 50 people across the country who are blocking the election of these four people and basically perverting the democratic system in our representative democracy in these four districts. But they are clearly blocking people who have policies that are supported by the majority of their constituents, at least on, in the Democratic pool, and almost certainly the majority of their constituents and the majority of the country, and they're getting blocked. So what does the left not have that means it cannot achieve what you're talking about? It doesn't have, right now, it doesn't have the money or the organization. The organization, you'd need the money, but even if you had the money, you'd have to give it to the people who really were gonna create the best possible organization. You need a very unified, political formation that has very clear positions that at least in this operative all year every year and it alerts the public as to what it stands for and there's no confusion about it okay but let and me also on the, let me sidebar that and just tell you yeah. that what i meant by that was the utter what i was referring to was the utter lack of unity look when the republicans wanted to win 
they had somebody in Washington. What was it? Grover Norquist or whoever the hell is. I, I'm confusing my Norquist at a, on occasion. <laughs> and they sent they sent out talking points. They send out talking points so that this way, even if audiences might be limited in certain cases, the fact was that everybody was on the same right. page. Right. Ter- exactly. Just, That's what we need. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, they, have, they have incredible money to, to back that. And they also have media channels to communicate that. Right. We don't have adequate media channels to reach the masses. But if we're consistent and we have enough people involved, then I think we can get the message across the country in a pretty good way. Yeah. Genius also, I mean, and Bernie was. Have you ever? Have you ever? Have you ever? Been, have you look? I mean, you're you're the executive director of PDA. So listen, have you ever had a coalition of 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 groups meeting like uh, PDA, Our Revolution, DSA, Justice, you know, awesome. uh, the whole co- coterie? And have you ever been able to? And have you done that? Yeah, we meet. Uh, we meet on a few fronts. We meet when certain crises happen, and we meet around candidate support. But but has there is no, there is no consensus, no, if you like, primary agenda. I mean, I thought that's what our economic bill of rights was intended to do to try yeah, to provide. No, the only, first of all, the only rallying are- point for diverse forces on the left to go, you know, to to and and progressive candidates in particular to take a lead on this. I mean, all I meant when I said about that, you know, that's the left, what I'm referring to is that the media, the left media right now is not speaking coherently. We're they all each in their own way does a fine everybody does a fine show. Majority report does a great job. Uh, you know, you and I today recorded with Crystal and Kyle great show i was you know i mean all these folks are out there but there's there's just not the sense that we're all involved we talk about the progressive movement but i don't know what that progressive movement grover is. norquist said grover norquist yeah made every candidate make <laughs> make a pledge that i will never ever raise taxes that's what Grover Norquist did. I, I included that. I cited that along with the contract for America in the article, the third yeah. article that Harvey and I That's wrote. That's right. Yeah. Right. We cited and that. Exactly so that. so the, the left, the progressives need to pick one. Th- that was the genius of Bernie. He ran on Medicare for all. He ran on Medicare for all. That was the broadly than that. I'm sorry. What? He ran on wealth inequality, Medicare for all, money out of politics. This was his 2016 agenda. But it was Very- medic. But he had one major message: vote for me, and you'll get Medicare for all. The same way Bill De Blasio, when he ran for mayor, he ran on universal preschool: vote for me, and you'll get universal preschool. And he got elected, and Cuomo tried to f him on universal preschool because he wanted to undermine Bill de Blasio and Bill de Blasio beat him. And we got universal preschool here in New York City. It was a a signature issue. The Republicans have signature issues. We're going to lower your taxes. I'll vote for that, right? I'm an idiot. I'll vote for that. We don't have a signature issue on the left. Bernie was right. It's got to be Medicare for all. That's a winning message. It's got to be broader than that, but of course, Medicare for All is, is, is absolutely a foundation of it. Look, um, we do have to go broader than that, though, yeah. to yeah. make an impression right. that we're, we're, we're really working to create a better society broadly. Uh, um, for, many, for most people, probably the amount of labor they have to put in to just make ends meet in their lives is probably the most um, the thing that they want to see changed in the society. They don't want to have to work so hard for so little just to keep their heads above water. And they want to have a prospect of getting uh, prosperity in their lives. I would say that's the, probably the main thing that strikes about 75% of the population of what's gone askew here. Medicare for all, of course, is huge too. But um, I don't think you can leave out those general economic aspirations and worries. I have but, an economics um, question for you very quickly, and then we have to wrap it up. But this woke me up. This was like horseradish. So <laughs> we've, we've just discussed- You gotta add beat. Beats and beaches. And beats, and yes, yes. <laughs> We've just discovered that fiscal year 2022, which ends in October, I believe, we have reduced the budget deficit by $1.5 trillion. That all that government spending last year 
has resulted in a tsunami of revenue for the IRS. And they so far, Biden's budget deficit has been reduced by one point five trillion dollars. That's great. And just think if the rich had paid taxes. Too. And ju- exactly. What would it cost to have Medicare for all? That, it's about one point five trillion a year. Isn't that? About that, right? That's a good qu- point to end on. I got to go. Oh, I used to know that. Yeah. OK, sure. but the um, point but the point I'm making is when you give the American people, when you give the ninety nine percent a child tax credit, when you give them fourteen hundred dollars, eight hundred dollars, when you have a moratorium on student loans like we've had, when you pump money into the economy like the government did last year and you end up reducing the budget deficit by one point five trillion dollars so far, the year isn't over yet. What does that tell you about government spending? What does that tell you? It tells you I got to go. <laughs> I love both of no, you. Serge, I got to go because I, I got to get ready for tomorrow. tomorrow. I got to go down to Milwaukee. OK, thank you. Have Take a good care, time. Harvey. Good to see you. Yes. Before you go, Alan Minsky, pick up, uh, take hold of our history. What does that tell you about government spending vis-a-vis the budget deficit? Um, yeah, no. Um, if you put the money out into this, this classical, right, uh, what's it called, the Keynesian uh, multiplier effect obviously is 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 uh, in effect there, right? They spent the money, went into the pockets of people who needed to spend it, and they spent it. And what um, happens when you spend it? It produces more tax revenue, among other things. Right there, you go. Um, somebody did ask earlier in the chat um, that Bernie's introduction of Medicare for all. You were talking about Medicare for all was just symbolic and largely meaningless. It, it isn't actually. It's the first time it's been introduced in recent years since the 2016 Sanders campaign, for instance when Mitch McConnell was in charge of the Senate. So the prospect of more hearings and the prospect of all of us holding the Democrats in the Senate's feet to the fire about Medicare for all, it's really the first time we're going to go out and really achieve that. And people are going to be surprised to learn that a lot of um, their senators who they think of as progressives, like, for instance, both of the senators from the state of Washington do not support Medicare for all. Both of the senators from the state of Illinois do not support Medicare for all. Both of them from Minnesota do not support Medicare for all. In all three of those states, the Democratic uh, registered voters are um, heavily supportive of Medicare for all. So um, there's a use value in his introduction of it, very clear use value. I want to make that clear. Um, but um, yeah, actually, this is a good, show, great show, David. It got me thinking about a lot of things, so I appreciate it. Thank you. I love you, buddy. You gave me my start in radio. I, I owe you uh, a drink when I come out to Los Angeles. Thank you. And, and you owe me good audio. So thank you for that. Too. I'll tell you how to take care of that on my end. Hey, Emil, you guys have a great talk. OK, hey, thank you. Hey, Emil. Uh, hey, hey David, uh, Kathy, my wife is here. She really wanted to be part of this, but she's she's sick. And so she's not showing her. She's she's I know you're concentrating on audio. So she wants to give good audio, but not turn her camera on. So, I, hey, I would love to be able to do that. Uh, you, she's, you don't want to see me. <laughs> you don't want to trust me. You don't want to see me. Hi, Kathy. It's good to have you back. Hi, David. I apologize. I'm propped up in bed with the Kleenex and the hot tea and the crime shows on my streaming device. <laughs> uh, that's that sounds. Uh, well, I hope it's not. I hope you feel better. Let me introduce Emil Guillermo and Kathy. They're friends of mine dating back to before they were born. Uh, <laughs> Emil, we are zygotes, I think. Uh, Kathy is senior <laughs> vice president in the laboratory investigations department at PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Senior vice president in the laboratory investigations department at PETA. And Emil Guillermo Besides being a journalist, a columnist for the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, is host of the PETA podcast. So welcome. Thank you. This is one of my favorite subjects. I've got to wait one second. We're going to go to Joe in Norway. Joe, show Kathy and Emil what you made. 
Now, Emil, I cannot promise I didn't use any oil. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much protein and oil in these nuts. What nuts? Well, nuts are good. What? That's okay. Uh, what nuts? So, what no, nuts? No, it looks delicious. What is it? So, what I first made was uh, I, I prepped some beans for the weekend. So I just made black beans. I threw an onion and some cloves of garlic, cumin seeds, and oil and salt, and a chili pepper, dried chili pepper in the pressure cooker. And then I will have these for salads, soup, what have you, over the weekend. And then this one, uh, thanks to Dave on me, I emptied my bank account to make a, a matcha green tea cashew cream tart, I guess, with a almond crust. Ah, yes. So it's amazing. A, it's a no, no bake uh, cake or tart. So we'll throw this in the freezer for some hours and then bring it out when it needs to be served. So the green is matcha. Yeah. Oh, it sounds good. Very tasty. Okay. Well, I, I, I he's on the side of him? angels. He's on the side of angels. <laughs> Thank it, you, Joe. It looks Norwood. good, Joe. Looks good. Well, let's talk Kentucky Thanks. Derby. Yes. Uh, apparently, the guy who owns the winner uh, tweeted that Kamala Harris had some sexist comment about. Kamala Harris getting, I won't even retweet, we repeat the tweet, but it involved. Uh, but tell us about the Kentucky Derby and why it's bad. Well, the trainer that you're talking about really showed how high class he was with that comment. And then soon after made his account private because so many people were offended. So the Derby this year in some ways was very satisfactory because none of the top trainers won. And those top trainers all have multiple drugging violations and they have multiple violations of labor, wage theft and exploitation of workers who are in the U.S. on temporary visas. So in some ways, it was the best outcome for uh, those of us who care about the horses. In other ways, it's just as terrible as always. You've got a horse who lives in a stall 23 hours a day, gets taken out for about an hour a day, and then every now and then is taken out to a race, which they have no control over, and they get whipped on the way down the stretch, leading to the end of the race. And in this case, the horse got whipped or punched afterwards by the outrider who came to collect him so it was yeah. pretty typical kentucky derby in well, that well, way. Well, why would you I, it's all horrible but why after uh, well, well that, that was it that was the thing that made it different this year because yeah. after the, the and then look you got to set this up right uh, kathy though the horse came out of nowhere was the longest shot on the board 80 to 1 comes out of nowhere wins and beats Two favorites, pretty, you know, like they, you know, they, 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 the favorites looked like they were going to go in uh, one, two, in the stretch. But that's a really deep stretch in the Derby, and this horse, Rich Strike, literally comes out of nowhere on the rail to beat uh, Epicenter and Zandon, which, like I said, two of the uh, favorite horses to win it eighty to one. So now the horse gets gathered up. He wins. It should be a celebration. And then, Kathy, but explain what happens. There's an outrider comes up and starts punching the horse. Yeah, thanks for setting that up. Yeah. So right after the Kentucky Derby, NBC is thinking about getting that interview with the jockey. And this was an unknown jockey and an unknown horse, an unknown owner and trainer. And the person called an outrider who is a guy on another horse whose job is to go out there and grab hold of the horse's bridle and gather that horse in so that he can do the jockey can do an interview then with whoever's with NBC. And in this case, the horse was feeling, as you can imagine, a little bit keyed up. He just ran a mile and a quarter. He, he ran farther than any other horse because he had to move maneuver in and out. And he did it at this incredible blistering speed. And then he gets this jerky outrider who starts pulling on his chain underneath his bridle. And when the horse gets irritated at that, he starts hitting him. 
And the best thing from my perspective is that the horse did bite the guy on the leg. So I felt like that should be, you know, the picture for speciesism. If you go too far, you'll get bitten on the leg. That became the story. That became the media story, the secondary media story of the Kentucky Derby. So I don't follow horse racing. I have a close friend who wants to go up to Saratoga in New York and watch the the horses race. Do the horses know if they're winning or losing? Sure. They do know if they're winning or losing. But you know that most horses are on medication for ulcers because it's such a stressful thing that they do. They get very keyed up, very nervous. They're stressed out. They have all of these medications that they're given and and they're kind of nervous wrecks a lot of the a lot of the time. But they they do know that they're winning or or not winning and they try hard and they get hit with a whip for for trying hard. It, do they want to win because they're afraid of getting whipped? Is that how you how do you get them to how do you incentivize a horse to win? Yeah, that's a really good question. They, some of them, I think, just really want to go to the head of the pack and they really want to win. But, you know, horses are herd animals. This is not a normal thing for them to run away from other horses. And for that reason, it's a it's a behavior that has to be taught to them. And it's done illegally sometimes with electric buzzers to shock them when they get when they want them to speed up certainly done with whipping in order to yes incentivize them would would be the word for it are there alpha horses who want to be the leader of the pack sure there are there are all different kinds of so there's something in innate horses. so would you say that is racing something natural that you see among herds of horses they race to establish how do you establish dominance as a horse now, they don't race to establish dominance. They do run. That is a natural behavior. They do run, and they usually establish dominance by the stallions fighting it out with each other to see who's going to be in charge of the herd. So racing doesn't come natural to them. It, it doesn't. And no matter how many times people in racing tell you, oh, we love our horses, this is what they love to do. No, this is what they've been forced to do from the time they were a year and a half old. How emotionally sentient are horses? Any woman who falls in love with their horse usually comes from a broken marriage. Every woman I know who's ever loved their horses uh, had uh, problems with their their father. Uh, Bruce Springsteen and Michael Bloomberg maybe are outliers i think they but uh what is this connection that women have with like the queen with her horses what is this you know i wish i could explain it i i certainly had it when i was younger you had had horses are are your parents divorced they weren't when i was younger they got divorced when i was about 20. yeah that's my Uh, theory yeah all women who love horses uh, and get an emotional connection to horses come from a broken marriage. But they're what really is, remarkable animals in why? the sense that they're so sensitive to humans. They're so tolerant of what they do, of what we do to them. They they really put up with a lot from people. And what's in and, it and for they're them? remarkably what's in intelligent. What's in it for a horse to to have that connection? Well, that's a good question. Too often, I don't think there's a whole lot in it at all for a horse. Uh, They they have a home. Uh, You you know, horses can jump over fences, but when they live on farms and they're out in pasture, they rarely do that because they understand it's their home and they like to be in their home. They get food and they do seem to, many of them really enjoy human companionship. I used to ride horses and I wouldn't do that anymore. I've come to think that putting that metal bit in the horse's mouth and making him do what I want him to do is not really a cool thing anymore. Yeah, I never enjoy it when that's done to me. The, (laughs) the, like a dog or a cat, even a pig, you can cuddle with. You can't, can you lie down on the ground and spoon with a horse? 
You can, yes. If you've got a horse who's been raised properly. I used to go out in the field with my horse and I would just, you know, no bridle or no saddle. I would just sit on top of him and stretch out on top of him. And he was just remarkably tolerant and affectionate of that. So they can be very affectionate to humans. I think the sad thing is most people don't take the time to get to know a horse's personality. They have a horse for a purpose. They show horses, jump horses, play polo, uh, race. You know, there are not that many people that really take the time to get to know them as individuals. See, and that, that's a, the difference. I, I require a saddle. Some of the horses can't. Do it. But I require one. I'm sorry. That's so what, what are the chances of getting rid of horse racing? It seems like we should. Well, it's on its way out. It's been decreasing in popularity for a long time. And I think if we stopped supporting it, especially in New York State, we're working to end the subsidies that prop up horse racing in New York State, because you probably didn't know that $230 million of state funds go to support the 11 horse racing tracks in New York State. And this is an industry that's required under the state constitution to provide a profit for New Yorkers and does not. But these laws have been passed by people who had influence from people in the horse racing industry. They are very opaque. There's really been nobody in charge of of making sure that the state gets what it needs to out of this. And so we've uncovered this and we've put together a coalition of human rights and animal rights groups. We work with Alliance for Quality Education and Worker Justice Project, Live on New York, New York Communities for Change, Strong Economy for All. And all of us have the single goal of making sure that that money doesn't go to support racing, but goes back into education where the the video slot machine money was meant to go in the first place. Right, right. Yeah, now, David, keep in mind, $230 million a year subsidizing uh, the racing and Naira, which owns all these tracks, uh, they're essentially a publicly funded entity. And, and, and it's all coming out of the taxpayer dollars on top of the $230 million. This is what keeps racing alive. And when you think about the Kentucky Derby kicking off the Triple Crown, well, what is the final race of the Triple Crown? It's the Belmont later on in June. And, uh, you know, this is a sport of, from a bygone era that has no relevance now. And uh, you, you look at the, the, what, what the horses have to go through racing a mile and a quarter at the Derby. They've got to come back and race in the Preakness in Baltimore and then finish off with a mile and a half in New York. The winner of the Kentucky Derby, the 80 to one shot is not running in the Preakness. And I don't know, Kathy, do you think maybe it's just they're infirm or why do you think, I mean, the, the grueling kind of, uh, you know, tr- the, the, the races that they have to go through now, the breeds, the breed just is not strong enough to withstand the kind of uh, test that you say, you know, that horses used to be able to run through, say, 30, 40, 50 years ago. But now, I don't know, I, I, it, it's too hard. It's cruel. It, it is. And, and yes, you're right. I think that the owners of this horse decided they were going to give him a break because to come back after a race like that after two weeks, very, very hard on the horse. So we, we do think that's good. But, you know, you, you bring up, David, you talk about the tracks in New York and Saratoga. Saratoga is possibly the one track where people visit it. At Belmont, you might see people on the Belmont Stakes weekend. But I mean, really, if you want some alone time, you should go to some of the tracks in New York. We were out taking pictures in the last week of Yonkers and Saratoga Harness and Monticello. And I, I kid you not, there were more horses than human beings there. Right, but there were vi- at one track, seven but, people. Right. But the casinos a, use video for their sports book. That's right. The casinos that are affiliated with these tracks. And that's where the money's coming from. I don't think the casinos are that crazy about it anymore. But the casinos are not at the tracks. And you go you go to the tracks and you see uh, that this is an industry that would be in real trouble if New Yorkers weren't supporting it with money that should be going elsewhere. And the deaths of the horses. There was an epidemic last year of horses. And there is every year. 105 horses last year in New York State died. 105. 1,600 horses since 2009 in New York State alone. And what are they it's dying a, from? What it's are they carnage. Dying from? What, what, what are they dying from? 
primarily broken bones. And this is something that we worked with officials in California and we've we've been able to turn it around to some degree. It's not perfect. It, it will probably never be perfect. And that's why horse racing is has lost so much popularity. But these horses are kept on this regimen of medications and they're legal medications, anti-inflammatories, muscle relaxants, uh, tranquilizers, um, thyroid medication, even if they don't have a thyroid disease. And these make the horse very vulnerable because they cover up soreness and they cover up injury. So a horse may be injured, may have micro damage in his bones, but you're not seeing it on the horse because he's, he's full of drugs. And then he gets out there on the track and that bone snaps. And that's invariably what it is. 90% of the horse deaths are broken bones. And but, these horses, they, they think that they're, they're, you know, they're all keyed up, they're ready to run. The drugs are the only thing that makes them, you know, it gives them the ability to run. And then when the drugs wear off, they get sore, they break down. Sometimes it doesn't work, you know, even on the track. And this Kentucky Derby was also important because the maybe the face of racing trainer Bob Baffert was banned from the Kentucky Derby this year. And why? Because last year's winner Medina Spirit was disqualified because of a drug infraction that that uh, they they put on uh, uh, trainer Bob Baffert. I mean, that's that was really the significant thing about this year's race, that the face of racing, NBC, all of racing had to acknowledge, you know, the, the one of the key members of its community, the, the most famous one, is a villain. And... That is so often the case. I mean, you look at somebody like Chad Brown, trainer Chad Brown, who's mostly located in New York, but had a horse in the Kentucky Derby. And in 2019, he settled a lawsuit with the Department of Labor for $1.6 million for violations of labor laws. Wage theft is common. And worker visa, in Chad Brown's case, it was that he brought workers in from other countries in on the temporary visas. And then there are ways to manipulate that. You know, you say to them, uh, if you want to stay here, you got to take what I pay you. And then I'll figure out a way for you to stay here. And it's that kind of manipulation puts the workers in a, in a terrible position. So you've got, you know, th- this is what finally got me about New York racing is why are we paying for the exploitation of humans and the abuse of animals? Why, why are New Yorkers paying for that? It's just crazy. Right. What about the argument that while it's very violent for the horses, sometimes it's the only way out of the ghetto for them? And that traditionally, you know, each type of breed, you know, it's the Arabian horse, we're known for horse racing, and then they rose through it, and then the Appaloosa became, it's like, you know, it's just a, a transitional Job How about, for, don't forget the mule races. There were mule races <laughs> and camel races sometimes at these racetracks when they're they're desperate to come up with some kind of novelty. That, I'm just like, saying it's when you you know it's part of the American story. The Dutch warm blood yeah. was a racehorse, and then the the Dutch worked their way out of the ghetto, and then suddenly it was the the Mustang that became a race. I'm sorry. I'm just it's so depressing. <laughs> it's so de- why can't we just outlaw this stuff? Nobody's making money off it. Who so who That's who, right. who is making money off the, this? The racing lobby's huge, David. The, I, well, it's it's, it's, a, it's a sport of at the higher levels, it's a sport of the wealthy. And this is what's so offensive about somebody like Chad Brown, who gets more than a million dollars in COVID funds, uh, you know, COVID funds, while he's paying off back wages to workers he cheated. But he races for millionaires, and it's a great tax write-off for millionaires. It's a it's a game of wealthy people, and that's I think pretty much how they got all those favorable laws passed in New York. It's a game that wealthy people enjoy, that doesn't create jobs or wealth for Americans, even though we end up subsidizing it. 
That's right. And one of the claims, one of the really offensive claims of the racing industry is that it has this huge economic impact. They claim $3 billion economic impact and 19,000 jobs in New York. The turns out that study was paid for by the racing industry, done by a horse group and has, you know, no details like where are these jobs and well, what do they pay? And you know, is it part time or full time? A lot of dead horses. That's good for the economy. You have to remove them, bury them, you know. Well, that's, you know, it's it's ironic when, when you say something like that. You know that the horse racing in New York gets more funds than the Department of Agriculture gets. That That is another problematic industry, but does actually provide jobs. Well, according to Chipotle, dead horses is agriculture. I don't that's know if you've right. eaten a Chipotle yeah. recently, but. Yeah, uh, in Europe, yes. <laughs> or hey, don't forget also that a lot of horses from the racetrack they get shipped overseas even the champions they get shipped overseas japan korea well, how, do, how do we compare in terms of cruelty to horses here in america well we're on the lower end of being humane for sure we're right down there with australia and I think it's problematic just about everywhere. But you see rules that benefit the horses a great deal more in some other countries. Uh, Hong Kong is known, strangely enough, a small racing industry, is known for having pretty decent laws to protect horses. Uh, and England, very problematic, but better than the United States. And Abu Dhabi, problematic, but better than the United States. I think one of the issues we have here is the, is the drugging. It's simply not tolerated in most other countries. And here, it's a way of doing business. And they call them chemical horses. Tell them about the whipping laws, too. I mean, they, they had tougher whipping laws, and then they went back on them. Indeed. Well, they're they're trying they're trying to. We've worked very hard over the last decade to get rid of the whipping or to make it at least uh, I don't it's never tolerable, but less fewer whips. Uh, and we also worked very hard to pass federal legislation that would put one body in charge of the drug enforcement in the United States. It was supposed to be the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency, but as often happens in horse racing, those talks with USADA broke down, and now they're going back on the racing, on the whipping issues, too. So in North uh, New Jersey, where whipping was not allowed at all, it will again be allowed. And in California, where we work to reduce it, it will again be allowed in greater number of strikes so when you're watching horse racing you're watching animals being tortured horses are not endemic to the united states that's my understanding that they didn't come from here originally that they were brought from somewhere else probably spain and uh, and then various breeds were, were brought from other countries yes right horses aren't endemic to the united states and neither is compassion this is a brutal, this is a brutal country. Well, I would love having you come back. I love PETA. I do. Oh, uh, thank you. I uh, fell off the vegan wagon, and for reasons I don't want to go into, I was eating ice cream. Ice cream is evil. They, they make vegan <laughs> ice cream, David. That's even better than the real stuff. How can you? I know, I, but for, I don't want to go into detail. Okay, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. We were eating ice cream for reasons that I don't want to go into, and it is murder on my digestion, and yeah. it is, and you can't stop. The way they make ice cream is they pump it filled with oxygen, and it's this combination of salt, sugar, and fat and you just, I can't stop eating it. It's Yeah, that's eat a whole science now, isn't yes. it? That taste. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah well, you, you mentioned Starbucks earlier. We have been haranguing Starbucks about the surcharge. And Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney and James yeah. Cromwell crazy glued his hand. What did James Cromwell do? He did. He super glued his hand to a counter, a Starbucks counter in New York. And James Cromwell is a true activist. He's been arrested many times uh, with protests or PETA. And I, I use that as the example of how you can never predict what media will cover.
because we released very serious investigations this week about monkeys in laboratories and what got all the coverage was james cromwell super gluing his hand but it's exactly as you say this is why should people with lactose intolerance and people who don't want to support the abuse of the dairy industry have to pay more it's ridiculous yeah starbucks charges extra for non-dairy creamers right that's right. That's right. And they've stopped doing it in England and some other countries. So it's got to be here next. And, yeah, and that's discriminatory against Asian Americans who are generally lactose intolerant. That's right. They don't tolerate lactose. Hey, most Asian Americans don't. Yeah. And Paul oh, yeah. McCartney is a vegan. Yeah, he's he's great. He jumped right into the Starbucks campaign. That was wonderful. You know, the older I get, I come from a type of tribe that preferred John Lennon to Paul McCartney, because you always had to pick one or the other, or George. Right. I wanted to be cool, so I went with John. The older I get, the more respect I have for Paul McCartney. Uh, I, I may actually be on Team Paul, uh, <laughs> especially the, the, with the vegan. How about Diggy. Team Ringo? And no love for Ringo? He was uh, he was pro Brexit, Ringo. Oh, he was. Yeah. Oh, okay. oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So you know it's tough. Van Morrison, Eric Clapton, I love those guys, and they're they've gone to the other side with the anti-vaxxing stuff. Um, before you go, uh, I want to talk about Bong Bong. I yeah. saw a documentary that came out about two or three years ago about Philippine politics and the legacy of the Marcos family. One of the things Imeldo, 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 <laughs> ah, Imeldo. Like Feldo. Like Feldo, Feldo, yeah. Did was she built an island of exotic animals and they're still alive. She inbred giraffes. Did you hear about this? There are giraffes who can't keep their necks up. Oh, I just thought that was another province in the Philippines. I didn't realize there were actual giraffes that she was like uh, experimenting with. No, I, I hadn't heard this. I know there's all these tapes and movies that are coming out about the Marcuses in Hawaii and some other things, but I, I didn't know, I didn't hear about this one. This is a woman who delighted in breeding giraffes and had them shipped to the Philippines. And some of them, I guess giraffes live a long life and they bred. And it is the most horrific thing to see giraffes unable to keep their necks up. And you think, well, you you should be vilified. The yeah. Marcos, just for that alone, you should be vilified. Thank you, Kathy Guillermo. Let's talk very quickly about Bong Bong. How do people yeah. support you, you, Kathy? How do people support PETA? Thank you. Uh, people can go to PETA.org, uh, P-E-T-A dot O-R-G. And PETA is right. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> it's uncomfortable. But PETA is right. They've always been right. I knew PETA was right before I became a vegan. But PETA is always right, whether you Thank like you, it, David. whether you like it or not. PETA is right. We so, like to say what makes people uncomfortable. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so thank much. Thank you so much, and thank you for your your valuable work, Emil Guillermo. Yeah, David. So been, that's why I've been married to her for more than thirty years. She keeps me. She keeps me on the, you know, on the right, right side. She's yeah. right. So talk to me about Bong Bong. Well, I mean, he's he won the landslide came true. He's got 15 million more votes than the the vice president. Uh, he the the votes are almost all in and counted. Um, they're they're going through him again, and they there are no real irregularities to to speak of. President Biden has called to congratulate uh, Bong Bong. So that's a kind of a you know, a uh, I guess I guess that's no big deal. I mean, uh, Reagan did, and Bush. Did, did and Biden Reagan. introduce Bong Bong? Did uh, I'm so tired? Hang on. Yeah. Go did ahead. Bong Bong meet Biden's son, Crack Bong? <laughs> I, 
Hey, we got to work on that. I mean, I, I, he's I, going by Bong Bong. He I, people are referring to him as Bong Bong, not as Marcos Junior. I mean, you could, but Bong Bong is his is his moniker. He's gonna. It's the Bong Bonging of democracy of the world and in the Philippines. And you know, the the thing that really gets me now is I think we're not seeing like a Kim Jong Un kind of thing because. Uh, you know, where the fa- you know, where he's the son is more badass than the father, Kim Jong Il. With with Marcos, Marcos was the badass. Marcos Senior was a bad. Marcos Junior is like he's like more milk toasty. He's he's not the guy who uh, imprisoned and tortured. He's just sort of like the son who just find- it's like Don Junior and Eric. You know, would you vote for him or for them over? Well, you wouldn't vote for any no, of that. No, I, I hate I hate Eric and Don. I think they I, I hate them more than I hate Donald Trump. I know, I but hate, I, you know, but but Trump is much worse, right? No, 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 no. They, they're worse. They're, 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 both the father, they're they're son ofs. Donald yeah. Trump is the son of Fred Trump. Oh, that's right. Okay, he, he so had a never father. trust a son of. So they're so, they're all son ofs. Yeah, and I think. The son of a son of a son of is more dangerous than just a son of. I, I you might be right, but I'm I'm thinking that Bong Bong, see he he's using in in uh, in the stories from the Philippines that I'm reading, they're they're either using BBM. They don't want to mention Marcos because they know that Marcos is kind of a sore point, even though the the landslide is there. You know, my theory is that people. Uh, you know, there's a, a number of people who are, who have forgotten or did not live through uh, the Marcos years. So that's bad, you know, that that you have them coming to this saying, oh, let's give you know, they're, they're they're just voting for the brand. This is the son. Let's let's vote for him. And meanwhile, if you did live through that era, you know, you're you're dreading this. You're, you're waiting to see what the next thing is going to be from the Marcoses because it can't. You know, how are they going to you got to say, how are they going to outdo themselves? You know, considering all the people they tortured and incarcerated. I don't think Bong Bong's going to do that. But what he might do for Duterte, that's the thing, because Duterte was in the news. Rodrigo Duterte. Yeah, what's going to happen to is he done? Uh, well, that, he's going to be done in a, in a month. But this is the, the, the last dispatch I saw from I write a column in the Inquirer dot net, which is based in the Philippines. It's one of the daily newspapers in Manila, but it has its website uh, really serves all the overseas workers uh, who you can't, you can't. This is the reality of the Philippines. If you live in the Philippines, you cannot make a living in the Philippines. You have to go overseas to work. So people are going to the United States and Canada, of course, and they're going to uh, the Middle East. I had cousins who went from Manila they took jobs in Saudi Arabia because they could not get jobs in the Philippines. So this is the reality of the Philippine economy and why overseas workers, uh, the vote from the overseas workers was so important because they give billions, billions of dollars to, um, to, to the Philippine economy without the overseas workers, the economy in in the Philippines, it's like 50 pesos to a dollar. Uh, people are getting paid in pesos, not in dollars. Call your visa call center and you get a Philippine voice. Ask them, are you getting paid in pesos or dollars? They're, you know, it's not a good thing over there in the Philippines for the most part. And when you have the oligarchs like Marcos emerging, uh, even Duterte is saying, hey, you know, you got to think about the people. And so we're going to see what, how how Bong Bong does how he transitions at, uh, as president, but the key thing is, what's he going to do to Duterte? Is he going to cover him? Is he going to screen him from the ICC, which is trying to get him for these extrajudicial killings? The UN is putting uh, the number at twenty seven thousand. The people who have been caught in the drug war of Duterte, and today. Today in the Philippine Inquirer, the Turte is saying in Tagalog, but I saw it in translation. He's saying, I want to get three or four or five more drug lords before I go. Hmm. That's that, he's serious. About, now, look, this is one of the weird reasons why Filipinos kind of love him, too, because they know that uh 
crime is a problem. Drugs are a problem in the Philippines, but there's a way to do it uh, illegally in a democracy. And the way that that uh, Duterte has done it is it brings us up with uh, it brings up the human rights issues. So, as I said, the U.N. puts the number of twenty seven thousand people who have been either killed or caught in the, the drug war. The Philippine government puts that number a little lower, like like under 7,000. And I think to the degree that Marcos protects Duterte, who enabled, essentially enabled uh, the Marcos's revival by putting Ferdinand Marcos Sr., burying him, he was in cold storage up in the northern part of the country, took him out uh, from a Locos Norte, brought him to Manila, put him in a in the, in the National Heroes Cemetery. That began the rehabilitation in 2016. And it took six years, but it happened. The Marcuses are back. And so... Could Lenin come back? Uh, maybe. I don't know. I mean, did... Uh, Lenin? Well, Imagine. He, can't you go visit him? Can't you visit his corpse i i you know i don't i i don't know but i i just know that as soon as because you know for the, for the longest time marcos was like on display up in his home province and you know he was like in plexiglass frozen and people my relatives who are from that area they would go up there and they say oh come on emil come on see me and i i would never go i wouldn't go but my, my 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 sister did my sister and then they they'd see Marcus, twenty sixteen, he gets given hero's burial, changed everything, changed everything. You know, I there was a book that came out must have been twenty five years ago about Evita Perón's corpse. Hmm. Yeah, and it was. It's a true story about what happened to her embalmed corpse and how it got passed from mortician to politician and back to a mortician. And it it is the it is necrophilia. Yeah. There, there were people who were handling her body and were so in love with Evita and they wouldn't let it go. And the, they described the way they fetishized her corpse and uh, it, it 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 fell into necrophilia i wouldn't be surprised if some of that was going on up there in a locus norte where where marcus is from and but at some point you know i mean he died uh, let's see he died in hawaii and uh, and then they brought him back so he was he was refrigerated for a long long time and then put yeah. in the ground 2016. Anyway, so we'll see. Look, a lot of people are look. or I wrote a column saying, look, if you're Filipino American, we've lived through the Trump years. Uh, that's sort of the way that you're going to have to look at Bong Bong's years. And you just got to hope that he's he's just a, a hood ornament, a, a figurehead and that he does. But, you know, look, he's a rich he's, you know, a rich oligarchal uh, family. You know, we, we 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 have to just cross our fingers and hope that he does not follow the way of the oligarchs. This idea of looking at Emmett Till, I understand why Emmett Till's parents, the mother, wanted an open coffin so they could see see what the the clan did to him. But yeah. uh, the idea of God, I just don't get it. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's just not, you know. Anyway, Emil Guillermo, thank you for bringing Kathy on. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, she was on her deathbed. You you brought her to life, David. And she loves talking. I mean, she's her official title is Senior VP of the Laboratory Investigations Unit. But she also, in her spare time at PETA, runs the horse racing thing. And it's, it's amazing what she's been able to do and here's the thing and the reason why it's such an important issue in animal rights there were 16 million people watching the kentucky derby on television 16 million you know you can go out there and protest you know 
you know, World Week for animals in laboratories, or you can talk about spaying and neutering and or whatever. What other animal rights issues? Anti vivisection, and in that one race, sixteen million people are watching the Kentucky Derby. And people so, say to me, "Can we just have some fun without you making me feel guilty?" To which I say, "Go fuck yourself." Exactly. No, no yes. you can't. No. No, you can't do it. You can't no, do it. No, you can't have fun. There are right ways to have fun and wrong ways to have fun. And if you're told what's no. going on and you still think it's fun. No, your exactly. idea of fun is wrong. And that includes football. It, all See, professional sports. Look, I have come to a point with professional sports last night or on well, not Thursday. baseball. No, no, Wednesday, Wednesday, the Golden State Warriors played the Memphis Grizzlies. It was 3-1 uh, in, in terms of games, and the Warriors were going to close it out, hopefully, to, to end the series. But they lost. They were playing in Memphis. They lost by 39 points. They were down by as many as 55 points at one point. And I thought, this is an embarrassment, an insult to fans who root shamelessly for professional athletes and i i thought of you david because i know you you don't like sports you don't you know you you know that and i saw i i saw sports all sports that i love as a massive waste of time when i saw the warriors just sort they didn't even send it in they or phone it in they they literally just did not they didn't play it's yeah. it's almost like but a rigged not, game but but there's no now guilty guilty confession the only yeah. sport that i can enjoy is boxing boxing how about how about ice follies do you like ice follies that and ice follies and, and, and women Roller derby female mma female mma they're good they're good female they're mma quality. susan b anthony against ida b wells that would be a good yeah. fight i watch female mma and i think Everything I was raised to believe about women and men is completely wrong. They are they are bad mothers, literally, literally. So I watch that and I go, everything I thought I knew is completely wrong. This is amazing. Thank you, Emil. Follow Emil on Twitter at Emil Amuck. Listen to the PETA podcast, new episodes every Wednesday. And you live... Don't forget my news meditation. Your, my news meditation, because I end I end the show with a meditation, so you have to like go fast forward. If you go on Twitter at Emil Muck or just go to amok.com, there's their tape. But I do a live stream, two p.m. Right. Pacific, on my pathetic YouTube channel. Can't be as pathetic as mine. No, no, mine's more. My mine, mine is, is more pathetic. My YouTube channel is more pathetic than yours. No, yours is pretty. You got moderators and stuff. We have mods. Yeah. yeah, I'm telling you, you, you know, mine is worse. Mine's worse. Well, I'm trying to grow mine. Uh, all right. I want to thank all the right. mods. Well, let me just, we well, brought up the mods. Where are they? We have new mods here today. Autumn Leaves, M. Toussaint, Midi Doctors, Bob Carmondi, and S. Scout. And thank you, Todd, for your super chat. Now we can say, oh, Rodrigo. Let me say, do you know Rodrigo, our correspondent I've, in I've Mexico? Seen, I've seen his name. I, I know that he's uh, in the in the, uh, the special pod. Hello, Rodrigo. He, he's our Mex Hi. he's our reporter down in Mexico. Oh, great. Did you, uh, you've met him. And here's the thing about Rodrigo. Because he doesn't live in America. This is really sad. He speaks four languages. Japanese, French, English, and Spanish. And I say, you should move to America. We, we don't have to be bothered learning other people's languages. Isn't that sad that somebody has to learn four languages? Well, just in case you go to Peru or someplace, you need I the know, Japanese. You need the that's Japanese. That's the great thing about being an American. You barely have to even learn English. Bad English is acceptable. Everything's that, that, acceptable here. Agreed. All right. Agreed. Thank you, Emil. We have five minutes, Rodrigo. Thanks, Rodrigo. Okay. What's on your mind? We have five minutes. 
a short PSA, uh, Gwen Shockley from the Majority Report chat from the official Discord that says thanks for the donations for the guitar fund and she has say go fund me to help a trans woman escape, I mean relocate from Texas. I put the link in the chat and I tried perhaps not hard enough to ex bring experts to talk about this but if I keep putting it off I'll forget something, so I'll try to go very fast without missing anything. I By the way, a lot you. of, I just want to say something. Yes. A lot of our guests are because of you. You got us Jason and Pascal Robert. You, you've brought in a lot of great guests to the show, so we are very grateful. It's amazing that somebody who speaks four languages, it's just kind of sad that you speak four languages. But <laughs> go ahead. What's on your so, mind? Uh, you may have wondered why there's so much trans porn getting made. It seems like every trans person who can quote unquote pass is invited to do trans porn. And the answer is that they're saving $80,000 for the other half of their gender reaffirmation surgery, still known in some places as gender reassignment surgery. If you know about transitioning, you may have also wondered how they can perform and take their hormones, and well, they can't. They have to stop taking hormones for weeks or even months at a time, which is why as soon as they save enough, they get their surgery and they stop doing porn. In fact, aside from a few lifers, most trans performers will retire once they save enough money. Congress could pass a law today giving everyone Medicare for all, or at least forcing insurance providers to classify gender reaffirming care as non-elective, but they don't, because the same conservatives who claim to hate porn, in particular trans porn, would rather raise money passing laws to make gender reaffirming care illegal than actually provide help to people who literally could not do porn if the government offered them an alternative. In yet another case of the cruelty is the point. And therefore, gender reaffirming care is labeled as elective. Many people haven't even heard of full decriminalization for sex work, let alone why it's not the same as legalization. Let me use the UK as an example. Sex work is legal in the UK, but hiring a driver who might act as security runs afoul of anti-pimping laws. Renting an apartment for the purpose of having sex is also illegal, and any landlord is allowed to not only refuse to rent to you, but they can also call the cops on you, which means sex workers often have to bring customers to their real home. As I said on Twitter a couple of years ago, the difference between sex work being legal and full decriminalization is the difference between, oh crap, the police are here, and thank God, the police are here. In one instance, even if sex work is legal, you may rather take a beating from a customer than deal with the police. In the other, the police are actually here to help, if you can imagine that. There's only one reason not to fully decriminalize sex work. Cruelty is the point. Why, as leftists, do we think of porn or sex work in general as somehow being different from other kinds of work? I'll give you a hint. It's the same reason everyone was happy to honk or clap or bang pots or whatever to celebrate the quote-unquote essential worker heroes, but no one ever suggested giving them hazard pay for going out to work and maybe infecting their loved ones. If we thought of porn performers or sex workers as regular people not legally allowed to unionize in an industry that regularly replaces anyone who tries to protect other workers from abuse and spreads rumors that they're, quote, difficult to work with, end quote, no one would think, oh yeah, they deserve it. Let me give you one final example. In the amateur scene in Florida, new performers in porn begin earning between $800 and $1,000 for one day of work, but before they are allowed to work, they have to spend around $200 on clothes and makeup that will probably have to be replaced with extras before they can go home. We don't often think of our workplace quote-unquote demanding that we spend on clothes before being allowed to show up at work, 
But that's only because we've been trained to think that our willingness to quote-unquote invest in clothes shows our commitment to the organization. And then we hear that a girl just starting in a new job has to spend around one-fifth of her expected salary before showing up to work where her brand new expensive clothes will get destroyed, who can never quote-unquote earn healthcare no, money ha no matter how many years she works. And if that work was important, we'd be up in arms about an industry that abuses thousands of employees like that every month. I don't know the last time trans people were on your news. The last one I heard of is a 16-year-old girl from Tennessee who was told she wasn't allowed to use any bathroom. So she decided to stay home playing video games and the cops came in to arrest her for truancy while she was streaming live. Let me restate that for you. The school system told her she wasn't allowed to be herself in school, so she stayed home, and the cops decided to arrest her for missing school. Think about that for a second and ask yourself, what is the thing that she's allowed to do? If you're happy that you won't have to pay extra taxes for better supervision of the foster care system or a better orphanage system that doesn't have space for all those extra babies to raise the minimum wage that conservatives have voted against raising since 2007, that LGBTQ plus couples will still be told they are not eligible to adopt because of their quote-unquote lifestyle, you can say it with me, the cruelty is the point. One third of all women in the U.S. will be sexually assaulted at least once. For rape victims in general, 8 out of 10 by people they know, one third by current partners. In the case of underage victims, 9 out of 10 by people they know. There are several jurisdictions where the parents of victims are legally allowed to sign marriage papers, forcing the victim to marry their rapist to, quote, protect the family honor. End quote. For people in jail, 60% of all sexual violence is committed by the staff that is supposed to protect them. What do conservatives do for these people? They promise to get tougher on non-white immigrants. They never promise to actually protect the victims of family or family friends. I hope this very brief introduction explains both the issues and how thinking about other people's issues can help us realize the ways in which we too are exploited. As the Combahee River Collective said in 1974, quote, the major systems of oppression are interlocking. The synthesis, the synthesis of these oppressions creates the conditions of our lives, end quote. There is one more way in which these issues are linked. Conservatives often pretend that they love God more than we do, and this gives them permission to tell other people how to live, to the point that they often want to tell people if they should live. They make two mistakes when they decide that someone LGBTQ plus should not be allowed to live. The first is that they are literally telling God you made a mistake. The second is that they are also literally telling God here's how you went wrong and how to fix it. Both mistakes involve presuming to know better than God what the world should be like. A psychologist might tell you they're just letting their fears get the better of them and they're simply allowing the most primitive part of their brains decide that anyone who is different is a threat to be feared because they might be the next evolution that treats regular humans the way we treated the Neanderthals. But regardless of their motivation, they're asleep still letting us know loud and clear that they believe someone was born different because God made a mistake. Let me make it clear for those not familiar with Abrahamic religions. God is the Lord of hosts, literally the leader of many armies. The only thing worse in the many Christian religions than killing someone in the name of God is killing and or bullying until they kill themselves, someone who is different and giving us the reason that God made a mistake allowing them to be born. We certainly hope that bullying someone for being different carries a separate great punishment, but making someone want to kill themselves because you decided that God made a mistake will earn you by itself a one-way trip to hell. Of course, if you confront a more good than bad person with this logic, they might realize the error of their ways, but everyone else will simply end up admitting 
they don't believe in God, which is why I haven't used that argument while arguing with conservatives, but I wanted to mention it in case the listeners know someone who genuinely wants to put God first. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you. All right, I'll see you uh, at office hours, right? Rodrigo? Hopefully, yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. That is our show. Please join me for office hours starting at 8 p.m. Eastern. I host the first hour and then it's turned over to all the great, amazing people who are part of this community. If you would like to join our community, go to my website. It's working. It's up. Go to my website, sign up for office hours. Join us in our live virtual studio audience here on Zoom and you get to join the conversation on the show. We also uh, are produced by several people. The show is uh, produced by the following people. I'm not uh, reading anything. I have it all memorized. This show is produced by The Invisible Ninja, Dan Frankenberger, Andy Brown, Professor Jonathan Bick, Joe in Norway, Sarah Bush, Grace Jackson, Hannah Feldman. I mix up all the names in my head and see it's a cognitive test that I administer on myself on the show to make sure I can get everybody's name and uh, then mix it up. Okay. By the way, David, I don't know if you've heard that you passed 7,000 subscribers on YouTube. Yes. Thank you for mentioning that. We're, we're slowly growing thanks to uh, the people who help put the show together. And I'm getting to focus on what I love doing most, which is this show and talking to my listeners, talking to the people who listen to this show. I have been remiss in not responding to people's emails, but a lot of my burden has been relieved, has been lifted so I can focus on uh, answering your emails. And so if you want to contact me, go to davidfeldmanshow.com. There's a contact page. If you have any guest suggestions, any compliments, God forbid somebody wants to compliment the show, complaints, go to my website. I answer all my email once again. I know that I haven't in the past, but um, because of people like Dan Frankenberger, Joe in Norway, Professor Jonathan Bick, the Invisible Ninja, Andy Brown, uh, Hannah Feldman, Grace Jackson, Sarah Bush. Who did I, I, I always feel I left somebody out. Uh, and I want to thank the mods. Uh, they do a great job. Uh, and we have new mods, Autumn Leaves, M. Toussaint, Midi Doctors, Bob Carmande, and S. Scott. Are you S. Scott? Rodrigo? Why do I think Rodrigo's S. Scout? Rodrigo? Ah, he must be S. Scout. He's not saying anything. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, please. And subscribe to this show wherever you get your podcasts. We're available on every podcasting platform. So please subscribe. And we don't get any support from any of these corporate podcasting platforms because we don't take advertising. So nobody's going to say, well, we do on YouTube, but nobody's going to suggest this show. If you're trying to find us on iTunes or where else, Spotify, we don't do advertising. So it's not in the best interests of these platforms to promote us. They uh, bury us because we don't make any money for them but I'm not gonna run advertising on this show. I'm not gonna read a commercial for a, a mattress that you don't need. So the only way this show ever gets heard is by people who listen, copying and pasting the link to this show and telling your friends. The fact that we have 7,000 subscribers on YouTube is a testament to word of mouth, people uh, just copying and pasting the show and, and telling their friends. So 
if you want to support this show, the best way to do that is to copy the link and please spread it with friends. I know that there are people out there who enjoy this show. The only way for people to discover this show is my listeners spreading the word because the corporate controlled platforms will not promote this show because I don't run commercials. It's not in the best interests of Spotify or iTunes to tell people about my show, because if you're listening to my show instead of a show that runs ads, iTunes and Spotify lose money. They want you listening to a, to a podcast that runs commercials. So they don't want you listening to this show. So the only way to find this show is by people taking it upon themselves to amplify it, spread it to your friends, tell all your friends about it, please. Thank you to all our guests. This was an amazing show. It really was. And, and thanks to Invisible Ninja, who's chopping up parts of the show so you can watch it on YouTube. You can watch the entire show on YouTube. The entire show is available on YouTube. It's a full episode. And then we have the Invisible Ninja cutting up uh, individual portions of the show. Thank you to Jason Miles. Listen to This Is Revolution. Thank you to Professor Ben Burgess. Listen to his podcast, Give Them an Argument. Thank you to the Hershenfelds, Dr. Philip Hershenfeld, and of course, Ethan Hershenfeld. Go watch Ethan's comedy special, Thug Thug Jew. Jose Arroyo, go buy Somewhere in L.A., A Book of Hours. Great comic book. You can buy it on Amazon. He got special dispensation from the Reverend Barry W. Lynn. He says you can buy it on Amazon. Thank you to the host of Stump the Hump, Quizmaster Dan Frankenberger. Thank you to Bob Shank, Reverend Bob Shank. Go buy his book, Costly Grace, an Evangelical Minister's Rediscovery of Faith, Hope, and Love. I cannot recommend that conversation enough that the Reverend Barry W. Lynn had with Bob Shank. So great. Thank you to the professors and Marianne, Professor Marianne, professors, uh, Ann Lee, read her over at the Daily Kos. Her uh, name is Annie Lee on Daily Kos. Thank you, Professor Jonathan Bick. Thank you, Professor Adnan Hussein, who you should listen to on Guerrilla History and the Mudgeless podcast. Thank you to Joe in Norway for cooking up that torturous pie. God, that was painful watching that. Thank you to Alan Minsky. Donate to the Progressive Democrats of America, please. And thank you, Professor Harvey J.K. Go by Take Hold of Our History, FDR on Democracy, The Fight for the Four Freedoms, and of course, Thomas Paine and the Promise of America, a book that Barack Obama read last year. Thank you to Kathy Guillermo, Senior Vice President in the Laboratory Investigations Department at PETA. And of course, Emil Guillermo, host of the PETA podcast and columnist for the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Don't forget to sign up for office hours. All you need is Zoom. Join us for office hours. I'm David Feldman, reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. We're living every day, we're living every night, 
in the USA of distraction. We wake every morning like the Rolling Stones, cause we just can't get no satisfaction. Democracies in change, we could bury its remains, but infotainment culture has infected our brains. We're living every day, we're living every night in the USA of distraction. The wisdom we receive, the reality we perceive, is burned into our brains by cable TV. Scandal, crime, and disaster lead the news. Fear and white anxiety shape our views. The fourth estate has crumbled into an irrelevant heap. Critical thinking is all but asleep. Cause we're living every day, we're living every night in the USA of distraction. The pathological pursuit of power and profit drives everything in sight. Not sure we can stop it. Corporate plutocracy has risen to the top. We've lost the power to think, so we shop until we drop. We're surveilled and monitored while they keep us all distracted. So we never notice that our data has been extracted. We're living every day, we're living every night in the USA of distraction. All right. The Reagan agenda, a libertarian notion of sweeping deregulation has been put into motion. Our eyeballs seldom stray too far away from the mega monopolies that command the day. Diversity in media is gone, 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 slowly fading out like a sad, sad song. We're living every day, we're living every night in the USA of distraction. The telegenic spectacle of tabloid celebrity has squeezed out any room for social integrity. With profits to be made and minds to be molded, the media crushes the truth even when it's been scolded. It's books now more than ever that people need to read. Folks are hypnotized by their Twitter feed. We're living every day, we're living every night in the USA of Now we can't seem to get out of this neoliberal nightmare that cares more for Wall Street than anybody's health care. We've been bruised, battered, defunded, and dismantled. We've been diminished, infiltrated, manipulated, and manhandled. The sovereignty of citizenship, the bulwark of democracy, is under full attack by the cult of meritocracy. We're living every day, yeah. Well, we're living every night. In the USA A distraction We're living every day Living every night In the USA A distraction Where we're living every day Where we're living every night 